Good morning. Good morning. It, is it is September 14th, 14th 2021. 2021. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to the Santa Cruz County at 9 a.m. Welcome to the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors regular, regular meeting. Clerk, please, please call, call the roll. Supervisor, Supervisor Koenig. Koenig. Here. Here. Friend. Friend. Here. Coonerty. Coonerty. Here. Tappet. Here. Here. McPherson. Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we'll now have moment a moment of silence. of silence and record the Pledge of Allegiance. Is there anyone that wants to mention anything? We'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag of the United States of America, We'll have consideration of late additions to the agenda, additions and deletions to the consent and regular agendas. Yes, let me go through the uh, corrections first on consent agenda number 21. Staff requests this item to be deleted, packet pages 168 and 169. There's an addenda to the consent agenda, item 51.1. Adopt an ordinance amending chapter 7.130 of the Santa Cruz County Code relating to cannabis dispensary siting criteria setback waivers. Uh, there's a board memo printout uh, attached. In addition, on written correspondence, there's Next a correction item item should, should read. Letter, letter of, of Ian Larkin, Unit Chief Cal Fire, Cal Fire San Mateo, San Mateo, Santa, Santa Cruz Unit, unit convene, convene a copy, copy of a notice, of a notice of intent to harvest, to harvest timber, timber slash domestic water supply inquiry, inquiry issued, by issued by the Department of Forestry, of Forestry and, Fire and Fire Protection. In addition, In addition there's, there's, uh, there is there a, is a, a late, late addition, addition request. request. This is uh, under item three to consent. Consider addition of late item to the regular agenda relating to Senate Bill 496, 496 as outlined to them in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. Consider authorizing the chair of the board to sign a letter on behalf of the Board of Supervisor urging Governor Gavin Newsom to sign Senate Bill 496, which would specify that the Department of Water Resources may provide up to 100% of local subvention funds for the Pajaro Valley Flood Control Project as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. Um, that item will require a four-fifths vote of the board to add to the agenda. So if you could go ahead and proceed with that, that uh, authorization and then we'll add it to the agenda. I'd like uh, to uh, bring that item to the board. Uh, Mr. Friend, you've, you're chair of the zone seven. This is a real critical thing. We appreciate uh, Senator Laird at, uh, in Sacramento putting this forward. Do you wanna just make a brief comment about it? Yeah, I could just make a brief comment about, uh, you're talking about the, the Senate bill funding, correct, Mr. Chair? Correct, correct yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't stress enough how close we are to the finish line and the state is helping us pull over the goal line. As you know, we were able to get reauthorized this entire uh, program a couple of years ago on the federal side and some initial funding. But this right now, there's a maximum of a 70% uh, state um, in, investment in the local cost share. This allows the state to go up to 100%, uh, which is pretty significant when you're dealing with two federally disadvantaged communities, both in Wattsville and the town of Pajaro. Uh, obviously, we're very grateful, not just to Senator Dallaire, but also Assemblymember Rivas and Stone to help carry this through. You know, it passed unanimously both in the Assembly and the Senate, so we're hopeful uh, that we can get this all the way through. But, but as you know very well, uh, Mr. Chair, having served there uh, to have this kind of funding coming forward in, uh, potentially it could mean about 40 additional million dollars to our community for specifically for flood protection in the Pajaro region. I'd like to make just one suggestion. Uh, it's to request me as board chair to write this, but uh, Mr. Friend, uh, Supervisor Friend has been uh, chair of Zone 7 and been uh, instrumental in getting this uh, to where it is along with uh, Supervisor Caput, but I would like to have him sign it as well. Okay, that's fine. Okay, I would entertain a motion uh, to send a letter to the governor. So this is to you. add it, add it to the to the consent agenda. Oh, add it to this consent agenda. Um, okay, we we'll just add it to the consent agenda, and, uh, and then I'll move to add this item to the consent agenda. Second. I move second. Um, all through. Do you want to call the roll, please? Supervisor. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Appet? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Great.
great work by everybody on that. That is so critical for the South County. Yeah, I want to, if I could real quick, uh, sure. I want to thank uh, Supervisor Friend for his leadership uh, in the past few years. And uh, uh, this is uh, truly uh, uh, something to celebrate. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we have any other announcement by board members of items uh, removed? Agenda? Yes. Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to public comments. Uh, Ms. Cabrera, do you want to make an explanation, please? It's time for public comment. comment. If, you if you wish to comment or join us through the Zoom link, please find the hand icon at the bottom of your screen and click this to raise your hand. This will place you in the queue to speak when it is your turn. I will call you by your name and you will see a pop up on your screen. Ask if you want to accept the mute. Please accept this and start speaking. If you're calling from a phone, please dial star nine now. This will virtually raise your hand and place you in the queue. I will call you by the last four digits of your phone number. At the end of your two minutes, your microphone will be muted automatically. Please press star six to unmute yourself when it's your turn to speak. Ahora es el tiempo que la Junta Directiva de Supervisores recibirá comentarios del público. Si gustaría dar su comentario en español, tenemos un servicio de traducción disponible para asistir. Si desea comentar y se ha unido a través de Zoom, Busca el icono de la mano en el fondo de la pantalla y hace clic para levantar la mano. Eso lo colocará en la fila para hablar. Cuando sea tu turno de hablar, te llamaré por tu nombre y verás una ventana emergente en tu pantalla preguntándose si quieres activar tu micrófono. Por favor, accepte y comienza a hablar. Si se ha unido a través de teléfono, por favor, marque estrella 9 para levantar la mano y estar colocado en la fila de hablar. Cuando sea tu turno de hablar, te llamaré por los últimos cuatro dígitos de tu número de teléfono. Por favor, marque estrella 6 para activar tu micrófono cuando sea tu turno de hablar. Al fin de tus dos minutos, tu micrófono se, se, será desactivado automáticamente. Thank you. Uh, any person may uh, address the board uh, once during the public comment, not exceeding two minutes. Comments must be directed to items on today's consent and closed agenda session agendas and yet to be heard items uh, on the regular agenda or on a topic not on today's agenda, but within the board's jurisdiction. We'll take uh, comments now up to 30 minutes. Uh, and if necessary, add uh, additional time comments after the uh, afternoon session. We have a scheduled item at 1.30. Please. Good morning. And thank you board members for the opportunity to speak to you today. I especially want to thank Supervisor McPherson and Caput for proclaiming September as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month in Santa Cruz County. My name is Gail Pellerin. I'm from Santa Cruz. And I'm here once again to talk to you and members of the public on a topic that is profoundly personal to me and my children, Jacob and Emily. Suicide was not a topic I spent much time thinking or talking about before November 19th, 2018. It never gets easy. When my husband, Tom, the father of our two children, died by suicide. The past 1,030 days, my daughter's been counting them. I've learned a lot about suicide and about grief. And I've met many amazing people who have been impacted by suicide. And I'm motivated to speak openly and publicly because there is a stigma associated with suicide that has got to end. Early in the grieving process, I went to a talk on suicide and the speaker encouraged us to put our grief to work. That really resonated with me. So I joined a suicide survivors group called WINGS. I reached out to our behavioral health director, Eric Rayera, and suggested that suicide hotline posters be put up in our county bathrooms. And I believe they're working on that. I participated in the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention out of the darkness suicide prevention walk in San Francisco, where my family and I walked 18 miles through the dead of night in an effort to raise Oh, can I get more time? Okay. <laughs> Participated in the American um, to raise money and awareness for suicide. I started a Facebook group called Suicide Survivors Santa Cruz County. And I recently joined our National Alliance on Mental uh, Illness Board, NAMI, which is an incredible organization providing education and support to families and people in need. There are so many organizations and people who are on the front lines of this battle that many still refuse to discuss in public. I know how difficult it is to talk about suicide and mental illness. Actually, I prefer to call it mental conditions. In the beginning, it was very hard for me, but now as my friends and family can attest, I do it often. The reality is every one of us, each of you board members, everyone hearing my words has struggled, has felt hopeless, 
has been depressed, especially during the last 18 months. Yet many of us silently fight our battles in silence. I no longer use the word committed suicide. You commit crimes. You do not commit an illness. You would not say someone committed cancer. Instead, I say died by suicide or took their own life. I also do not believe suicide is a selfish or cowardice act. Suicide is possible when someone is in a very dark, painful, hopeless place and they lose their fear of death. The, st the statistics are daunting. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. It is the second leading cause of death for 10 to 24 year old Americans. There is one death by suicide in the US every 11 minutes. There's been one since we've been here or 130 suicides per day. 47,511 people died by suicide across the United States in 2019. That's almost three times the number of homicides. In 2019, 1.38 million people attempted suicide. Firearms are the most common method of death by suicide. And in Santa Cruz County, the suicide rate is 16.4 per 100,000 residents compared to 10.7 statewide. Suicide does not discriminate. It impacts all people, of all ages, genders, race, ethnicity, incomes, and sexual orientations. But suicide numbers are higher for white males, active military and veterans, and LGBTQ youth and transgender adults. Depression is the leading cause of suicide. However, 80 to 90% of people who seek treatment for depression are treated successfully using therapy or medication. So we need to talk about mental health a lot more and make sure people have access to treatment. I've learned a lot about grief over these last 33 months. Grief is not something you get over. It's something you learn to live with. You see, when a loved one dies by suicide, a parent, a child, a spouse, a sibling, a family member, a coworker, a friend, there's a sudden and unexpected hole in your life that leaves you in shock. When someone else kills your loved one, you can direct your anger and pain at that perpetrator. But when it is the person you have loved that is responsible party for their own life, taking much too soon, there's confusion, profound sadness, and loss on how to deal with your emotions. Sometimes friends and family think it's time to get over it, time to move on. They don't like to say his name. But my children and I need to talk about Tom. We need to remember his smile, his sometimes annoying behaviors, his love for history and physical activity, and his love for us. You see, with, with suicide, there is no moving on from grief. You simply pick it up and carry it with you. And for me, I have been inspired to put my grief to work, and that's why I'm here today. So what do I want to achieve? I want us all to recognize that suicide is a public health crisis. I would like the county to provide suicide prevention training for our county employees. I urge schools to make sure parents have information about suicide prevention, and I encourage parents to talk to their children often about their mental health. I hope all of us, no matter what line of work we do, will take some time to talk to our coworkers, students, or clients about suicide awareness and prevention. I want everyone who is listening to accept that we all have a role in preventing suicide. Learn the warning signs, ask the difficult questions, and let family, friends, and neighbors know they are not alone. Let me expand on this a bit. When someone you know talks about wanting to die or talks about feeling hopeless or having no purpose or feeling trapped or being in an unbearable pain or talks about being a burden to others or you see someone increasing the use of alcohol or drugs, acting anxious or reckless, sleeps too little or too much, withdraws or displays dramatic mood swings, please reach out, talk to them, listen. You don't have to be an expert and it might feel really uncomfortable. Let them know that help is available. Tell them what they are experiencing is treatable and that suicide feelings are temporary. Suicide is final. In closing, I want anyone who is thinking about suicide to know that your life matters. Your family and friends will not be better off without you. Please reach out for help by calling the hotline at 1-800-273-TALK or text to 741-741. And I just have to say, if you haven't voted yet, please get out and vote today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your courage and your explanation. Uh, 
very well receive and put. Um, I'm sorry to hear about your your situation and so many others. Uh, we need to do what we can to help others in this. Thank you. Good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I really appreciate what the previous community member stated. I've been a first responder for two suicides in my life, and I've personally helped three others to not kill themselves as a first responder. I can say that my first experience with law enforcement is they kept me on the phone until law enforcement could physically see me. I think that it was beautiful and it helped me mitigate that situation that first happened in my life when I was 21. I'm now 54. It would be delightful if I would get the same respect to say what I need to say. Thank you. Um, this is an excerpt on page 25 from a biomag healer training that I took in early in late March of this year. Warriors are not what you think of as warriors. The warrior is not someone who fights because no one has the right to take another life. The warrior for us is one who sacrifices themselves for the good of others. Their task is to care for the elderly, the defenseless, those who cannot provide for themselves, and above all, the children, the future of humanity. That was said to be a said of, of, from Chief Sitting Bull. Since I'm gonna run out of time, I wrote something this morning, I'm not gonna do the first page, I'm gonna go to the middle of the second page. Now I'm going to get personal and real and mean and raw. The absolute violence of this Board of Supervisors in Santa Cruz over the last 50 years, but specifically when the SEEDS project, Agenda 21, Agenda 2030 was adopted into law in 1997 and the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz matches observations written and physically created in the Georgia Guidestones in 1980. All real wealth in any social order and in its reverence for the natural magnetobiologic leadership skills in children and its care to represent their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, wolves and velociraptors, family orders could teach forgive and tear asunder these 12 million individuals where the rest of humanity outnumbers them 625 to one. Thank you. Thank you for completing your comment. You know, person speak for I several know, minutes. And I, and I understand that, that and I'm going to respond. Hello. The, um, the hydro turf spray needs to be reapplied to the to the burn scar in the Santa Cruz Mountains. My name is Marcia St. Clair. I'm 71 years old and immunocompromised. In the year since my house burned, I have moved eight times. I currently live in a tent with my husband, dog, cat, and two gopher snakes. The snakes were uninvited. I also live at the Brookdale Lodge where my husband tries to manage a multinational company when there's electricity. I've given up my personal medical devices because there are large clouds of bilious brown soil blowing everywhere and it's too hard for me to sterilize them because I have to start a generator to get water and then I have to uh, boil it on a butane stove. Um, I take cold showers and drink bitter coffee, but not as bitter as the taste I have in my mouth toward my own county government for their systemic ignorance of the cruelty that the planning department, in, their, in as much as they try, have been unable to overcome. Uh, we need to have the erosion control reapplied to those areas that, since it's been over a year now, that. They, where the soil is burnt, blowing around. Um, also, I could use a case of water. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Brenda Brenner, and I'm the director of the emergency medical services here in the county. Um, I'm here as county staff to the Emergency Medical Care Commission to talk about item number 29, which is a contract for Z Consulting. That contract will provide for an assessment of our public safety radio infrastructure system and also provide for recommendations for needed improvements in that system. 
In addition to the need for the Sheriff's Department to have improved radio security, fire and EMS providers need to see a reduction in the gaps in the radio system within our county. That would be gaps in the ability to both um, receive radio traffic as well as to transmit or speak on the radios. These gaps exist because we have an incredibly beautiful but hilly terrain that's hard to provide coverage for. And also because there's a lack of enough radio towers and cell towers in our county upon which to um, place the radio uh, equipment to make it possible to be able to transmit and receive everywhere. These gaps in our radio system create a hazardous situation for fire and EMS responders on a daily basis. Because of these gaps, there are times when fire and EMS cannot hear critical safety information being given to them by the dispatch center. There are times when they cannot call for help uh, if they need it in an unsafe situation, and they can't necessarily coordinate operations at a large incident, um, such as a big fire or a disaster. In addition to the needs of the first responders, we have an additional need for cell towers to improve the ability to get emergency alerts to residents and visitors in our county for things such as emergency evacuation or shelter in place when there might be criminal activity taking place. The Emergency Medical Care Commission would like to request your support and approval of this contract as a critical first step toward resolution of the gaps in the radio system and improvements to the safety of first responders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Agreed. Good morning. My name is Sarah Steiger and I'm a resident of Ben Lomond. Um, as you probably may know, um, especially Supervisor McPherson, that we've had ongoing power outages for the last four days. As of this morning, Zianti was out of power, which affected 937 residents, according to the pg e report. Um, we are really struggling with um, no power, not clear information from PG&E. Um, every time our power goes out, I call PG&E to report it. Um, they say they're not aware of it. The automated message says that. Um, they say they'll send somebody out. Um, I myself um, probably haven't been as impacted as other people I know that work from home. I have a neighbor down the street who was giving a presentation to clients in France. His call got dropped. Um, people that are working from home are being impacted. Kids that are learning from home are being impacted. Um, a lot of residents are low income. They don't have generators um, to be able to run power. Um, no internet. Some people don't have hot water if they're on an on-demand water system. People are losing food. They can't run fans or air conditioning in hot weather or heat and cold weather. We wanna know what's going on. We wanna hear from PG&E. We wanna hear from you. Um, we hope that you will have a town hall meeting, a way for us to communicate our concerns and to learn more about this new technology that PG&E is using to, um, to keep our power ongoing because it seems to not be working. Thank you. Thank you. I, I know it's been a nightmare in San Rosa Valley. Uh, Monday morning, I called PG&E to request a town hall meeting. I'm hopeful that we can have one on uh, Thursday evening, but I haven't gotten confirmation on that yet. Thank you. Anyone else want to address this public comments? Okay, um, we uh, look for Pardon action me, on Chair? this. I do have speakers on oh, Zoom. Excuse me, yeah. excuse me. Carol, your microphone is available. Good morning, my name is Carol Bjorn, and um, I just want to encourage the board, if there's a two minute time limit on speakers, let's um, apply that across the board. We all have various interests that we're passionate about, and if you all are going to limit us to two minutes, it needs to be applied to everyone, not just certain people. Um, so yesterday in the Atlantic, there was an article released, and the title of the article was, our most reliable pandemic number is losing meaning. And a new study was released in this article, and it said from mid-January through the end of June 2021, 
48% of all hospitalized COVID patients may have been admitted for another reason entirely or had only mild presentation of the disease. Researchers from Harvard Medical School, Tufts Medical Center, and the Veterans Affairs Healthcare System analyzed nearly 50,000 COVID hospital admissions across the country to see whether each patient required supplemental oxygen or had a blood oxygen level below 94%, which is the NIH definition of severe COVID. If either of these conditions was met, the authors classified that patient as having moderate to severe disease. Otherwise, the case was considered mild or asymptomatic. The study suggests that almost half of those hospitalized with COVID-19 were admitted for another reason entirely or only had mild or asymptomatic cases. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention that um, there's, there's been, been a lot of misleading information, and this is just one example of that misleading information for the last 18 months. The second example of misleading information is the quote-unquote Delta variant. There is no specific test for the Delta variant. And so whenever Dr. Newell goes out and talks about the Delta variant or anyone else talks about the Delta variant, they're engaging in fraud because there is no specific test for that. So I encourage you all, the next time she speaks publicly, to ask her about that. Ask her how she knows that there is a Delta variant and then do some investigative reporting on your own to investigate that. Thank you. Calling user one, your microphone is available. A reminder to star six to unmute. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and uh, we should have equal time, everyone. I learned at a young age that democracy requires debate, investigation of various sources of information, and questioning authority. I'm going to read from a statement from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. The question is, whatever happened to liberalism? Cognitive dissonance in the age of phasism. The amended liberal code. Censorship is bad, except when it comes to vaccines. Informed consent should apply to every medical product and intervention, except vaccines. America should honor her treaty obligations under the Nuremberg Code and the ethical precepts of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, except where they impede forced vaccinations. Every medicine should be safety tested, except vaccines. Pharma is greedy, homicidal, and untrustworthy, except about vaccines. Um, by the way, a number of antidepressants state on the readout that it causes uh, suicidal tendencies. Number six on this list, mercury and aluminum are dangerous neurotoxins, except in vaccines. My body, my choice, except with vaccines. Glyphosate and formaldehyde cause cancer, except in vaccines. Caller 4658, your microphone is available. Good morning. Um, I, my name is Tim Folger. I'm a longtime resident of uh, Watsonville. My family roots go back 150 years. And I'm speaking to agenda item number eight. The um, topic is a um, consideration of a moratorium on the cannabis ordinance and county code. I have familiarized myself with the county code and uh, to my careful examination numerous times, it's pretty unclear. We have a new application now, different than last month's application, that is radically different um, and focusing on co-licensing, which uh, I think to use the previous speaker's characterization of democracy requires, calls for, care 
careful examination of the facts and due process and careful um, uh, public input. I'm interested in studying the facts. I've done that for as long as I've been a resident of the subject area. I'm right next door to the parcels um, in question in the application. I've been part of a very active community of neighbors for many years in studying the conservation of water. And by that, I mean, what are the facts behind saltwater contamination, overdraft? How do we protect what we have? How does everybody get a fair shake? And in this instance, we have a uh, operation that is basically a lessor, a lease, a uh, tenant farmer. Their participation in the activities in the neighborhood is very different than ours. All residents have made a long-term commitment, buying property, improving it, uh, conserving the resources that we have around us. We have made that commitment. I need any. That was it. I don't have. I do have seven other speakers. You have seven. There are seven other speakers. Okay, go ahead. Okay. We are at nine thirty-one. Okay. Joseph O, your microphone is available. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I'm speaking about the uh, recent increasingly horrible response of PG&E. Uh, thank you very much for trying to organize a uh, town hall. I recommend this is focused on more on the CPUC, the California Public Utility Commission, overseeing PG&E. So I think it's more their responsibility for not caring, not giving a good direction. As you know, every other uh, public utility commission overseeing a monopoly in basically any other state, any other jurisdiction, cares about having good quality, power, low cost, good service, high reliability. We get none of these things. I'm a 23-year resident uh, here near the Summit and 17 area, Santa Cruz County, and it's about 100 times worse these last month and a half than it's been in the last 23 years I've been here. The number of power outages has been through the roof. We're getting often a few per day that typically last 12 hours to a day and a half um horrible long things i highly suspect it's because they cranked up their sensitivity to have any other little little power outage from anywhere in the whole <clears throat> large jurisdiction to shut off everything that's fine and that's good in the past they would turn things back on when they realize it's not from the circuit what they're doing now is keeping it off forever and ever until they physically walk or recently now using a helicopter. The hubris of the waste of time, waste of energy, waste of money of the helicopters of our time for being out of power for many days in the hypothetical possibility that in between the time that a power outage occurs in one place and the next five seconds that a line has gone down and they have to be so super careful is utterly ridiculous. It's goofy. The, the, the loss to, uh, to the, the, the rate payers, to the citizens, is so inefficient. Please, let's do have a, a town hall. Please make sure that the California Public Utility Commission there as well, because they're the ones who are overseeing this huge mess, and they're approving it, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, okay. okay. We'll take two more speakers. We have David Gazak. Your microphone is available. Great, I just pressed unmute, <laughs> thank you. Um, I live in La Selva Beach. Um, Tim Folger, who just spoke, is my neighbor. Um, I also support agenda item number eight, calling for a moratorium on non-retail cannabis licenses within a 500 foot setback. It's critical that the supervisors have this opportunity to review and examine the criteria that determine where these licenses can be issued. The moratorium will enable the supervisors to, to do this, to evaluate and strengthen protections for children, families, and residential neighborhoods in the same way that they have done for retail cannabis. Thank you for your consideration. The last speaker for this section will be Paul Lego. And as a reminder that public comment will continue after the agenda has completed. 
Hi, uh, my name is Paul Lego. I also uh, live in the Vaselva Beach area of Watsonville. I encourage the board to support the moratorium proposed in agenda item number eight and to support the proposed changes to the non-retail cannabis ordinance to separate cultivation from residential communities by 500 feet. I'm not against cannabis. I'm not against cannabis cultivation. I support the right to farm. I oppose cannabis cultivation near residential communities, regardless of zoning. Cannabis is not just another crop. Other crops do not require security fencing and motion sensing lights every 50 feet. Other crops don't require odor control. Other crops aren't grown at night. Other crops aren't illegal in many states and at the federal level. We've lived with farms next door farming other crops like flowers and strawberries for decades successfully. Cannabis is different as already acknowledged by the existing ordinance. When Santa Cruz County chose to drop work on the draft environmental impact report for California uh, CEQA, uh, you took on a legal and moral responsibility to evaluate and mitigate the environmental impacts of cannabis cultivation on a project by project basis. It's clear that there are significant and difficult or impossible to mitigate impacts of cannabis cultivation near residential communities. Those impacts are on children and other sensitive populations as well as our environment. We're legally bound to, bound to consider those impacts. I strongly encourage you to consider a moratorium on just new cannabis licenses that would potentially violate the proposed setbacks of 500 feet from these residentially zoned lots. I also encourage you to consider and change the cannabis cultivation ordinance to keep cultivation separated from those lots. There are hundreds of other parcels that are still viable for cannabis cultivation. Be true to CEQA and be kind and fair. Okay. We will go um, to item number six. Um, Pardon me, Chair. Oh, let's go ahead. Sorry. So, yeah, we're going to go to item number six for action on the consent agenda. Um, any board members, uh, Supervisor Koenig, any comments on the consent items? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, on item 30, approving potential locations for alert wildfire cameras uh, and asking OR3, the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience uh, to provide regular reports until we get at least three more cameras installed. Uh, I just want to encourage my colleagues to review the list of potential sites for additional alert wildfire cameras uh, and, and work with OR3 to um, help get them installed if you know constituents with good potential locations or any of the called out locations. We were able to identify some private funding in the first district for one of the locations. Uh, and I think we'll be able to move quickly on at least one site. Um, and I also just, because there's a few grand jury reports uh, that we're responding to in item 23, I want to call out that with item 30, it's actually um, following up on an item from last year's grand jury report, uh, the one called Ready, Aim, Fire, Santa Cruz County in the hot seat that talked about fire response uh, preparedness. And uh, that was recommendation 23 in that report was to get more alert wildfire cameras. So I uh, just want to you know, assure the public that while we're not always respond to these uh, reports immediately, they do provide a good list of recommendations that we can work with in the future. On items uh, 40 and 45, I just want to thank Public Works for completing these essential uh, repairs, both the storm damage repairs to SoCal San Jose Road, which of course is a major artery in our county, uh, and the many other repairs with the RSTIP funding and item uh, called out in item 45. And then uh, finally, I just uh, also wanted to point out item 44. We're spending a significant amount of money on uh, design for the new transfer station or actually potentially multiple transfer stations from Buena Vista uh, with just eight to 10 years of remaining capacity at, uh, at this uh, county dump. You know, I think it's essential that we continue to pursue as a board waste reduction measures. That's all. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Supervisor Friend, second district. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Koenig, for your comments on, in particular, on item 30. I, I share them very strongly about the value of these uh, wildfire detection cameras, uh, which was a commentary we had had during the budget hearing with OR3. Um, I would like to obviously see uh, some additional locations within the second district. I'm happy to work with OR3 on that. I do recognize that there are also some private companies that have been partnering with PG&E and others. So this is a list of what we're dealing with, but there actually are some additional cameras already set up within uh, our respective areas in both the third, first, and second districts. But but I think that this is a pretty cost-effective way to get some eyes uh, in the air on early detection, which is something that should that have been able to happen on CZU, 
uh, it's possible we could have had uh, better outcomes. If nothing else, um, it's something that CAL FIRE definitely wants to see a significant expansion of. The state has provided additional funding for in their most recent budget, and so I'm looking forward to that extension. I appreciate Supervisor Koenig's efforts on that as well. Um, I'll just make a comment on whatever the new number of the item is and regarding the letter to the governor, I assume it's 51.2 maybe, whatever the last item we just added to the agenda was from the consent agenda. Uh, again, appreciation uh, to Dr. Mark Strudley and Public Works for his remarkable leadership on this. I, I can't emphasize enough how difficult it's been to thread the needle between uh, local, state, and federal government on this to get a project funded that for 60 years couldn't even get out of the feasibility stage. So uh, we've really had to um, pull some some uh, both policy and political miracles here, but we have a very con uh, a very committed group both at the county as well as at the state and federal delegation to make this happen. And, and there's just so much momentum in this last state effort. If the, govern, if the governor can sign this bill, uh, we'll remove a enormous burden from two disadvantaged communities, eliminating what we estimate to be at least half of their uh, of what we'll need to ask local voters to help fund for the oper ongoing operations and maintenance on that. So it's pretty remarkable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, third district. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just two brief comments. Uh, one is on item number 37. I want to thank the Parks Department for getting the Keep America Beautiful grant uh, and investing it up on the North Coast. And on item number 42, I want to thank uh, Public Works for working on the Swanton Road uh, repair. Uh, it's, been, it's long overdue, and it'll, it'll be a big benefit to the residents up there. District. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, uh, McPherson. Uh, item 22, redistrict, uh, redistricting process uh, takes place really at uh, the city, county, state, and federal uh, uh, areas uh, uh, every 10 years. And it's very important when it comes to uh, elections and representation for, uh, for everybody, pretty much. Uh, so the next one in uh, South County will be at Starlight School in Watsonville, September 30th at 6.30 p.m. And that'll uh, give the public a, a good chance to give their uh, opinion on the whole process and how the maps are drawn uh, for the uh, representation in, in the elections coming up in the next 10 years, basically. Uh, number 23, uh, grand jury, uh, uh, just want to say definitely uh, we have to get more staffing in the correctional uh, bureau, the prisons, and uh, they're, they're understaffed and they have a lot of mandatory overtime and it's a very stressful job. So uh, uh, I just want to assure uh, everyone that the uh, the board takes that very seriously and uh, we're going to look at it uh, coming up real quick. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to comment on a couple items. Uh, also on number 22, the redistricting process. I want to encourage members of the public to participate in that process by our county advisory redistrict commission. Uh, we have three meetings uh, th that will be uh, drawing the uh, our supervisorial lines for the next 10 years. They're all at 630, uh, September 22nd at the Sheriff Community Room in Live Oak. Uh, September 29th at the Felton Library, and was mentioned September 30th at the Starlight Elementary School in Watsonville. On item 23, also on uh, the grand jury report, I'd like to thank members of the grand jury for their service and thoughtful findings regarding the CU, CZU fire complex and other topics they reviewed this past year. Um, and item 29, that's also been mentioned about the next generation radio system. I'm happy to see this move forward. As we saw during the CZU fire, uh, as our emergency responders see every day, really, uh, communication among the agency is in, incredibly vital. It needs to be improved and modernized, and I look forward to seeing the analysis that come forward. Um, on item number 30, I want to thank Supervisor Koenig for bringing this item forward. The cameras are a very useful tool in putting out fires, and I'm supportive of this and identifying where they are. Uh, I, just, I want to ensure that the sites considered here will be evaluated further and confirmed uh, to be feasible by fire authorities. 
and other experts before this item comes back to the board. So I'm not sure what this uh, process of evaluation is, but I think it's critical we have the fire districts involved. And so I'm gonna make, make sure that that happens. I'm, I, I think it's probably in place, but uh, we obviously need to have that happen. Um, yes, absolutely. We'll, we'll make sure that happens. Okay. And on item number 45, the resurfacing projects um, re regarding the eight road repair projects on con uh, today's consent agenda, the Public Works Department is doing a phenomenal job with the funding it has, uh, really supported by Measure D that was passed by county voters. Uh, in the 5th District, I can tell the residents in Alba, Bear Creek, and Zion East Siany Roads that uh, they're thrilled and thankful for the resurfacing work, and I want to thank the um, the Public Works Department for that. With that, I would like I would entertain a motion to uh, to approve the consent agenda as amended because we added the item. Is that that be the correct way? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, Pardon me, sir. Approve. We do still need the addition of um, Supervisor Friend's signature added to fifty one point two, which will be the Senate bill. So we'll need the motion to include that additional direction. Oh, be, we need a specific motion for that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you could just ask, uh, add the extra direction for supervisor friend to sign SB4, a letter on SB 496 with you. Okay. So would that be a separate motion? It can be part of the same motion. Same motion. Yes. Entertain a motion by separate yes, supervisor absolutely. captain. Add the second. Second. Second by Koenig. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Friend. He said aye. Yeah, I said that. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we'll go to our regular agenda, a presentation on COVID-19 response and infrastructure enhancement plan, except COVID-19 epidemiology and laboratory capacity grant in the amount of one eleven million seventy nine thousand four hundred and thirty nine dollars from the California Department of Public Health. COVID-19 local assistant grant funds in the amount of $1,517,000, uh, 353 from the CDPH. Uh, immunization gr uh, branch adopt resolutions accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of $5 million for the fiscal year 2021-22, approve addition of 11 and a half full-time equivalent positions, permanent positions, the addition of 20 full-time limited term positions through June 30th, 2024, and extension of 32 full-time limited term positions through June 30th, 2024, direct the health services agency to return by August 31st, 2022, with an update on the community-wide response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Health Services. We have the list of positions, the uh, epidemiology uh, laboratory capacity expansion, and a resolution on that expansion. Um, and I do want to say, as we go into this, uh, my, my thanks for the staff for what I consider to be a gold standard of responses to the pandemic. Uh, this has been and continues to be an, an enormous challenge. And uh, I especially like to mention uh, Mimi Hall, the county's director of, of health services, she will be leaving the county in October, but has done an exemplary job in getting our community on track and staying there. Um, we have fought this crisis as uh, as well as we can on the health health uh, issues, and I really want to thank you for your input and your whole department and what it's done. So thank you very much. We go ahead and make the presentation. Thank you so much for your kind and supportive words, Supervisor. McPherson, it's truly, truly appreciated. Today, I do have with me uh, both of my assistant directors, co-assistant director Jen Herrera, uh, who is uh, the force overseeing the COVID response on the ground in the Department Operations Center. And I'd also like to introduce Tiffany Cantrell Warren, who has joined us virtually. Tiffany comes to us most recently from the city of Long Beach Health and Human Services. And uh, Tiffany, if you'd like to say a, a brief hello, that'd be great. I believe she's joined us. Just a moment. She can adjust her so she'll hear you. 
Mm -hmm. Tiffany is on. Sorry, it it like rebooted me. Hi, my name is Tiffany Cantrell Warren. Um, I am very excited to be joining the County of Santa Cruz. Um, I actually grew up in Santa Cruz County, and so I'm really happy to bring the experience that I've gained um, in a different community in Southern California back to help my home community. And I look forward to working with each of you and with our community members to elevate health, um, protect and promote health and wellness for the residents, all residents of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Hey, Tiffany, and we also have Dr. Gail Newell and other staff available should the board have questions after our presentation. So um, I do wanna note, and again, your, your words are so meaningful, Chair McPherson, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in the death of almost 700,000 Americans to date and tens of millions more Americans have been infected. And the dollars that we are asking for the board to accept and appropriate today are incredibly needed to not only continue our responses, but bolster them for what we anticipate will be a prolonged response effort into the foreseeable future. So with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Assistant Director Jennifer Herrera, who will provide an overview of the COVID-19 response to date and the infrastructure enhancement plan as a result of the funds we request that you appropriate today. Thank you, Director Hall, and thank you, Board. During this presentation, we will cover the county's pandemic response to COVID-19. The purpose of this item is to request your board's authorization to accept and appropriate new funding for COVID-19 public health activities and request your board's approval of new positions to sustain the response. We'll start by reviewing what we've accomplished, a phrase I call the sprint. During the during this time frame, public health and the community sprinted to get ahead of this novel disease by building and innovating new infrastructure and partnerships. Next, we'll review where we're going, what I call the marathon. The marathon is about enduring for the long haul. We expect the pandemic to last for years and the impact to last for generations. The work ahead will need to be energized, focused, and steady to sustain the response and recovery. We will conclude with the recommended actions for this new phase of our pandemic response and closing remarks from HSA Director Amy Hall. The county sprint to build a pandemic response was done so with these core attributes in mind. What is our legal duty? Recognizing that partnerships are vital, needing a unique infrastructure for this unique moment and centering health equity. Legal duty. Under California Code of Regulations, Title 17, local health departments have a unique legal responsibility to control the spread of communicable disease at a population level or the entire county population, regardless of where people in the county, uh, where people live in the county, what type of insurance they have, or where they receive medical care. This unique duty authorizes a county health officer to create legal orders and enforce preventive measures that are necessary to protect and preserve the community from public health hazards during times of emergencies. Furthermore, counties have the unique responsibility of ensuring a medical health operational area coordinator or a MOAC is available to coordinate medical and health disaster resources with the state. The county's pandemic response was based on the understanding that a public health crisis should be led by public health, the entity with the knowledge, foundation, and legal responsibility for population-based disease control. Partnerships. HSA Public Health Division's mission statement is to collaborate with the community to protect, promote, and improve the health and well-being of all. Though we we have led the countywide response, Population-based impact is not possible without partnerships. The county's accomplishments have been dependent on partnerships with a wide array of internal stakeholders, including the Human Services Department's Shelter Operation and the county's Emergency Operations Center, as well as external stakeholders, including the entire healthcare system, community-based organizations, county office of education, neighboring jurisdictions, and community coalitions such as Pajaro Valley Safe Lives. The success of our response has been dependent on developing these unique partnerships. Infrastructure. We utilize the incident command system or ICS structure to support the need to rapidly develop and organize response to the pandemic. Using ICS, we formally activated a departmental operations center or DOC, which has stayed active since its initiation in February of 2020. 
During the course of this response, over 300 staff have been deployed to the HSA DOC. The majority of deployed staff have been from HSA admin and the public health division. However, most HSA staff have continuously worked the front lines of the pandemic. Our clinics and behavioral health staff continue to provide direct services to patients and environmental health continued to provide education and technical support to businesses struggling to keep up with the changing industry guidance. Health equity. Last but certain, certainly not least, at the core of our pandemic response is health equity. Health equity is a concept that everyone should have a fair and just opportunity to live their healthiest life. As public health experts, we knew that there would be populations disproportionately affected by this pandemic. Populations historically impacted by social and structural determinants of health, such as poverty and racism. We continue to center health equity at the core of our response, using data and an understanding of the social determinants of health to identify health disparities and allocate efforts accordingly. To focus our response efforts, early on, we assessed the existing knowledge of pandemic response and developed a framework to characterize the purpose and general activities of what we're doing. This became Save Live Santa Cruz County. The purpose of our response to COVID-19 is to save as many lives as possible in Santa Cruz County. And we do this through the acronym of SAVE, slowing the spread of the virus, adapting to a new normal, ensuring vaccines and therapeutics are available, and elevating public health readiness. Save Lives has been a helpful framework to reference over the course of this pandemic. This orange line here is the average trend of daily COVID-19 cases in our county over time. You can see that we've had surges and lulls over time, and we are currently on the decline of our third surge. Between January and June of 2020, there was a rush or a sprint to understand. We first heard of the novel coronavirus in January of 2020. Public health at that time convened regular meetings between its communicable disease units, uh, emergency preparedness and emergency medical services to keep tabs on this emerging situation. There were so many unknowns at the time. How does it spread? Is it airborne? Is it droplet? How lethal is it? Is it worse than the flu? How many ventilators will we need? What was clear is how this virus was impacting healthcare systems internationally. Wuhan, New York City, Italy, the images and stories of health systems overwhelmed. They were horrifying and worrisome. Though we had a few cases during this period, it was a time frame marked with uncertainty, chaos, and a lot of preparedness. At this time, we put out mass gathering guidance. There were new shelter in place orders put out. There was a insufficient testing. And so there was a lot of coordination with the healthcare system on that. And there was a lack of clarity from the CDC as the science was still emerging. Our objectives during this time was clear. Flatten the curve, meaning slow the spread to maintain the healthcare system, which would save lives. Prepare our community to the extent that we could at the time and contain the spread through testing, case investigation and contact tracing. We activated the DOC in February, late February, once it was clear that the virus was in California. And by the end, by early March, we were notified of our first case. We spent much of this time building new systems and partnerships to prepare for the surge to come. In July through October, we rushed to address our first surge and manage multiple emergencies. In July, we experienced our first local surge of cases while simultaneously onboarding to new technology to increase our case investigation and contact tracing efficiencies. Uh, at its height, we reached about 44 cases in a day. This surge highlighted the urgent need to create new systems in order to protect the population from this virus. As the surge ended, HSA responded to the CZU fire, supporting the medical health branch of the EOC's operations section. Nurses that had been previously deployed to support COVID investigations were immediately rerouted to support shelters. Our MOAC team coordinated mutual aid from the state and other jurisdictions, including the deployment of behavioral health staff from other jurisdictions so that our staff could continue to serve our high needs clients. And we procured rapid COVID-19 test kits for use at the shelters. While partnerships and systems were being built, this was a difficult time for all county staff. 
we were all dealing with multiple emergencies, direct services, the newly instituted furlough. We rushed to increase our capacity through extra help and contract staff to maintain the response. However, there were many accomplishments, including the distribution of health equity grants using coronavirus relief funds and, increase un and an increased understanding of COVID-19 science, which helped provide better employer and industry guidance. During this phase, our objectives were to mitigate the spread of COVID. And once case rates declined, our objective was to suppress further stages by maintaining testing, investigation, and isolation and quarantine capacity. Between November and February, we experienced our worst surge yet, peaking at about 300 cases per day. During this time frame, we saw many outbreaks in high-risk settings, such as skilled nursing facilities. Our hospitals were over capacity, and we saw many deaths, around 167 deaths during this period. Our staff were overworked, never adequately rebounding from the first surge and dual emergency response. Extra help staff proved vital and worked so many additional hours that they were at the verge of exhausting their allowable time with the county and therefore at risk of being separated mid-year. During this period, the sprint continued. Staff worked quickly to mitigate the spread. But there were a couple of silver linings. We knew that the surge would end, which it eventually did around February. And vaccines, highly effective vaccines became available by early December. This period was literally a rush to save lives, addressing outbreaks, managing efficient distribution of scarce vaccines with very finicky logistics and working with personnel to maintain our staffing. Between March and June of 2021, we sprinted to vaccinate. As supplies became available, our community held a variety of mass vaccination and pop-up clinics with much success. In partnership with our health and community partners, we were consistently one of the top counties with the highest vaccination rates. Vaccines were distributed, distributed equitably by geography in our county. Vaccines became steadily available in routine healthcare settings, such as primary care and commercial pharmacies. Cases continue to decline to, to rates similar to earlier in the pandemic, and we continue to refine our disease control infrastructure, and the DOC staff were granted an exception to roll over their furlough hours to next fiscal year, which, created, which provided greater flexibility with our staff capacity. As vaccines steadily showed their real-world effectiveness, there was a rush to provide guidance in this new normal. Were masks necessary? Do vaccinated people need to quarantine? What will return to work look like? Is it over yet? Our focus during this time frame was to continue to suppress the virus, vaccinate as efficiently as possible, and help the community adapt to this new normal. And now we are in our current phase starting in July, um, which um, we continue to sprint to mitigate the surge and understand the impact of the COVID-19 Delta variant. <laughs> We continue to focus on neighborhood-based vaccine clinics with a focus on equitable vaccine distribution. Local, state, and international data has proven the effectiveness of vaccines at preventing serious illness, hospitalization, and death. 20 months we have been sprinting. We've done so much and we realize that this isn't sustainable and it's time to pivot. And that pivot is to this next phase, which I called the marathon. The pandemic isn't over and won't be for a while. The actual surge and lulls of the pandemic could last for years and the recovery efforts will last many more. And though we have learned a lot, there are still many unknowns about this virus. There are questions about how, you know, how long will the vaccines hold out? What are the effects of long COVID? What are the long-term social impacts of the pandemic? Economic instability, lack of in-person instruction for schools, behavioral health and traumatic events and coping for the community. Public health needs to maintain an adaptive response to COVID-19 and other threats to public health. Every surge has been a unique experience affecting different populations and settings with a variety, with varying severity. So we need to remain flexible to the situation. Planning for this marathon, we need the following. We need to strengthen our partnerships. Every partnership that we have developed over this, um, this pandemic has been extremely valuable. And we need to sustain what works and grow on those partnerships. 
We need to increase our internal capacity for a sustained response. We found that we can't sustain an adequate response with extra help staff and volunteers and contractors. We need to also have hired staff to continue on with this uh, on this long road. Infrastructure readiness to accept future funding. It's not just about disease control operations like case investigation and contact tracing. We also need accountants, admin aides, analysts, the staff that ensure that we continue to be responsible stewards of public funds that is rapidly becoming available. And we need to develop necessary infrastructure for HSA's unique role to address county priorities, such as racial equity. COVID has exacerbated existing disparities. If we are truly going to achieve health equity, which is at the core of our response, we need to address the root causes of the systemic inequities that cause these disparities, such as racism. It's not a coincidence that the primary population affected by COVID-19 are those who've identified as Latinx or Latino or Latino, but this disparity is preventable. For this new phase in our pandemic response, we are requesting the acceptance of two funding sources, both from the California Department of Public Health. On the left, you'll see the ELC expansion funds, which is a total of around $11 million. This funding spans from January 2021 through July 2023. We are asking for 4.5 million to be appropriated for this fiscal year. And the purpose of these funds is to support basic public health disease control infrastructure to sustain our COVID-19 response. On the right, you'll see the other set of funding that we are asking to accept, which is a total of $1.5 million through our immunization grant. It's a supplemental to an existing five-year grant that we typically get from the state. And we are asking to appropriate 500,000 for this fiscal year. This will support COVID-19 vaccination services and uh, systems changes to integrate COVID-19 into the healthcare system. During our sprint phase, we realized how chronically understaffed we were to adequately fulfill our role to lead the countywide pandemic response. Though we have had success with external partnerships, it became clear that we need to increase our internal capacity. Here's a graph that shows our vac uh, vacancy average for HSA's public health division. You can see over uh, the course of the pandemic, it drastically increased, just reflecting um, the realization of how much stuff we actually need to be an adequate health department. Um, the pandemic has highlighted our unique role of a local health department, and this new funding that we received has provided some great opportunities for us to be innovative with how we staff our department. So our staffing request is to add 11.5 full-time equivalent permanent positions. Um, we are asking for some permanent positions because we are expecting to receive ongoing funding in the future after these one-time grants um, end in 2023 and 2024. Uh, for example, the state general fund has um, promised 300 million annually to public health uh, starting next fiscal year. So we look forward to learning more about that. We're asking to add 20 FTE limited term positions as well as ex extending 32 limited term positions, many of which are already filled with um, excellent staff. This is a timeline to fill those positions and the list of activities that we need to do to have a candidate start. And we'll continue to work closely with personnel to fill all of these vacancies. At HSA, it can take anywhere between 11 to 20 weeks to fill a vacancy. If there is no existing list, then it can take about 11 weeks. If we have to do a recruitment to develop and rank a list, that's when it takes closer to 20 weeks to fill a vacancy. So in this last stretch of the sprint, we aim to move quickly to have many of these positions filled by January of 2022 or sooner. And I will turn it over to Director Hall for closing statements. Thank you, Assistant Director Herrera. It's clear from Assistant Director's presentation that we have really, really risen, not only as a staff, but as a community and as a county to address COVID-19. And one of the things that I'm so grateful for in terms of these funding is that they provide an opportunity for us to address equity. We can see that across the country, the pain that we've seen from COVID-19 has disproportionately affected certain groups in certain communities. And we've seen that here in Santa Cruz County. 
Communities of color in particular have felt the pain of the COVID pandemic uh, much more sharply, and they have experienced disproportionate case counts, deaths, and other social impacts. And the disparities that we've seen over the last year weren't a result of COVID-19. They're actually a result of illuminated inequities that have existed for a long time in our county systems. So in order to achieve health equity, we really have to address the structural barriers that we have that impact any of the groups differently to influence where a person lives, where they work, where their children play. We understand that race and equity are determinants of health. So as Assistant Director Jen Herrera has communicated, HSA ha truly has a critical role, not only in fighting the pandemic, but in all matters of health to address the impact of racism and other social determinants of health. So as we stand before you today or sit before you today to ask for appropriation of these funds, we promise that we will continue to expand our internal agency efforts and also strengthen our external partnerships to foster greater diversity and an inclusive approach to addressing our biggest health problems. We are also relieved that our federal government, as well as our state, has committed to ongoing funding to support public health infrastructure. And we know that now is the time to acknowledge the work of public health and act quickly to help us bolster our capacity for the future. There have been a lot of kudos given to the HSA team and our public health staff, and they are absolutely well-deserved. We have by far the best team that has worked conscientiously to follow science, that best practice, and the value of every single human life. But I would be remiss if I did not thank our overall county leadership and our board. The reason that we have been able to have the kind of impact we've had with the COVID-19 pandemic in Santa Cruz County is because we had the political will to let science lead and let the experts in public health lead a public health emergency. And we've also had top county leadership that has supported that. And I believe that lives were saved in Santa Cruz County because of this approach. So I wanna thank our county leadership, our elected officials, the CAO's office, our county EOC, all of the departments that rallied behind us in the public health approach. And I, it truly made a difference in Santa Cruz County. And with that today, we ask for your board's approval for the various items uh, before you to accept and appropriate funds from California Department of Public Health to help strengthen our public health infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to reiterate how fantastic and I'd say unbelievable the staff work that you've had. Um, I mean, it was double overtime uh, for many, many of your staff and uh, this request for additional personnel to help us uh, uh, address this and attack this uh, pandemic is uh, is uh, very impressive. And I just can't, I don't know how to express more so than to say thank you for your unbelievable commitment to the public safety of the people of Santa Cruz County. Um, I'll start the uh, comments from the board with Supervisor Coonerty. Great, uh, thank you. I wanna thank you uh, all for, you and your entire staff for the efforts you made during that sprint and now uh, the efforts that'll be ongoing during this marathon um, that will face not only COVID, but just the, the changing challenges, uh, the emerging challenges that we will face uh, and uh, future pandemics and infectious disease and challenges that, that, that we will have. Uh, my only question about this was, um, you know, uh, that you showed the staffing challenges um, during the pandemic and now we're increasing staffing. Um, it's, as we all know, it's very hard to recruit people to come to Santa Cruz County because of the high cost of uh, housing. And I'm wondering what we're doing, if anything, to create a pipeline from our local uh, schools and universities um, into, into the public health division um, so we can make sure that these positions are full. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. That's a really, really great question. Uh, we actually have support for that. I, we haven't come yet to the board for it. We have an additional stream of funding in the amount of $750,000 for public health workforce development. 
And the state is also providing technical assistance, training, consultation to help do the things exactly like you described. Um, it's not gonna happen in three months or even a year, but it really is laying the groundwork in partnerships with our universities, um, local education, K through 12, um, many, many other sectors to build up that workforce. And at the same time, we are looking at being competitive as a health services agency. It's not enough in government to be equitable with your county counterparts. We are competing with hospitals, the Veterans Administration, uh, the, with the schools for school nurses. And um, if we wanna attract and keep really, really good staff and not have them leave for the next better job, we really have to address workforce. And that is one of the things that both of our co-assistant directors will be working on uh, bolstering in the next year with the assistance of those workforce development dollars. Great, thank you. Supervisor Caput. Oh, hi there. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing all right, thank all you. Right. I want to thank you for your report. Uh, uh, it's been quite an experience the last uh, year and 10 months. And uh, I can't think of anybody better than, uh, than you and your staff uh, helping us, helping guide us through all of the challenges we had. And uh, I also want to wish you the best uh, in the future. That's it. Thanks, Mimi. Thank uh, you. Thank you also. Supervisor uh, Koenig. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, and of course, thank you to you and all the health staff for your, your work during this very long sprint. We've all heard about all the state money uh, available these days with the huge budget surplus. And it's fantastic, of course, to see it showing up in our county in a very tangible way that's going to improve people's lives. Uh, you, you, know, you talked a lot about improving our local health infrastructure and obviously uh, more staff are a huge, are, you know, the primary way that we're going to do that. Um, but I'm curious, you know, are there others, uh, other ways that you look at spending this money on, you know, infrastructure itself that will also improve our overall system? And, you know, and what are the grants, uh, what kind of spending is eligible with these grants? Yes, we're uh, we're fortunate to have some flexibility with this funding, especially the ELC expansion funds, which is generally to support disease control infrastructure. So what that looks like, in addition to staffing, of course, there's training. Um, and uh, so we want to ensure that all staff have training in you know, something as basic as equity and racial equity, um, as well as disease control processes and infection control so that we have a base, a clear baseline standard of competencies for our department. In addition to that, um, we're looking at big infrastructure like technology, uh, working with the Santa Cruz Health Information Exchange um, to create efficiencies with how diseases are reported into our department to public health, and then also investments into how we analyze um, into our analytics and which you can see um, some of those investments in our data dashboard that's developed over the course of the pandemic, um, increasing our epi capacity and the tools um, to provide them so that they can work on that analysis. Um, so that's some of the things that we're working on. In addition to that, we're looking at uh, contracted partnerships um, with organizations to do um, uh, outreach and engagement um, Although uh, in public health, we pride ourselves in being public health professionals and equity minded, we also recognize we're not necessarily the right people to do the outreach. And so that's where we work with community-based organizations like the Live Oak Cradle to Career Program and their Promotora Program. Um, uh, so developing a network of promotoras. So we're looking at workforce, not just within uh, internally within public health, but we're also looking community-wide. What does public health workforce look like community-wide? And that includes um, training our uh, people with lived experience and people in the community around public health. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'd like to ju just add a little bit to that. Um, you know, we've been working on these matters before the COVID. COVID just created the impetus for the funding to um, be able to pursue the infrastructure that we wanted. So I did want to note for that, that pre-pandemic, um, we had been working, we, Jen and I, um, to kind of reorganize how health services agency delivers its public health services. 
So um, as you know from previous um, presentations, we look upstream as well as midstream and downstream and uh, make sure that our investments are equally weighted far upstream and focused on prevention. So we have uh, in the past couple of years worked on reorganizing our public health division. And so we have a population health unit that didn't exist before. Uh, we have a unit that focuses on overall prevention. We, prov we brought in substance use disorder prevention from behavioral health into public health. Um, so all of these things that kind of make us work smarter and uh, put the right people working on the right things in the right way. Okay, thanks. Um, and, and you've talked a lot about equity and you just described some of those ways that you can do that, working with community partners. Um, but of course, one of the big reasons that we saw much higher rates of, of infection uh, in the uh, Latinx population, and particularly in that, I guess, middle, first and middle wave uh, of the pandemic, were because we have um, multiple families living per, house, per household, right? It's because, um, because of the income inequality, and of course, that combined with the acute shortage of housing uh, in our community. And I noticed in uh, some of the grant uh, eligible spending things that hoteling was one of those. Um, I just wondered if there was any contemplation of, I don't know, potentially buying some sort of small units that you could keep on either one of the North or South County health campuses so that in the future, if someone, uh, you know, does contract uh, COVID or another infectious disease and they need a place to really, you know, remove themselves from their family, that they could do that rather than, um, you know, infecting the rest of their family or other families that they're, they're forced to live with. Yeah, I, I'll try to address that and you can clarify, uh, Assistant Director Herrera. I, I don't think that this allows for a large capital purchase. It allows for construction improvements um, and vouchers and paying for hoteling. But what you say is spot on in terms of our need. And we are experiencing that not just with COVID, but with recuperative care. Uh, two whole floors of um, the roadway in that it, that we are using as an INQ shelter is um, a lot. Much of those floors are from patients being discharged from the hospital that aren't prepared to take care of themselves, that don't have an adequate place to go. And um, when the funding runs out for us to cover those costs, we're going to have a problem. And so we are committed to working with Housing for Health, with uh, the community partners and our cities to think about how do we address this particular piece that has been highlighted by the pandemic and is our obligation to, um, to address going forward. Okay, so you recognize it's a need, but maybe this is not the right funding source. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, yeah, and I think... I think there are, there are ways for us to work with other partners to address that. And this may be a part of it. You know, mm -hmm. if, if some of this funding becomes ongoing, and I hope that it may, um, it could be that we figure out a way to actually purchase or acquire property that the, the operational costs can help be paid by this particular funding stream. It's about, you know, braiding all of our resources, but there are a lot of potentials. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Director Hall and Assistant Director Herrera. Congratulations, by the way, on the Assistant Director role. I don't think we've publicly acknowledged you on that, but it's well, absolutely well-deserved. Uh, Director Hall, while this isn't part of the presentation, let me just start by saying you will be uh, missed. As Supervisor Caput noted, you really did help guide us, along with Dr. Newell and everybody else on your staff. Well, it's not done yet, but through a pretty remarkable uh, trying time in our community. And I thought it was important as part of this presentation, as, as Ms. Herrera noted, um, it, sometimes when you're in the middle of this uh, challenge, you, you don't take the time to reflect on all the things that were done and the decisions that were made with imperfect information. And oftentimes people judge on spot decisions that are made as though that there was a counterfactual known and most of these decisions were just being made uh, with the best of the ability given the opportunities that we had. And I have to say that overall it was remarkable how correct uh, your health team was in helping guide this. Uh, I, I guess when you rely on science and not on uh, things you read online, you can actually make pretty significant uh, improvements in people's lives. So I just wanted to uh, appreciate you and your team for being steadfast throughout that entire process. Uh, I'm completely in support of the actual item that's before us and uh, sort of restructuring this in a, in a longitudinal way that can ensure that we can begin to build back um, the department in a, in a better way. There has been a historic underinvestment in public health across the country. 
as you know, started pretty significantly declining a, a couple decades ago. And and so if 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 this if there can be one good thing about that comes out of tragedy or or out of pandemics or out of these kinds of challenges, it would be that hopefully it can reform how we look at long-term investments and in things because they make long-term uh, valuable outcome differences. And so I think that this hopefully is the beginning of, of that component. So thank you again for both of you for your work and I am supportive of the item. Yeah, I'd like to make a short comment about um, it, the the time factor in it. It's nice to know that uh, this is gonna be going through uh, and, and accommodate these physicians through June 30th, 2024. One of the things I'm, we're all concerned about it's we're, the federal and state funds we have to address this pandemic and other issues too. Uh, often it's a one year deal. This is uh, two and a half years out or more, almost three years out. So uh, that's that gives it some, what shall we call sustainability. And uh, that's very welcome that uh, we're not going to have to ask for this every year uh, that uh, this uh, the funding will accommodate the positions you're asking for through June the fiscal year June or 23 24. Um, that's that's not the way it usually is, but I'm sure glad it's there. Um, that was just a general statement. Any comments from the public? Well, my name is James Ewing Whitman recently heard a mortician of 15 years describe what was going on in Great Britain with fascinating. Kind of makes me want to be a mortician to help support the families. You know, the, the 11th leading cause of death in the United States may be suicide, but long before this scandemic, the leading cause of death in the United States is Western medical doctors. And I would love to just speak really quickly on what I wrote this morning. It was from my heart. I am just upset with the criminal malfeasance here. It's disgusting. Thank you. The D.C. administration is paying legislate, legislators, county governments handsomely to run the COVID-19 agenda. You know, as we spoke about this about three weeks ago, there is no purified isolation of the genome anywhere to be found in the world. So there is no COVID-19. We've asked you to check the EUA hyphen CDC page 39 and the California Health Department, which wrote us back a letter, they both have no isolation. There is no need for remedies, the mask and the injection. This, is, this injection creates no immunity. It is experimental and there is no liability. If somebody is damaged or dies, it's on them. Dr. Cahill, Stanford and Cornell, have diagnosed cell cultures from ostensibly patients being treated for COVID-19. They have found only flu A and flu B. And with frequencies with the 4G and especially the 5G and comorbidities, people can get sick. We also now know that the nose swabs are vectors making people sick. They contain ethylene oxide and graphene oxide. No disease in history has lasted one and a half years. The injection is killing and maiming millions over the world. Reported body spasms, blindness, the, orth the uh, eye doctors are reporting they've never seen certain kinds of eye diseases that they're seeing now. It's also creating CVAs, which are strokes, heart attacks, paralysis, and much more. The agenda is communism control and injecting people worldwide with toxin graphene oxide, lipid spike pro spiked proteins that attack cells and cross the blood brain barrier, Please, causing prion disease, which is like mad cow disease and nanoparticles that are wild cards that may cause more gelins. It's a horrible disease in people. Thank you, please complete. What's more important, your moral compass 
or the funding and control. Let's ask you, consider these are injections that are dam damaging a lot of people. Thank you. Are there any uh, other comments from the public? Have any on the uh, phone? As a reminder for those joining us on Zoom, these are comments for item number seven. If your hand is still up for the public comment section, I've written your names down and we'll call you again at the end of the meeting. Please lower your hand if you intend to only speak to public comment. If you are speaking to item seven, please maintain your hand up. Okay. Valerie Laveroni Corral, your microphone is available. Is star six to unmute yourself. Thank you. I apologize for my. Uh, oops, my. You need to turn off the second. Yep, I've got a problem here. Excuse me. Um, I wanted to um, address the um, the issue of the cannabis moratorium, and. Um, I'd like to and thank you for uh, We're yeah, listening to this dialogue over the last 29 years. I've been speaking to it. I, and if, um, if you're, it's you're been primarily on countless uh, countless item meetings. Number eight. Of the Excuse me, um, Valerie. Uh, you're taking you comment me? on item number seven currently. Excuse we'll come back to I'm that. I'm sorry. Time. Okay, so I I will have to come back or I tell you what, I'll just send in a, a letter and save your, uh, save your, your time and my time. My apologies. I could not get into uh, the meeting earlier. No problem. That is board of supervisors at Santa Cruz County us. Call in user one, your microphone is available. This is Marilyn Garrett. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thanks to the previous speaker, Joanne, there. And I want to recommend two books that go into more depth on how this virus has never been isolated and uh, some other factors that cause disease. One book is called The Truth About Contagion, Exploring Theories of How Disease Spreads by Dr. Thomas Callan and Sally Fallon Morell. It can be ordered from Dr. Tom Callan.com website. The other book is coming out in November by Robert F. Kennedy Jr titled The Real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health. And I want to read a little from the forward to Dr. Mercola's Truth About COVID-19 book, and it's by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Please let me read this paragraph without cutting me off. Instead of citing scientific studies to justify mandates for masks, lockdowns, and vaccines, our medical rulers cite WHO, CDC, FDA, and NIH captive agencies that are groveling sock puppets to the industries they regulate. Multiple federal and international investigations have documented the financial entanglements with pharmaceutical companies that have made these regulators cesspools of corruption. And I fear that our own county is part of this financial entanglement. With the Monica McGuire, your microphone is available. Thank you so much. I am, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm again, 
horrified to see that you, our hired employees, have not only ignored our efforts to create local expert debates on this topic, um, which we've offered over and over to find out what would be best for our county needs. You have misrepresented and hidden that the emergency declarations you continue to renew that are supposedly to overrun, uh, avoid overrunning our hospitals are baseless because our hospitals actually closed down sections in order to look as though they had not enough beds, et cetera. All of this, including of course, that we know the PCR test has been brought to your attention over and over. It was never intended to be a test. So you're voting today whether to accept further huge amounts of money to support injecting people in this county with this experimental mRNA therapy in multiple forms is actually just putting all of us at risk, including yourselves, because doing so, despite so much evidence of harms already in recipients of these injections, is furthering harms to everyone else who volunteered to be part of the experiment and those of those of your constituents who said, we want no part of it. All people who love our rights have proclaimed my body, my choice, among other great phrases, and yet that right to determine what health experiments each of us desires to join is not being honored. You haven't brought this up. You haven't responded to our questions and points about it. And you are putting yourselves further at risk by continuing to not act in the public's best interest this way. You are harming children, especially as people have asked you, stop forcing them into masks and distancing at schools. That's ridiculous since they have uh, continue to prove they neither die of this nor are spreaders to anyone else. And closing down all our small businesses while you use the money for anything you want is disgusting. There are no other speakers on Zoom. Okay, I'll um, return it. No, anybody else in the public wants to speak on this? Uh, I'll return it to the board for action. I'll move the recommended action. I'll second. Be seconded by friend. Call the roll, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item number eight is to consider and adopt an urgency interim ordinance to place a moratorium on the issuance of new cannabis business licenses for operations on parcel zone commercial agriculture or CA that are adjacent or two or within 500 feet of residentially zoned parcel and schedule a public hearing for October 19th to consider an extension of the interim ordinance as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. We have the notice of the public hearing and urgency interim ordinance, a moratorium on cannabis licenses in Cal on, uh, on the commercial agriculture zone. Uh, this, you know, presenting this uh, today will be Sam Laforte um, from uh, our cannabis licensing manager. And go ahead. Oh, you can. Oh, I, I'm going to go ahead and present this morning. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Okay. That's all right, Chair. Uh, good morning, Chair and Board Members. Melody Serino, Deputy CAO. At the August 24th, 2021 meeting, the Board of Supervisors, um, your board identified potential conflicts between residentially zoned parcels and commercial agricultural operations in the commercial agricultural or CA zone district. The board directed staff to come back with an interim urgency ordinance to impose a temporary moratorium on the issuance of new cannabis business licenses for operations on parcel zone CA that are adjacent to or within 500 feet of a residentially zoned parcel while staff considers and studies a proposed prohibition and county code amendments. Staff were also directed to return on November 9th to consider policy proposals and changes to the ordinance that reflect these parameters. I just wanted to give a quick review of current licensing areas for cannabis cultivation, because you might not remember all of this, we did this so long ago, and the minimum acreage required. Please note that other non-retail operations, such as non-volatile manufacturing and class one distribution are also allowed on these parcels based on the current ordinance. 
in order allow to, in order to allow time for the board to consider possible changes to the ordinance to address the conflicts between residentially zoned areas and cannabis activities in the CA zone district, a temporary moratorium is proposed on issuing new licenses in CA zone parcels that abut or are within 500 feet of a residentially zoned parcel. I just want you to note when we looked at this, we included all residentially zoned parcels um, and that a residentially zoned parcel would include RA, which is residential agriculture, where cannabis activities are currently allowed if the parcel is five acres or more. So I wanna show you a map. And can you give me control? You should oh, have please. Control. So first I wanna show you um, all of the CA zoned parcels. Um, and I'm just going to zoom down a little bit so you can see there's some on the North Coast as well. Um, but the green, primarily uh, the CA zoned parcels are in the South County. Um, but the green areas, the light green areas show all of the CA zoned parcels um, within the County of Santa Cruz. And I'm gonna focus mostly on the South County since that's where most of the parcels are, but I will show the rest of the map. You asked for a 500 foot buffer. So we added these red lines into the map so you can see the um, buffer zones. Um, and then you asked for that buffer around all the RA parcels. So now I'm showing you the map with all of those parcels identified. And I'm going to show you now, this is what's left then once we take out all those parcels. The dark green now indicates what parcels will be available for cannabis cultivation that do not abut or are within 500 feet of the um, parameters that you established. So the quick numbers, sorry, we can get out of the map and back to the slide. So these are the quick numbers um, are shown. Um, so there's 1,462 1, CA parcels in the county. Once you take out those uh, parcels within the buffer zone or that abut, um, we're left with 689 um, CA zone parcels that are available for licensing still during the moratorium. And I, again, I just wanna remind you that RA zone prop properties um, already allow some cannabis activity, um, though there are other considerations you may remember, including setbacks and cannabis size limitations on those RA zone properties. So these are currently licenses in process, which would be impacted by the moratorium, which was information you asked for. Some are working on meeting their use permit conditions of approval, building out their facilities to become operational. And those ones in yellow are the ones who have submitted pre-applications to start the licensing process. So um, each line represents a particular APN number and you can see what district they're in, the total number of potential licenses uh, within that license, um, the current applications and review, and if there's any current uh, licenses on that parcel. Uh, the total potential licenses, including those that are in the pre-application phase represent approximately 22,000 square feet of indoor canopy cultivation, 530,000 square feet of greenhouse canopy operations, 20,000 square feet of hoop house canopy cultivation, 150,000 square feet of greenhouse nursery operations, and 22,000 square feet of outdoor canopy cultivation. The total value of the potential revenue loss of CBT is estimated at 2.5 million. And I want you to understand that this is a very broad estimate. We did not have time to do a really detailed analysis um, around this that looks at market price fluctuations or the likelihood of lost production area, um, you know, given whether these facilities will actually be built within the year and other important factors. But we will look at that um, in time for the November report back. Those who currently hold a license and are required to renew annually would not be impacted by the moratorium. 
However, our budgeted tax revenue for the current fiscal year included an increase based on projects in the pipeline. So should these projects, these ones here, the potentially impacted one be delayed in their licensing um, or, or um, not be allowed to continue, we may not meet our projected revenues either for licensing or CBT. In addition, if the board makes these changes in November and includes the current licensees, precluding them from renewal because they are but or are within 650 feet or 500 feet of a residential parcel, this would impact approximately 37 properties, impacting about 60% of our non-CBT revenue. So these are the recommended actions for today, and we are prepared to answer your questions. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I'll, most of these are uh, in the second and fourth districts, of course, as, as identified. That's correct. Uh, I'd just like to call on uh, Supervisor Zach Friend in the second district if he has any comments before we go to the public. And I think you might just want to go to the public, but go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Super uh, Chair McPherson. I appreciate the presentation. Um, There's a couple of things in the presentation. I did have some quick comments on. I mean, the, what, what's being proposed doesn't impact uh, renewals or, or or current licensees. So I, I know that comment was made at, at the end, but that that's not the intention. This is to deal with uh, those that that would be in the future that would be in um, conflict with this. Uh, additionally, a lot of the the people that are in the early early licensing process, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll receive a license. So I think that there's a little bit of of um, Clarity, generally speaking, on that on that slide, because there's a lot of, um, that that makes up the majority of what was shown that that could be prevented. But but as you know, uh, not everybody that applies for a license necessarily receives a license. But just given the amount of feedback I think that we've received on this this item over the last couple of weeks, I think it shows that the board, who's we've been doing an iterative process on this for the last seven years, so we still have uh, work to do. We we've had these top line interests. The board has been very consistent on preventing any sort of activity within residentially zoned districts and also minimizing any environmental impacts. We do that on, on uh, dispensing, we do that on manufacturing, we do that. Um, and that has been the goal in regarding uh, cultivation as well, which is why we did some of the movement from the hills, did some of the movement away from some of the RA zone parcels. And while we had this discussion in 2020 about setbacks and noticing in regards to CA, and we had a commitment to continue to review this, uh, the setbacks and the um, were not approved at that time. There was a there wasn't full board support at that time. But here we are, over a year later, and we actually have some information that shows that that there are some still some conflicts in regards to this activity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, residentially zoned districts. So, given the fact that this would still uh, maintain nearly all the activity within the second district, given the fact that there's still uh, over tenfold growth in potential licenses, even with what's being proposed, um, I consider this to still be a very reasonable approach moving forward. As you may remember, and the board may remember, we did a full environmental impact report, uh, and we looked at CAA, RA, SU, and TPZ zone parcels. And at the end of that, uh, the, the IR showed that there was significant unmitigatable impacts in traffic, water, noise, smell and other impacts, which is why we didn't certify the EIR because we wouldn't even, we wouldn't be able to have any kind of commercial activity at all. But that was looking at current commercial agricultural activity on those parcels and then the change and intensification of the use to this. So it shouldn't be uh, particularly surprising then that exactly what the EIR showed is exactly what these residential areas are dealing with. And so I think that um, this is just our opportunity to make this modification, but still continue to have most of it, or actually almost all of it in the uh, CA zone parcels and, and basically all of it still within my district, but just moving forward uh, to address those continued conflict points in the residential area. But I'm very interested in hearing uh, the continued community input on this. And, and I appreciated that the board uh, was willing to put this item on to hear more of this feedback. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And this uh, to adopt this urgency interim ordinance will take a four fifths vote of the board. Uh, Supervisor Caput, uh, do yeah. you have any comments? Yeah. Uh, th uh, thank you very much for the report. Uh, I, I just want to uh, state something here. Uh, every uh, every so often we hear that uh, cannabis uh, marijuana brings in a few million dollars every year to our general budget. And uh, we do appreciate that. But we have to remember that neighborhoods want to be their lives. 
uh, residential uh, homeowners uh, pay uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to uh, the budget. And uh, we, we have to understand that. Uh, uh, they, uh, the people that own the homes, the people that actually rent the housing and all that, uh, they live in neighborhoods and they shop locally. Uh, they pay the sales taxes, they pay the uh, gas taxes. Uh, they, they pay for pretty much everything. Their children go to our schools, uh, which we're you know, very uh, proud of. Uh, so I, when it comes down to protecting neighborhoods, and what na people that live in those neighborhoods want, uh, that, that's something that I really respect. I, I know who pays my paycheck, and uh, that's the residents that uh, live in this county. So uh, it's pretty clear what I'm uh, getting at here and how, how I'm looking at this uh, whole issue. Thank you. Yes, do you want to make any comments, Supervisor? Uh, just a couple of questions. So you mentioned the potential loss of revenue of two and a half million dollars. Is that from uh, not processing the current permits or is that if we move forward in November with completely excluding these zones? That's based on the current permits in the pipeline. Got it. So uh, that's pretty significant just with current permits. And obviously, if we're looking at potentially losing half of parcels uh, currently available for cultivations can have a much more significant impact. I assume you would bring back uh, that number for our November discussion. Is, yes. If, okay, thank you. And then um, the, the map is extremely helpful. Would love to spend more time with that. I don't know if you could make that uh, public or part of the um, item in November. Um, you know, the, does, there, I, in my mind, there is a significant difference between residential, re, residentially zoned parcels and residential agricultural. I mean, agriculture is part of their name. Um, and I'd be, it'd be really helpful if we could see, you know, what kind of difference you see if you didn't exclude RA parcels, um, you know, versus all the parcels. Do, was that possible with your current functionality or would you, had you grouped all the? Uh, we grouped all of the residential parcels together because the residents, even in residential art agriculture is, you know, the kind of the top line mm -hmm. um, of the, of the tiers of zoning. And so we included RA, we could look at RA, what we might, what I might suggest is that we look at RA that is five acres or more, since those are acres that right. already allow for cannabis activity. Mm -hmm. So we could single out um, those parcels that are less than five acres um, and look at it in that respect. Yeah, that would be helpful. Um, I'll then I'll just say, you know, clearly this is going to be a difficult balancing act as we move forward. That's all my comments for now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, do you have any comments at this point? No, I'll just wait for public after public comment. Mr. Cool. Chair, I do have one additional question, if I may. Um, I, I, I just wanted to ask staff why they included SU in their understanding. When we had done our original maps, we didn't include SU, which showed that there would be um, about another 100 or so available parcels for commercial cultivation. I wasn't sure why SU was included and therefore um, prohibiting within 500 feet. Would, sorry, SU was included because residences can be built on SU property. And so it would create the same um, conditions, right? If we, if the conditions are this tension between where there's homes and where there's commercial agriculture, because uh, SU parcels can have residences on them, we, uh, we, we took that into consideration as well, looking at the larger picture of that tension. I mean, okay, I think that that was a kind of a broad read of, of board direction because we were trying to prevent from those that already have resident in the name itself, residentially zoned districts, um, because my understanding is that would have allowed a little over 800, I believe, remaining parcels as opposed to the 679. Um, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but um, I appreciate that. I just, I just don't think that, I think that that was just an expanded reading of what the board's specific motion was, which was just to deal with those that, that were specifically residentially zoned. Mr. Chair, I do look forward to uh, the public comment on this. I'm um, sorry, would you like me to pull those out in the next iteration, Supervisor Friend, the SU parcels? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, I was I, I was surprised to see it today. So um, it just, I, I would I would like to just see it um, as well as what Supervisor Koenig's question is and or your point on the five acres or, or above an RA. Although realistically, when we look at the underlying general plan designation of an RA, it's, it's, it's residential and the type of commercial agriculture that's even allowed there is, is very limited compared to um, 
what is um, allowed on a CA uh, parcel. So I think it still is very residentially focused. But yes, on the SU, I, I just that surprised me to see that in there. Okay, uh, we're going to go to the public. How many people want to speak on this issue? Okay, we've got several. We're going to limit the comments to two minutes. Uh, we have each of the board members, I can uh, assure you, has received numerous uh, emails or uh, communications. Uh, if you could keep your comments as brief as possible and not be repetitive, uh, but uh, it might be difficult uh, to do that. But um, it will so just uh, stand in line and it's two minutes. Uh, let's start. Uh, good morning. My name is Kieran Ringenberg. I'm an attorney. I help people go through the state and local licensing process. Uh, my office is in Oakland, but I've done out all over the state, including here in Santa Cruz County since 2018. Um, I drove down from Oakland today to explain how um, pernicious this action would be to the 24 applicants who are currently in the queue. When this board acted in 2020 to make commercial agriculture principally permitted for uh, cannabis cultivation, People did exactly what you expected. They made massive investments based on that decision by this board. They bought and leased properties. They've invested millions in improvements, consultants, engineers, architects to move these projects forward. The board today considers pulling the rug out from under all of those people, throwing away all of that investment. We all know that if this moratorium goes into effect, it is very likely all of those programs, all of those projects are dead and all that money is flushed down the proverbial toilet. So I would encourage you to consider limiting your action to only new applications that have not yet been submitted. So all of those people who've invested millions of dollars on projects, this county invited, should not have the rug pulled out from under them. I would encourage the county to do so, not only because it's fair to those applicants, but also because it sets a tone for how the county is perceived in the business community writ large. If the county does this and <clears throat> veers guardrail to guardrail with these significant changes to its program, it tells future businesses that the county cannot be relied upon to have a stable hand on the rudder in deciding policy. These types of decisions should be made carefully over a long period of time, not on two weeks notice with very little input, because it's going to expect significant and inflict significant harm on lots of folks who are doing nothing other than what the county asked them to do. Thank you. Morning, supervisors. My name is Trent McNair. I'm a I'm a uh, CA uh, property owner, landlord, and businessman here in Santa Cruz County. Over the last ten years, we have had tenants legally cultivating cannabis on our property without a complaint, infraction, or a citation of any kind, and we are locked in on all sides by residential ag parcels. I prefer to call them all neighbors. We are here today because of concern regarding small, two small parcels, one in Browns Valley, the other in Crest Drive. Some neighbors have valid concerns, but I also hear a great deal of, deal of paranoia and misinformation. Gun seizures, raids, razor wire, light pollution, odor year round, children in danger, property values plummeting, all untrue or addressed in an ordinance already. These neighbors seem to conflate enforcement action against illegal actors with what is happening at licensed facilities. This is totally false and the record must be corrected by this body. Licensees must follow strict rules or they can be cited. If they don't, they can lose their license. It's that simple. I encourage everyone to read the ordinance. The moratorium is unwarranted. 500 foot setbacks and elimination of CA parcels adjacent to residential, it is a lazy decision. It's also not a minor change. Do this and you break the back of the industry in Santa Cruz County. The bad actors win. The good actors with existing licenses across the county would be wiped out, and most would be forced into bankruptcy or leave here permanently. If you force these licensed operators out, someone fills the vacuum. Then we just push to the schools and not adult use dispensaries. Now we're moving the wrong direction. Citizens of Santa Cruz County have a right to safe cannabis products grown right here by their neighbors, infusing much needed tax revenue into the general fund, not a black market. These proposals are the true threat to our public health, safety, and welfare, especially more vulnerable low-income communities. Ask this body to not second Zach Friend's motion for moratorium and reject it indefinitely. Thank you.
You know, about five years ago, cannabis was worth more per pound than gold. And that's going back 40 years ago. Before 1937, wild hemp was everywhere. But when wild hemp was eradicated by William Randolph Hearst and only $5 million, it forever changed the health of all mammals on this continent. Natural CBD oils were in the meat, in the cheese, the butter, and the milk. Um, yeah, it's amazing. The revenue, a couple million dollars. Property taxes, 2019, what was that? 571 million, as I recall. I could be wrong. During the Civil War, hemp was required to be grown. The average sailing ship needed 1.5 million feet of hemp rope. So while you guys are bickering over these little things about what my landlord told me in 2008, stoners come up with the best ideas in the world. They're just too stoned to do anything about it. Good morning. My name is Rod Composti, and I'm a landowner in Santa Cruz County, long-term resident. I own property on Firm Flat Road. I have watched the grow that I leased my land for purpose of having legal cannabis operations, spent hundreds of hours and tens of thousands of dollars over the last year and a half to meet the requirements of the county's rules and regulations. Now in the 11th hour, the county's attempting to implement the regulation that could potentially change the status of the permit as uh, worked so hard to obtain. Who is the new? Who does the new regulations apply to? Future applicants or existing applicants? Please define this. Licensing, licensing a property of cannabis case by case situation should be treated as such. I'm feeling. I, I feel applying the regulation to CA properties is is arbitrary and unfair. I am asking that that you consider the new rule instead of 500 feet from an RA property line, I'm asking for 500 feet property from an RA dwelling. This will make difference with a lot of growers that have a pending permits to give those neighbors that a, con a concern of great buffer. I, it should also be noted that in our neighborhood and the neighbors are RA parcels of pro cannabis and should be taken that into account. Please allow the growers to have applied that have a vested interest in complete our applications. In our area, there are one RA parcel to 20 parcels of zone CASU and that was zone. Okay, thank you. Um, Good morning. I'd like to speak today from the viewpoint of a farm owner. I've been in Aptos for two years now. We own the property. We built the farm and started a life here. Over the course of the last year, I've worked closely with the city, the county, and our attorney to ensure we follow every guideline set by the county to obtain our license. We are deep into the process here, going on 12 plus months, and have spent over $100,000 in countless hours of labor and building our farm to code as required by the county for approval. We are steps away from the finish line and to have this moratorium show up in the 11th hour and jeopardize my entire livelihood is not only frustrating, but devastating. Should this moratorium pass would not only cripple my business, but it would shut me down and completely bankrupt the company. I'm empathetic to the residents and their concerns. I've owned several legal farms in other counties and I've always been successful at maintaining a respectful and friendly relationship with our neighbors and city council. While serving on the local agricultural alliance board and planning committees, I have no doubt farm owners and nearby residents here in Aptos can have the same success as I currently have with the homeowners neighboring my farm. I do ask that the board consider rejecting this moratorium for one that fairly serves all parties. I would propose that instead of requiring a 500 feet from the property line, that you consider a 500 feet or greater restriction from any dwelling on a residential property as the configurations for each individual situation are not synonymous amongst all farms. Our particular growth site is well over 1,500 feet away from the nearest home. I would ask you to please consider this impact on myself and others in my position. We should not be forced to lose everything we have put in this county without putting real efforts towards a solution that works for all. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Nick Casillas. I'm a local business person. I live in Aptos, adjacent to, to a few CA parcels. So these residential agricultural conflicts are not new, new news to me. Um, my business uh, it also owns a few agricultural par parcels in uh, in South County. They're at least a licensed cannabis cultivators. 
Um, and this moratorium will impact my business negatively, as well as those of my tenants who I deeply care about at this point. They're in this, in this room. Um, this, I think the rule change is only as smart as the rationale behind it. It seems the rationale is based primarily in complaints from, from neighbors. And I think that there's a lot of misinformation in some of those complaints for the, uh, for the written documents on your own website. So I'd like to address a couple of them directly. Um, on the subject of crime, um, there have been a lot of references to gun seizures from licensed properties, licensed cannabis cultivate operations. The number of guns seized on licensed operations in this county is zero. Zero guns seized. Fire and the sheriff's department both uh, give feedback to the licensing process um, and the number of substantial fires that have broken out on these, the same, uh, the same group of licensed properties is zero. There's no risk so far from fire, at least, at least uh, to date. Um, on the subject of water, um, cannabis crops consume uh, approximately 50 to 60% of the water needs of other conventional crops in our community, uh, uh, the principally cane berries, um, uh, strawberries, and, and row crops. Substantially, so there's a substantial savings there. And finally, uh, on the subject of, uh, of uh, noise and smell, in our county, all commercial farming produces uh, noises and odors, which is precisely the reason why all residential neighbors bordering CA zone farmland in Santa Cruz County are required to sign a statement of acknowledgement accepting farming related inconveniences and discomforts from noise, dust, smell, and other impacts before purchasing or developing their properties. Uh, these, uh, these protections for farmers have been in place for in Santa Cruz for half a century and uh, should be continued. So I encourage you to support farms and farmers. Thank you for your time today. My name is Evan DeCias and I co-own the real estate business that my brother alluded to just momentarily uh, ago. I'd like to just read that statement of acknowledgement that he was referencing. It's, it's entitled the statement of acknowledgement regarding the issuance of a county building permit in an area determined by the County of Santa Cruz to be subject to agricultural residential use conflicts. It says, I, we do hereby acknowledge that a property described herein is adjacent to land utilized for commercial agricultural purposes and residents of this property may be subject to inconvenience or discomfort arising from the use of agricultural chemicals, including herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers, and from the pursuit of agricultural operations, including plowing, spraying, pruning, and harvesting, which occasionally generate dust, smoke, noise and odor. And I, we further acknowledge that Santa Cruz County has established agriculture as a priority use on productive agricultural lands and that residents of adjacent property should be prepared to accept such inconvenience or discomfort from normal necessary farm operations. Everybody who buys a piece of property in Santa Cruz County adjacent to a CA zone parcel acknowledges this in writing. It is bound to their deed. It's something that everybody knows about because we prioritize the use of our farming community as such. And I support you to, uh, to object to the, to the moratorium. Hello, my name is George Workman. I'm a young agricultural professional. I went to school for agronomy and my access as an entrepreneur into the in industry of agriculture is through cannabis. I've dedicated my life and my time in the last four years to get things compliant and to move a project down the road. We're at the finish line of the project and like so many others have stated before, the rug is about to be pulled. I'd like to point out one of the big um, points, elephants in the room, and that is that this, the root of this issue is gentrification. And, and the, the matter is that there's people coming from the tech industry over the hill. And if you're not a computer engineer, if you're not computer illiterate, then you're getting priced out and you're not having an access to work. What, what my company and a lot of the other companies in this room are looking to do is to provide a diversity workplace for several other individuals in this culture, not just en engineers that can type away for Google. We're looking to work with our hands in the dirt and operate with integrity and with, with the mind of the people around us. That's why we're trying to be legal operators. That's not why we're, otherwise we'd be in warehouses or we'd be underground still. We're here because we want to do it right. And we want to grant the opportunity that we've been given to others around us. So I hope you reconsider this really unfair, just moratorium. Thanks. Bye. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Aziz. Um, I'm a local cannabis business owner, and I really couldn't say it better than any of the people ahead of me. But I wanted to re remind you, Caffet, um, we are also renters. We are also property owners. Our kids also go to your schools, and we are members of this community too. Us, our employees, and our landlords, and everybody around us. So thank you. Please reconsider this. Uh, my name is Steve Fernandez. I'm a it's like we've kind of uh, I've adapted into cannabis by leasing some of our land out. It took me two years to get approved and a lot of money uh, and to have the rug pulled out from underneath us. And I also wanted to remind my supervisor Caput that I am also a member of the community. Uh, I live on my property. My wife teaches for the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Um, I went to the school district that went to Watsville High. Uh, we are all members of the community. We all contribute in a lot of different ways. Our tax dollars might not be as great as the tax dollar, the property tax dollars, but most of the cannabis people are spending millions and millions of dollars to acquire land that wasn't worth millions of dollars before cannabis was approved. And that's going to boost your property taxes and everything else in your community. We are very much a part of your community, community and want to be a part of the community moving forward. Good morning, council and staff. My name is Jacqueline McGowan and I'm a cannabis licensing expert. I have worked in the state uh, on cannabis policy for seven years. I'm also a former Wall Street stockbroker. Um, what is going on in the current industry at the moment is that uh, people are committing suicide at the rate of once a week in the licensed market. I want you to look around this crowd today at all these faces, because if you do make this decision to move forward with the, with the moratorium and you cause more economic desperation than they're already facing, then you may be responsible for someone not being here, okay? I'm also running for governor. I'm on this ticket today. And I did that for my cannabis industry. And I did that because one of your operators already did commit suicide and he was a friend of mine. This isn't a joke. Okay, please stop playing with people's lives. The, the, the pandemic has been hard enough. These guys need your help today. That's what I'm asking for, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Pat Malo, uh, lifetime resident, medical cannabis patient. I've worked in the what was formerly the medical cannabis industry for my entire adult life. It's the only way me and my generation were able to stay in this community. Um, I've almost a decade long process now of trying to transition the local good people who are in this industry for years and years into a new legal system. I poured thousands of hours, volunteer hours mostly into this building this system. Um, and, you know, as much as I am so happy for the survivors in this room and the, the problems that they've taken on forcing this system to work, and I'm eternally grateful. I also think about the 95% of people who started this process with you guys came into this room, came to meeting after meeting after meeting and haven't been able to get a license. And then I look at that map, the one of many, many painful maps I've had to look at about zoning through this process. And I see not only have we got pushed out of the traditional areas in the hills, like where we were neighbors, just like everyone, if we've gotten now pushed out of seemingly every single district, except for yours, Caput, which has always been a concern of yours. And we're not even allowed in rolling hills anymore. We're just down in flatland ag that has been, you know, used conventionally and then poisoned by methyl bromide and a long list of things that we're not allowed to use and might not function for the high testing that we have to get through and good to meet that environmental bar. So long story short is if you pass this, which unfortunately I think you will, let's please have a very, very real discussion about how we achieve what we set out to achieve and that's letting people in, not keeping them out. Good morning. My name is Heather Schaefer and I'm the CEO of Agoracy Business Services. We are a cannabis licensing and regulatory compliance company 
who represents Merced Investment Company in their journey to obtain a conditional use permit at the 110 Crest Drive property in Watsonville. I'm here today to ask that our application be allowed to proceed through the application process and not be included in the moratorium. In addition to making this comment today, we sent in more, a more detailed public comment last Friday, and it's my most sincere hope that our correspondence has been made available to the public as part of the agenda packet. We have had no intention of pushing this project through without communicating and, enter, and entertaining feedback from the neighbors and community. Although I was not in attendance at the August 24th meeting, I reviewed the video, and today I'd like to take some time to address a number of the concerns I heard voiced during that meeting. The largest concern I heard voiced was regarding odor. Please understand I've been to the property. I've witnessed. Additionally, it was not lost on me that these are multi-million dollar homes with ocean views. And there's a reason folks spend that kind of money to live in a location like this. They wanna smell the sea air. We have no intention of imposing on this lifestyle. And we've committed to bringing air quality specialist, a Ray Kapahi to conduct both air quality and odor control studies specific to the conditions of the greenhouses currently. We intend to implement the recommendations made by Mr. Kapahi and bring his group out to the property doing our, during our first run in order to ensure that odor control measures have been in place, that are in place are working as they should be. I have a number of different items and concerns that I addressed in my letter, and I hope that's made available to the general public, and I hope that you've all read it, and please consider not including us in the moratorium since our application has been submitted and we just want to proceed through the process. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Chris McGrone. I run an ag supply business, uh, multiple counties, and we supply farms uh, from San Diego County all the way through Humboldt. And uh, the reason I'm here today is that I've been, uh, been asked to, to join in the meeting and the conversation by a lot of my um, business associates and friends who have been through this long process with the county. And, you know, I don't know how much people understand that the, the amount of effort that goes into complying with all the rules and regulations of having licensed farm. But to go through and select a site, build it out, apply it to all the applications, the grading, the water use, uh, and all the full compliance for a cannabis licensed farm is extremely uh, time consuming. And to take the 24 licensees that have already been through this process and invested considerable sums of their own money and pull the rug out from under them would be devastating to those people. And I think that the county has a responsibility to follow through on the uh, on the uh, zoning rules that it's had in place that have brought those 24 licensees into position. And to, to change the rules midstream with those 24 licensees is just, it's, it's not going to be good for those people or for anybody else involved in this business. So I'd like to um, urge the county to vote in, uh, against um, putting a moratorium in place until the further studies and to allow the 24 to proceed through. Thank you. Morning, Chair, um, Supervisor, staff. My name is Dale Schaefer. I'm a cannabis specialist attorney, and I happen to represent Merced Investment Company in the 110 Crest Drive property. Um, I have a team of experts I work with, including odor specialists, light specialists, security specialists, acoustic specialists, and they work in conjunction with local um, planning commissions, uh, local policymakers, law enforcement, as we try to meet the needs of the counties or the cities and deal with the complaints of neighbors. We are prepared to make our facility as odor free as we can make it, which will be below the thresholds we deal with around the state. I have projects all over the state. My expert, Ray Kapahi, presented to the Board of Supervisors at El Dorado County what a similar situation, complaints about odors. And so he did on-site as-built analysis, and he designs carbon scrubbers and other mitigation measures so that around these greenhouses, there will be odor below the seven dilution thresholds that we deal with in the environmental industry and that the property lines, they will be much below that. These are public nuisance issues that are dealt with through planning as you go through the conditional use permit. 
We're prepared to deal with that. Our security guy designs our lights. They are pointed downwards. The regulations require that any greenhouse that emits light from dust to dawn be covered. So that complaint from the neighbors, they're gonna see light everywhere. It's not gonna be allowed. We won't have a license and we will mitigate light through our illumination studies. Now, we are involved in a struggle with what we call the black market. And you talk about loss of revenues here. Law enforcement understands only too well. You are bleeding money trying to stop the black market. And the way to do this is through the marketplace and allow these businesses to go forward so you can stop the black market. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Manny Alvarez. I'm a business owner here in Santa Cruz County. Thank you for this opportunity. I ask that you vote a no, a big no, on the cannabis moratorium. I understand the concerns of some of the inconveniences that a handful of residents are complaining about, but a moratorium that will decimate a large percentage of an already fragile industry is not the solution. I believe cases are unique and should be uh, should not all be treated the same. 500 foot setback will not really solve the problem, but would only create other problems. Some of these complaints are a bit dramatic with no real concerns to human health and shouldn't be categorized as such. Smell, really? If you chose to live around farmland, you chose to be around all kinds of smells. The cannabis community has already been pushed into one part of the county where all the CA zone parcels exist, when growing has been a part of the whole county for decades. And now we're facing another migration, only this one would be out of the county. Cannabis operators have taken the scraps left from the apple industry and turned them into viable farmland again. Hence, property values go up. Although the current recommendations claim to be for new businesses, I believe that this is a calculated move for the obvious agenda of the future to remove cannabis businesses out of the county for good. I ask that farmland be left to farmers. Vote no. Hi, I'm Dave. Um, I just wanted to say, like, yeah, we live here too. I've seen you at the coffee shop. Um, we're growing plants just like anybody else. It's not any difference except for it smells different and it seems like that's a big deal. But this is this is gonna be an agricultural crop. Like no matter what we do here, it's just where it's gonna be grown and what kind of revenue it's gonna bring into the county. And if we're talking about like jobs and having the next step, this is this is this is it. Like this is gonna beat out berries. And you know, if we we don't I think we're gonna be altering. So that's all I'm gonna say. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Terry, and I operate a regenerative cannabis farm in Watsonville. I'm here in the opposition to the blanket moratorium. I've read the comments from the community and believe we have an opportunity to make this right for everyone. Cannabis has been referred to as industrial farming. The definition of industrial farming is a form of modern farming that refers to the industrialized production of crops and animal products like milk or eggs. The methods of industrial agriculture include innovation in agricultural machinery and farming methods, genetic technology, techniques for achieving economies of scale and production, the creation of new markets for consumption, and the application of patent protection to genetic information and global trade. These methods are widespread in developed nations and increasingly prevalent worldwide. This is what makes Santa Cruz so special. Greenhouses and hoop houses have existed here for years. Compared to other farming practices, cannabis farming is the least harmful due to the fact that legal cannabis farms are not allowed to use harmful pesticides. La Selva, Browns Valley Road, most places in Santa Cruz are sprinkled with farmland. Where is cannabis supposed to go? The solution here is to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis and not as an overall problem. Please do not allow a blanket moratorium because it will negatively affect those who have started the painful and very expensive process of licensing. Could financially ruin some good folks. If a farm operates with zero complaints, it should be left alone to continue its ability to receive its license. Give setbacks where needed, but not in every single situation should be a case-by-case -case basis and not a blanket moratorium. That is not the answer. Many folks trying to get licensed are not the problem and have zero complaints. You have the opportunity to make this right for everyone. Please do not allow this moratorium. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience want to speak? Got something to say. 
Darren Story, born and raised in South County. I'd like to frame this conversation for what it's really about. It's not tax revenue or the ability to get along with your neighbors. This is about class warfare. We know the average acre of cannabis grown in California injects over $700,000 into the local community. In South County, the majority of cannabis workers are Latin American, so this economic value is injected into that very same impoverished community. Our cannabis businesses sell goods in other jurisdictions to effectively repatriate that revenue, bringing it back to our community, spreading that wealth with all the other businesses. Those businesses are then able to hire more workers, which perpetuates this economic value cycle. Also well known that cannabis has a much lower environmental impact than other crops. We use less water, less fossil fuels, and zero pesticides or fungicides. Some of you may not be aware that our little county is at the forefront of the nation's compassionate caregiving. Our cannabis community accounts for over 50% of the state's SB 34 donations for patients who cannot afford to pay for it on their own. An affirmative vote today on the moratorium is not in support of neighbors who need to get their voices heard or didn't have an opportunity to speak up over the last four years. Instead, your affirmative vote today will be a direct attack on the county's impoverished farm worker community and the state's poor people who depend on medical cannabis. I know some of you had the intention on coming here today and voting in favor of Zach's moratorium so you can help them save face and quiet some of the vociferous privileged people anxious to protect their retirement nest egg. But I strongly encourage you to stand up and let them know you are not against protecting their depreciating property values, but rather you are in favor of injecting economic vitality into your impoverished communities. A rising tide lifts all ships and we appreciate your need to endure sacrifice so that we can continue building our community to give others a chance for economic, economic Economic freedom and relief from their ills. I encourage you to vote no on this moratorium and show people that our county places those in need over regressive, racist, and hateful agendas. Yeah. Nelson, uh, the audience want to speak? It hasn't spoken. Hi. If anybody else wants to speak, please just get behind this gentleman. Please. My name is Christopher John Daly, and I've been cultivating cannabis in Santa Cruz County since 1975. And uh, I just want to quote Patrick Henry, one of our founding fathers, give me liberty or give me death. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience want to address the board? Do we have anybody on the phone? Uh, how many? 13 speakers. 13 on the phone? Yes. Okay. Ben Warren, your microphone is available. Hello, thanks for, for uh, listening. Uh, I've, I didn't realize how many people would speak before we got to, the, to some of the neighborhoods, so I'm going to change what I was going to say. Um, shorten it a great deal. One of the things that um, I'm in the La Selva Beach area, I would like to see this moratorium extended for some for, for their study. Uh, I understand some of the arguments of the people with money in this, but we all have money in it too. We have our homes and, and I think that's been covered. But I would like to bring up two things. One is that I did not appreciate the letters from Coralitas. I had no idea what was going on over there. I don't know how I would have, but when I saw them published, I recognized that there's a use case study for how this is going to affect us and many other people in the county in the real, in quote rural ag neighborhoods. So I think if nothing else, we ought to take time enough to hear Coralitas people come in and you guys all go to Coralitas because in my, my earlier presentation, I, was, I put in, given the Coralitas letters, then our problem is the tip of your iceberg. This is not going to change if we keep doing it the way it was done in Coralitas. <clears throat> Unless we believe all the people in Coralitas are liars and aren't telling the truth, I think we ought, you ought to at least consider that. Um, finally. If I can get to it quickly, if you take a look at the Google Maps and, and look at the satellite, there's satellite view and go over to Round Tree, the Round Tree Medium Facility Prison. It looks a lot like in space and size and security and cameras and, and, and uh, fences that this thing they're going to put in on our, on our 30 acres across from us. So we don't want a prison, and that's what this looks like, even though it claims to be this is just another crop. We don't think it's another crop. We think it's a lot more like this prison. So I'd like to thank Coralitas and encourage you to use that as a, as a use case if you extend this moratorium. Thank you. Laura Shepard, your microphone is available.
is star six to unmute yourself. Last call for Laura Shepard. Hi there. Hi, yeah. So thank you for um, letting me speak today. Third generation Santa Cruzian here. My family built their home um, next to this parcel that's been sp uh, spoken about in La Selva 33 years ago today. We're not big money. We bought the, the place a long time ago. Um, so I urge you to vote for the moratorium while you consider the ordinance chains. I'm not opposed to cannabis or the agriculture in the right setting, but have a number of serious concerns about cannabis being grown so close to residential areas and near our children. It is a known fact that despite legalization of cannabis in California, the black market activity is still a major issue, even among many of the larger communities in the space, many of which are sitting down today with politicians helping to build new laws to impact the cannabis industry and how it's regulated. With this black market activity occurring in the industry, it opens up a scary door to criminal activities such as theft, money laundering, and violent crimes. My largest concerns around allowing cannabis to be grown in this area are the following. Proximity to family and, uh, and children, neighborhood character detriments like odor, increased need for high security uh, firearms used in security property and roaming personnel. Um, not to mention things like the odor. Licensing of cannabis throughout um, proper offer sets um, are intrusive to our residential communities. The safety of our families and children needs to be number one. Second to that, cannabis agriculture to, to any area should not have a negative environmental and residential impact. Things like the endangered salamander, long, uh, the long-toed endangered salamander come to mind. Uh, they should not be permitted near homes and schools where foul smells of cannabis and chemicals like pine salt are being put into the air to disguise cannabis and causing health issues for people like myself. The impact of cannabis agriculture and residential ag communities negatively impact environment, home values, and safety of our families and children. Um, I really encourage you to take a, a step back and and understand that we all are a part of this community and what I do should not negatively impact you and vice versa. Um, I feel that that there is um, additional time that needs to be uh, assessed to evaluate this fairly. Caller 0330, your phone is available. Caller 0330, your microphone is available. You'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, this is Susan Williams. I'm hoping that you will not be influenced by a group of paid lobbyists and lawyers. They do not live here, they don't vote here, they're not a part of our community, and they'll be gone soon. They talk about all the ways they'll mitigate the effects of a large cannabis operation in our neighborhood. But once it's established, they'll be gone, and there will be no way for us to enforce what they have promised us. We're fortunate to live in Santa Cruz County. We have much open land and other parcels that would be very appropriate to grow cannabis. It's not that we're against the cannabis industry or that we feel that it should not be grown in our county. Um, our neighborhood houses a preschool and it also borders a very popular state park where many families enjoy their time. We just feel it's not an appropriate location for a large cannabis operation. So please don't be influenced by these lobbyists and support the moratorium on non-retail cannabis within a 500 foot setback. So you have more time to consider this situation. And thank you again for your consideration and please do support this moratorium for further study. Thank you. Caller 9876, your microphone is available. Nine eight seven six. Hi, Sarah Bybin with Watsonville, California. First, I want to thank you for your vote in the last meeting to consider minor changes to the non-retail cannabis ordinance and to provide similar protections to our rural neighborhoods as our urban counterparts enjoy. Secondly, there's been some communications that contain inaccuracies or maybe omissions that I'd like to take a moment to clarify. Residential rural lots have been described as large and maybe not needing the same level of protection as the urban 
community. And while this may be the case for some, and I really wish it was the case for my property, in our neighborhood there are lots and lots consistent in size with those found in cities and definitely less than five acres, definitely less than one acre. A moratorium exception request has been made, but in this request they failed to disclose that there's a preschool on the project boundary, a state park within 500 feet, an ecological reserve, campground, and high school all nearby. These sensitive receptors make this project unlikely and undeserving of an exception. The applicant also described the project's existing greenhouses as ready to operate. They were built decades ago, and quite frankly, they're falling down. To make airtight buildings, new greenhouses will have to be constructed on the footprint of the old. And this is probably the foggiest place in the whole county. They will need to upgrade the entire electrical system for 24-7 lighting, heating, dehumidifiers. This is not farming as we know it. Our neighborhood will have 22 buzzing cannabis factories at our doorsteps. And because of the area's geography, the project sits at the bottom of a bowl with hundreds of neighbors looking down and hearing the nonstop noise. I wanna leave you with one final thought before you make your vote. Would you or your loved ones wanna live next door to a cannabis grow factory without proper setbacks? I urge you to vote for the moratorium so that you can continue the process of examining what is fair for both rural neighborhoods and growers. Thank you. Um, Moran, your microphone is available. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Supervisors. My name is Tom Moran. I live in Coralitas, and I'm here to comment why I'm in full support of this temporary moratorium. This action is an important step in addressing the concerns of homeowners who live in residential areas in the county that are interspersed with CA zone properties that can now be used to grow or process cannabis. My wife and I moved to the Browns Valley Scenic Corridor back in 2012 because it's such a wonderful setting here. But with cannabis operations coming into this residential area, we are now suffering the pungent odors and other bad impacts. Frankly, it reeks. To be clear, I have no issue with cannabis related operations in general. My concern is the impacts when they operate near residences. I believe a compromise can be reached that balances the rights of cannabis growers with the negative impacts on homeowners. The recommended actions by the CIO office in its memo to the board in today's materials addresses our specific concerns very well. One argument made by opponents of this moratorium is that it would be inconsistent with the prior county policy favoring commercial agriculture and a long established recognition that commercial farming should be preserved. Well, the CAO's memo today addresses this when it states, and I'm paraphrasing, that conflicts between residential and agricultural uses are not new, but that commercial cannabis operations are a recent development in the ag sector that brings with them a host of new complaints. The memo goes on to state that these need to be evaluated. Even a major agricultural bureau in its letter to the supervisors yesterday recognized that cannabis licensing changes may be necessary. The action today proposed enacts a pause so that the county can consider and study proposed code amendments. And that's why it makes so much sense to adopt it. Thank you for your consideration. Michael, your microphone is available. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Michael Balch. My wife and I are long-term residents of the Crest Road neighborhood. I want to thank the board for their balanced view thus far in agreeing to revisit the current cannabis ordinance in relation to large cannabis farming operations in family neighborhoods such as ours. I ask, I, I plead the board to extend the moratorium without exemptions in order to get this right for the citizens of Santa Cruz and balance their interests with those of the cannabis industry. Now, the cannabis industry has attempted to portray large cannabis farming operations as just any other agricultural activity. The board members were in receipt of a rather disingenuous letter from the Santa Cruz Farm Bureau parroting the cannabis lobby's viewpoint. And it's simply not true, neither in reality or how cannabis farming is treated under the law. No other legal farming crop on the center, central coast has to conform with ordinance restrictions on odor control, lighting, and rigid security, there are no eight foot barrier fences and security around strawberry fields here. There's not the 24 hour hum of odor mitigation systems in other fields. And for those and many other reasons to state that large grow operations are just another agricultural activity is a false narrative. It is self-evident, it is not like other agriculture. 
There is no cannabis emergency that warrants removal of the current moratorium on new permits until such time that the board has had the opportunity to review the modifications of the cannabis ordinance and do the right thing for the families and neighborhoods such as ours. Don't make the same mistakes made in Carpinteria in Southern South California, where large cannabis farming was allowed in close proximity to residential neighborhoods, schools, and parks, all of which exist in our neighborhood, and resulted in 800 complaint, complaints, re, repeated ordinance violations by the growers, and at least five lawsuits. Mr. Forty's office will not be able to adequately monitor compliance, and the industry is not going to police itself. Citizens are aching for politicians to do the right thing for the families and that have invested greatly in their home stands. And, and here's the board's opportunity. Please extend the moratorium on new permitting and amend the cultivates, cannabis cultivation ordinance to protect us. Kirk Schmidt, your microphone is available. Hello, uh, this is Kirk Schmidt. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the Santa Cruz County Farm Bureau. Uh, thank you, Chair McPherson and supervisors for giving me this opportunity to address you. We've already submitted written correspondence outlining our opposition to the proposed moratorium. And I will only address one issue um, during today's meeting, and that concerns the uh, scope of the temporary zoning that will be enacted by the moratorium. Um, many of the parcels in CA land are large parcels, and many of the uh, adjacent parcels uh, that are residential parcels are also large parcels. When development permits are required for agricultural land, the proposed development, uh, for example, a structure, is measured from the location of a residence on the nearest residential property, not from the property line. The proposal before you measures from the property line and indeed is much more encumbering on distant agricultural properties because a CA parcel is more than 500 yards away from the residential parcel may be subject to the prohibition proposed by this moratorium, not only within the 500 feet, but for the entire parcel, which may be several, several hundred acres. Uh, furthermore, there needs to be clarification about whether the intent of your ordinance is for R A, R1, and R R, or should also include SU, which was surprising to me that the staff thought that SU was included in a residential use in this circumstance. It would be better if the 500 foot measurement was from a residence and it would include land within the 500 feet, not the entire parcel touched by this 500 foot line. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. Rose Mary McNair, your microphone is available. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello everyone and thank you very much supervisors for allowing me to speak. I am a real estate broker. I have been in this community for, I don't know, 45 to 50 years and I have to say that I think the supervisors need to step back and consider this. If you vote for this moratorium, what you are actually doing is saying that something that is illegal is not a good idea. Let us instead not be legal. Consider this, legal versus illegal. Suppose we had cars and we didn't have any rules we could we wouldn't have to stop stop signs we could just keep on going and doing whatever we want legal versus illegal when you're talking about cannabis grows illegal uses pesticides the illegals do whatever they want because they don't have rules or regulations what happens to the cartel issues and the the, the policing that has to happen for illegality if you vote for this moratorium, you are basically saying what we think is it's okay to be illegal. What about odors? My goodness, has anyone driven by a cabbage patch or a broccoli patch that is being tilled in? We know there's odors. We also signed agricultural disclosures on every piece of property that we ever sell in the county of Santa Cruz. Please consider the fact that cannabis does not have an allowance for any pesticides illegals do. So legal or illegal, consider that and make your choice. Thank you. Uh, 
Ellery Lavroni Corral. Uh, thank you, Honorable Supervisors. I'm Valerie Corral. I'm the Executive Director of WAM Phytotherapies, and I have been cultivating cannabis for compassionate access for 29 years in Santa Cruz County, and I am a resident of the county for 50 years and a fourth-generation Californian. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity to address this urgency interim ordinance to freeze the issuance of new cannabis this business licenses. Um, I've appeared before this board countless times regarding cannabis regulations, and I've heard and I sympathize with many of the differing viewpoints. It's what makes our community and our nation great that we can speak aloud and hopefully find a way to merge our viewpoints. Cannabis is the most heavily regulated and highly taxed business in our community and perhaps the nation. Um, I question the necessity to exact an urgent measure to create a moratorium on new cannabis applications. And at the same time, I respect the wishes of neighbors and I honor their concerns. Yet apprehensions can be addressed on an individual basis as cannabis applications are submitted. This should include careful consideration and review of all interests, including transparency regarding any and all investor monies, including the origin and the flow of any funding. And as a matter of fact, I hope that you will drive a more comprehensive overview of investor monies, scrutinizing the origin of capital investment, because soon we will be facing a greater demon, Jeff Bezos, and the Amazon empire. Your focus may be in the wrong place. In, in fact, the land in South County that WAM Phytotherapies currently occupies has, was a desolate, commercially grown, bankrupt rose farmland. And it, it was that was a result of NAFTA. My hope is that over time, our opportunities will unify uh, us rather than uh, digress. Remember that the extent of cannabis regulation is uniquely, uh, is highly regulated and uniquely high taxation. Greg Fernandez, your microphone is available. Greg Fernandez. Last call for Greg Fernandez. Okay, here we go. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Greg Fernandez. Um, we have a licensed property uh, recently obtained uh, up there on Hughes Road. Uh, we're going to build out 600,000 square feet. We've spent uh, millions of dollars to get to this point and intend to spend uh, millions uh, more. Uh, this moratorium would not impact our property now because we're, we already have it. I'm just concerned about future regulations, this 500-foot rule um, that would decimate that farm. and. Um, decimate the 300 jobs that we plan to uh, plan to um, have. Uh, right now, uh, we just started putting plants in the ground, and we intend to have up to 300 employees. Uh, we're also looking at a neighboring farm of about 400,000 square feet that this moratorium would impact severely. Um, in fact, we would probably cancel escrow. Um, and what does this do? I mean, we took a uh, fledgling Rose Farm uh, and, you know, purchased it for a quite a significant sum of money. You're just the tax revenue just on the real real property difference uh, is uh, probably about $500,000 a year uh, when it's all said and done. Um, additionally, the tax revenue generated from the marijuana tax, uh, the county tax, it will be significant if we have a million square feet in total can, uh, canopy. You we're talking 6% of roughly, you know, $300 million. That's $18 million just from two farms. Um, and I strongly suggest that you uh, do not pass this moratorium. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Caller 2912, your phone is available. Star six to unmute. Um, <clears throat> hello, my name is Robert Kitayama. I'm the president of Kitayama Brothers. Uh, we are large uh, cut flower and landowners in South County. Um, we've been farming here for 
over 55 years. Uh, we also own a 30-acre parcel on Crest Drive that we are currently in negotiations for selling. It's 30 acres. There's 25 acres of field and five acres of greenhouse. Um, so we're in the process of selling this to um, a party who will probably use it for cannabis, but on this 30-acre parcel, only five acres of greenhouse would be eligible for cannabis, which is 15% of this property. Um, if this ordinance is passed, it will probably jeopardize this deal, and it would erode the values uh, for this property that we've owned for over 30 years by probably 25 to 50 percent, which is very injurious to a company like ours. We are earmarking the proceeds um, from this sale to upgrade our greenhouses and our facilities, which are over 50 years old. And if we want to continue to be sustainable and profitable and efficient um, business people in South County growing cut flowers, uh, we need this investment. And so as farmers, we we want to support other farming. We believe that cannabis can, legal cannabis can be done correctly. And so we would ask all of the supervisors to please oppose this moratorium and the proposed um, setback rules that have been proposed. Thank you very much. Matthew Groves, your microphone is available. Matthew Groves. Hi, sorry, I was muted. Um, hi, my name is Matt Groves. Uh, I'm a cannabis business owner in Watsonville. I'm urging um, the supporters to, uh, the supervisors to reject the moratorium as well to propose zoning changes. Uh, there are numerous viable parcels that will be unfairly disqualified. For example, one of our farms uh, the cultivation site is over 3,000 feet away from the nearest dwelling on a residentially zoned parcel. Um, yet, this farm would be disqualified based on the property line requirements. Um, also, many of the remaining sites are located in the coastal zone as well as the south uh, eastern portion of the county that is just rampant with pesticide spray. And the coastal zone is unsuited for cultivation due to the climate and is known as a fog belt. So while it seems there are a lot of remaining sites, uh, in actuality, many of these are not viable and are already being taken for vegetable cultivation. Uh, lastly, we've been through the process on several farms and it's been an extremely uh, time intensive and costly process. And uh, I feel for those who are in the last stages of their own process, and the county may potentially pull the rug out from underneath them the last minute, um, you know, throwing away all their time and money. Um, my heart really goes out for them. It's deeply unfair for the county to make, you know, put forth a regulatory landscape and then change it at the last minute after many, many people have um, spent a lot of time and investment. Um, so I urge everybody to uh, reject the moratorium and the proposed changes. Thank you. Jonathan Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Dear civic leaders, it's with great respect that I'm speaking today. We've been an active participant in the conversation about legal cannabis since 2008 and is one of the few remaining operators that survived the transition to regulated cannabis and has been actively paying taxes since the inception of can taxation on cannabis. We've got great concern with the recent proposed emergency moratorium. Over 95% of the cannabis businesses that operated under medical law have gone out of business in the transition to regulation. The government collects roughly 50% of the cannabis 
consumer dollar, and the fiscal impacts of your decision will be felt by many hardworking constituents, including heads of households that are responsible for the well-being of others. If you move forward with this backwards approach, many hardworking people will lose their livelihoods. Our farm alone supports around 50 households during peak season. COVID has been very hard on everyone. Suicide rates are at an all-time high. Let's not bring harm to the innocent, hardworking community members that support our local economy. The repeated concern about smell cannot be truly addressed because even if you ban cannabis, you can't ban hemp. It can be grown on any commercial ag property in the United States, fence line to fence line, and federal laws now protect hemp farmers who grow a plant that smells the exact same as cannabis. There's nothing that can be done to prohibit hemp from being grown. Bringing harm to our legal cannabis operators is not the solution. The status of our local cannabis industry is fragile. Society is dealing with record-breaking unemployment and mental health issues, homelessness, suicide, and crime rates are at all-time high. Please don't be the cause of more suffering. The voters of Santa Cruz overwhelmingly overturned the last moratorium via voter initiative, wasting tremendous resources that could have otherwise gone towards betterment of the community. Please don't make this mistake again. The bottom line is that there is not an emergency and the legal cannabis economy is created. The collective effort to create balanced cannabis policy is staggering when you think about all the time we've spent on this issue, only to ban it all. Please do not move forward with this hasty decision. Hey, that uh, continues. We have, um, we have five more speakers. We have five more, okay. Hello, my name is uh, Chris Kodiga. Uh, I'm part of the uh, Coralitas Coalition for Balanced Land Use. Uh, our family has owned and managed the uh, property for over 50 years on Browns Valley Road that includes a 10 acre organic apple orchard. We support the urgency interim ordinance to freeze issuance of new cannabis business licenses. The Coralitas Coalition for Balanced Land Use uh, has been working diligently to find a reasonable solution to the intensification and concentration of cannabis in our small, beautiful rural community since 2019. In 2019 is when the second district was opened up to cannabis cultivation and public notification was no longer required. You have heard all the real, very real complaints that have negatively impacted the residents' quality of life Many times, the constant pungent smell of cannabis, public safety, security current concerns, et cetera. The environmental impact report from 2016 listed many unmitigated problems, which include traffic, noise, water, and smell that have turned out to be very true. The impacts from the 2016 ordinance and the 2019 changes are showing up now. It's time for the county leaders to take a pause and enact fair and reasonable solutions for all interested parties. The main goals when cannabis cultivation was allowed in Santa Cruz County was to minimize environmental damage, to have no residential conflict, and, in, and ensure a supply of medical cannabis. A moratorium and an updating of the current ordinance, which includes minor changes, is consistent with the goal of residential protection. Thank you very much for supporting uh, the moratorium. Trevor Luxon, your microphone is available. Hi there, um, my name is Trevor Luxon, uh, lifelong Santa Cruz County resident and also local attorney. Um, you know, I've been involved and watched this cannabis you know, process go on since it began you know, several years ago. This is an industry that people felt early on could be a, a real economic driver for this community and provide a lot of jobs, a lot of tax revenue. Um, instead, it's been, you know, absolutely strangled by overregulation, overtaxation, and the majority of the businesses are either gone or the remaining ones are struggling to survive. Um, as uh, Ms. Serino pointed out in her excellent present presentation, um, this moratorium would result in a pretty significant loss of tax revenue to the county. Um, there's also, there's really no reason why this needs to be treated as an emergency ordinance um, or emergency moratorium. You know, this could be handled in November as, you know, as is already planned. There's no reason why it needs to happen, you know, within two weeks the way that, that it has. 
Um, also, I think the existing applicants who have already submitted applications that are currently pending should be allowed to continue with their application process. They've spent a lot of money, time, effort to get to the point where they're at now. And essentially, they're going to be, you know, pull, have the rug pulled right out from under them. Um, and I also would like to note that, as Mr. Grove said, this is going to result in a loss of a lot more parcels than, um, than just the, the 789 that are remaining. Of those remaining parcels, many of them are either in inappropriate areas or adjacent to major roads and couldn't be used for cannabis cultivation. Thank you. Angela Doria, to your microphone's available. Hello. Um, I would just like to say that I am a local cannabis business owner, a wife, a mother, and um, a supporter of the community at large. Uh, I want to um, suggest the um, projection of this memorandum and to just sort of talk about like um, how cannabis is feared a little bit and it scares me to talk to the people who are opposed to the location of it. But I think maybe that's what she has been brought to us um, to sort of do is like bring it out and have us all talk about it. So maybe, and instead of accepting a memorandum that is out of fear, we can just patient and realize that this is an evolving industry and that with that, it's just going to come with communication and actually talking because it seems like this is just a communication breakdown on some level. And then on other levels, it can be, um, it can go into a huge broad spectrum that affects a lot of um, people in an industry that is wanting to um, heal the planet of which we have seen in soil tests as well as tests of the flower itself. Um, if you want to be in a community, how wonderful it is to know that you are in a community pesticide free because you are actually part of a company that is getting those results that can say that to people. So I hope that with this, um, the families and the areas that are so scared, don't be scared. Um, this is just an issue to talk about and your kids will need to talk about it and how beautiful that you get to talk about it in your backyard. And I think that it can evolve into something that's better where they can see the remediation of the earth and the forest out there and everything will get better. Thank you. Connie Ginsburg. Connie Ginsburg, your microphone is available. Thank you. Um, my name is Shawnee Ginsburg. I, I live um, in the neighborhood adjacent to the farm at 110 Crest Drive, and I'm calling um, to speak in support of the moratorium. I think it's clear from the extensive comments that this is something that requires further study and that's what the moratorium would allow for. Uh, I appreciate <clears throat> the supervisor's time. I um, appreciate you reading our letters. Uh, we are a neighborhood of people who have lived here for decades. Some of us built our houses with our own hands. You have heard from us in letters, there aren't more of us on these calls because we are working. And that's what we do. We earn, we, we work, we earn a living, and we participate in our community. <clears throat> Excuse me. We really appreciate um, you, your thoughtfulness in taking more time to study this issue more thoroughly. Thank, thank you so much for listening. This is the last speaker, Tara. Caller 4497. Your microphone is available. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my family has lived, worked, and operated farms and other businesses across Santa Cruz County for over 30 years. We're also raising our children here. We recognize that the commercial cannabis industry provides an economic benefit to the county and that the end product is lawful and desirable by many of us. However, we would urge this board to carefully consider and balance the significant and unique impacts the commercial cultivation industry has on our families our neighborhoods and our sensitive environments. For example, no other farming industry in the county has resulted in regular law enforcement seizures of guns from the farms, as has happened with cannabis farms. 
By the county's own reports, there were dozens of illegal guns seized by the sheriff pursuant to search warrants at cannabis operations around Santa Cruz County. Quite simply, cannabis is not a typical crop. This fact alone suggests that the board should go slowly and consider the precise details of the proposed ordinance amendments and the scope of the future uh, commercial cannabis operations near our families. In addition, no other industry we are aware of in this county has ever generated such diverse, ongoing, and consistent public comment and concern about the noxious odors, illegal activity, and the general disruption to the quality of life for all of those affected. In closing, there is a delicate balance that this board should strive to achieve between reasonably supporting the commercial cannabis industry while simultaneously ensuring that our families and cherished natural environments are protected. This effort demands a slow and methodical approach, and I would urge this board to adopt the temporary moratorium on new licenses as you thoroughly research and undertake this critical analysis. Thank you. We will turn the um, issue to the board. I'll call on Supervisor Friend who brought this to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to everyone who spoke, both from the cannabis industry and from the community. You know, I'll say that other than perhaps actually the CZU item that's in this afternoon, I, I don't think we've ever received so many uh, letters and calls and participation from rural residents as we have on, on this one, on this specific issue, in particular, just for today's item, even previously when we've done some of these, um, uh, some of these iterations. And um, we started this quite some time ago when I was first on the board. Uh, many of you will remember there was actually a moratorium preventing all commercial cultivation pending a state Supreme Court decision. About seven years ago, we started this process, actually determined that the cultivation side was too difficult to really balance at the time. So we just went down the dispensing road, eventually picked up the cultivation side. Um, I'm sure Supervisor uh, Koenig is thankful he wasn't on the board uh, since today is an indication of what we dealt with for quite some time. But you know, this, this is a very fluid process, right? I mean, it, the, the board has made multiple, multiple, multiple modifications to the cultivation ordinance. It was always intended and has always been stated and committed to the public that it would be iterative and it would be modified. Uh, the idea that the board uh, has created a set of regulations and is modifying it has actually been the con the one thing that has been constant associated with all of the cannabis related ordinances, be it on dispensing, manufacturing, or cultivation. So realistically, um, there were ordinance changes that uh, both had prohibited or allowed the activity that we currently have. In fact, we had a, as you may remember, an entire. Uh, ban on the second district for outdoor growing. Uh, we had a lot of conflicts in the hills on environmental issues and residential conflicts. And the board had decided to move this down into the CA zoned areas, which are disproportionately uh, in my district and Supervisor Caput's district. That was an item that um, I had supported with additional requests that we consider these setbacks that we have in, in other elements of the ordinance, as well as a notification element. That happened in mid-2020. It takes a while, as many of the, the cultivators noted, to get through the process. So the first ability for there to really be any sort of issues that were raised with neighborhoods is really within this last uh, six to eight months. And that's exactly what's come up. This is much broader than just a few neighborhoods. I mean, over the course of this process, we've heard from not just a lot of people in Coralitos. In fact, I've in the nine years I've been on the board, I've never seen an issue that has united and received so much input from Coralitos than this. But also in La Selva, Hazel Dell, which I share with Supervisor Cap at 129 area, which is actually within his district as well. The Day Valley and, and Larkin Valley and Pleasant Valley area have all uh, expressed concerns over the course of this process. And I want to address something that Valerie Corral said. She's somebody I admire uh, very greatly within this, this industry because of her dedication to those that uh, compassionate use. She brought up about uh, the idea of allowing for community input. Well, since we moved it to a principally permitted use, there isn't an ability for any community input. No mitigations can actually be proposed. And so some of the speakers were saying there needs to be a dialogue. That dialogue was actually removed by this board for their ability to actually have any mitigations proposed from community members. Uh, by the time this is actually in place, is uh, by the it, actually there's just no there's no ability to provide any sort of mitigations or input. So what this is doing is actually 
removing those conflicts and, and creating a noticing component moving forward in the actual ordinance that actually allows there to be the same input that actually it sounds like some cultivators think that there should be. But a lot of this talk was on balancing competing interests, and I, I totally agree. If this was, um, I think that what we should be able to agree is that given this level of dialogue, it's not in balance right now. And it had, and we've been, it has been a very iterative process throughout uh, the last seven years we've been working on it. We've been trying to find an equilibrium. We're getting a lot closer. I do think that commercial agriculturally zoned districts are the right ones. But being next to uh, within a setback of residentially zoned areas really is not uh, the solution. I mean, if this were simply a financial consideration, and I think it's important to think about the money for a second, which is to say some of the numbers that staff presented uh, on what could be lost with these licenses are just theoretical. In the last three years alone during the budget times, staff has come back to say that we never met any of the projected estimates associated with licensing. Uh, fees. So that two and a half million in and of itself is not, uh, is just at, at best a guess. It was a number that the, the board budgeted. But last year, you may remember, we were nowhere near uh, the numbers that we said that we'd budgeted. So we don't actually know whether, but there's also a significant cost of compliance associated with it. As a couple of the speakers noted, you know, this is not akin to a standard ag agricultural product. We don't have a berry licensing officer or a lettuce licensing officer or an, ap an apple compliance office. We spend millions in compliance and in our quarterly reports, we see that there's a lot of compliance issues associated with this. It is heavily regulated for a reason and that's because it is viewed fundamentally different by both uh, the local state and federal approach to this. And so I think it's very reasonable that the board try and find what that balance is. But if we were only interested in money, um, then there were a lot of other decisions the board could consider. I mean, we could. For example, we have uh, hotels that pay a significant amount of transit occupancy tax. Some of them are single story in the Live Oak area or other places in the county. Maybe they should be five, six, seven stories immediately adjacent to residentially zoned areas. But we would never do that because we would say that that doesn't meet the strike the balance. And, and even though the historic use has been you were living next to a hotel, the expectation wasn't that the intensification would be that significant. Those elements of conflict between uh, financial inputs and historic use are, are throughout our code. I mean, so we always make these balanced land use decisions throughout our county. And I think that this does exactly that. Um, I, I'm fully supportive of what it is. I hear the challenge. I mean, the reason that that this is something that, that the county has permitted to create these issues and how do we start to mitigate some of those issues? I think allowing for uh, hundreds of additional parcels to still exist on top of the ones that are currently already permitted. Uh, but prevent future issues and these conflicts with with uh, residentially zoned districts is just part of the promise we've made the community from day one. I mean, if the board uh, wants to keep its word and 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 all the people that participated in the process were told that this would not have residential conflicts, it would not have environmental conflicts, we're seeing that both are occurring, uh, then, then the board needs to support this moratorium and also the ordinance revisions moving forward. I do appreciate the board's, uh, the respect full uh, exchange of ideas that was that occurred today. I recognize that that people are very passionate about this on, on both sides of the issue. But what I do hear is a, is a common theme that the cannabis industry is uh, inextricably linked with the both the agricultural industry and the greater fabric of Santa Cruz County. And I don't think that's that's being changed or denied as opposed to what's being proposed here. So too, though, is uh, the fact that we're trying to mitigate any sort of residential or environmental conflicts. And that what that is what's being proposed here. So uh, Mr. Chair, when it comes time, obviously, I'll be willing to make a motion in, in favor of the recommended actions, but obviously, I'd like to hear from my colleagues as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, probably ask Mr. Caput if you have a comment. You don't have a comment? Okay. Um, do you have a comment, Supervisor Koenig? Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I, I just start by saying I do agree with everything Supervisor Friend said as far as the setting here, right, that the policy needs to be iterative, that we clearly need to balance the interests of, of both parties that we heard today. Uh, I also think that we heard strong argument for the fact that 500 feet from the edge of a residential parcel uh, is, is too severe. 
Um, and so, I, I mean, I during this, the extensive public comment we heard was looking at, at the you know, two particular problem parcels that were met, uh, that we know for sure. I, I'm not familiar maybe with all of them. You mentioned a few others on Hazeldale, et cetera, Supervisor Friend, but the ones on Browns Valley Road uh, and Crest Drive. Um, if we made this 500 feet from a residential dwelling, I think that both those parcels, the problem parcels we've heard about, uh, would fall under that. And, and so we'd have a moratorium on the kinds of problems we're currently seeing. Um, but you know, when you hear from a uh, long time uh, agricultural uh, um, growers in our community, like Robert Kiyama, who's got a 30 acre parcel, I mean, why should all of his parcel be completely exempted from, uh, from any kind of cannabis grow just because it's within 500 feet of the edge of a residential parcel? I mean, so I, I think that we should look uh, to change this um, from uh, to residential dwelling uh, some foot amount um, so that we provide a little more flexibility. I mean, again, so I, you, Supervisor Friend, you're, you're completely correct. We need to fine tune this policy, uh, but I think that going, uh, you know, we, if we pass the ordinance as written, it's not gonna be fine tuning. It's, uh, it's gonna be, um, you know, moving radically uh, to com a complete alternate extreme. I mean, a policy that could eliminate half of all the currently eligible parcels, I think is, is too extreme. Okay. Um. Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I think uh, Supervisor Kodak just sort of outlined uh, my position, which is I, I understand Supervisor Friend bringing this forward. Um, I think he's doing what he is elected to do, which is to represent the concerns of his constituents. And then it's the job of the rest of us to look at this uh, in the context of the overall uh, county and hear, hearing the competing needs and values that we have. Um, you know, when, when this is brought forward, I sort of, in my mind, uh, thought it was we're talking about, you know, a half dozen, a dozen parcels in the Coralitas area and a sort of a, a, an incremental inter, it, uh, iterative uh, regulation to address some specific issues. Um, this is a wholesale uh, change in our cannabis policy and in people who have invested uh, a lot of time in trying to play by the rules that we created. Um, and so, uh, you know, a, a, a very narrow change uh, I would, I'd be interested in, but um, this, this change uh, is, it's just too big a leap um, when we've tried to finally bring some, um, uh, continuity and uh, and security to uh, to this process. I I um, I also believe that as the point that many people made, which was uh, that you know if if you force people to move to hemp, which is unregulated, uh, you have many of the same impacts, but without any of the uh, additional compliance um, that we do have. Uh, put a lot of conditions on uh, cannabis cultivators uh, with the idea of uh, reducing impacts on the environment and neighborhoods and um, creating a, a, a stable industry uh, and that uh, but but that we need we need to create a path for people to be able to comply with the law so that then we can enforce against people who are not complying with the law and um, this seems like a uh, an overcorrection so uh, I can't support this uh, moratorium as it's written today but um, uh, I I'm open to small targeted changes. Uh, to address specific neighborhood impacts. Thank you, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, thank you and members of the community uh, who have contacted my office and each of our offices uh, on the impacts of uh, cannabis. I also wanna thank those who previously shared uh, with my office how critical it is that our county continue to uh, remove, not add barriers to this industry so that it can realize uh, the goals and objectives that we have set out. This has been a controversial issue throughout, and it's been an area of policy that requires uh, frequent adjustment, I believe, and to address those concerns. Um, our county has spent a great deal of time as we, over seven years, I think ago, we started getting into this to get it right. And I think we need to continue to work on the challenge. Um, I can support this moratorium for 45 days but I don't know if I will support an extension without there being uh, further analysis by the staff. Um, 
I think some changes are needed, but I think this will give us pause to um, see how we can uh, get those uh, changes included in discussion on uh, October 19th. Otherwise, I think we're gonna be discussing this issue in November, uh, one way or the other. So I would um, entertain uh, Mr. Uh, Friend, uh, Supervisor Friend, you wanted to make a motion. Um, sure, actually, let me, I wanted to ask Supervisor Koenig a question. Um, we did have some discussions regarding setbacks regarding residential parcel, or excuse me, residences themselves, dwellings. So what, um, it sounds like that was something that you were interested in proposing. What distance setback do you think, there already are some setbacks already that are baked, baked into our current code. We have notification setback, or excuse me, notifications at 600 feet, et cetera. Uh, as one person spoke, they said that they were, um, over a thousand feet from an adjoining residence and they would have been precluded. So what setback distance from a, um, a residence were you interested in supporting? Maybe come up. Too loud. Too loud. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me now? Um, I'm willing to support, willing to support a 500, 500 foot setback from a residential dwelling. I, I mean, as I said, I having measured the, that distance, it seems that that would um, would affect both of the problem parcels that we've heard the most about on uh, Crest Drive and Brown Valley Road. Okay, let me just clarify one point with council. Based on what's being proposed today, would it be feasible to to modify the recommended actions to a 500 foot from a residential um, structure? Yes, it would because we're dealing with an urgency ordinance. So you can make a change to what's been uh, suggested and not have to come back uh, to do a second read on it. Okay. Well, I mean, Supervisor Koenig, also recognizing that you grew up in the heart of this area that's, that's being discussed, I think you would have some intimate knowledge. And do you feel that a 500 foot setback would be a situation from your previous community that would be supported? Well, I, you know, to, in the interest of, again, iterative policy and this being a, a moratorium that, you know, will basically affect, it's kind of a prequel to as we go forward into November. Um, I think it's a good first step to uh, you know, addressing the concerns of uh, the Browns Valley community. All right, thank you. So Mr. Chair, based on that information, thank you, Supervisor Cohen. Welcome to the discussion on cannabis that'll never leave, I promise you. I will move the recommended actions with a modification to change it from a 500 foot setback from a parcel line to a 500 uh, foot setback from residential structure. Second. Okay, we have moved and seconded. Um, are there any com comments by the board? Uh, does yes. this require four or three? Four. Requires four votes. Okay. Okay. Um, any other comments from the board? This is to, to move this from the 500 setback from the property line to the residence. That's the that's a change in the uh, proposal. That, that that's the way understood. I understand it, yes. Okay. Good. Um, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? No. Poppet? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes floor suit one. Okay. Uh, normally, I would like to um, continue with our regular agenda, uh, but we do have a set item on 1.30, and so we're going to adjourn until uh, it is now 12.20. Uh, we'll come back at 1.45. We have a scheduled 1.30 meeting. That will start at 1.45, and uh, we have a closed session now. Um, County Council, do we have any reportable items? Yes, I expect that there will be reportable items. That'll okay, I think that when we come back at 145, we will address what has been discussed in um, closed session, and then we'll move on to the 130 scheduled item. So the 130 scheduled item will probably be closer to two o'clock. Okay, can that be, is that? That sounds about right. Okay, all right. Okay, we'll recess until 145. <laughs> Thank you.
maybe I, I'll, I'll go ahead and get somewhat started uh, with this. Uh, I would, first of all, I want to thank you in the audience. I know we had a 1.30 scheduled, scheduled item. We went, we went long this, this morning. And we had a closed session that went uh, long as well. So I appreciate your patience and even more so for additional patience. Uh, we had a closed session and I want to ask the county council if there's any reportable items. Yes, there was one reportable item. The board uh, approved by 5-0 an item uh, to file litigation uh, against a uh, defendant in one matter. That'll be um, disclosed later. And I understand that you also have something to report out. Yes, um, it gives me a tremendous amount of pleasure to announce uh, the first public defender for Santa Cruz County. Uh, reporting out of closed session, I am pleased to announce that the Board of Supervisors has appointed Heather Rogers as the first county public defender following an extensive recruitment. Ms. Rogers is a resident of Santa Cruz County and brings over 17 years of litigation and management experience as a county and fed federal public defender, as well as over a decade as trainer and teacher. She has represented hundreds of clients at all stages of proceedings manage the defense teams and work collaboratively to promote client-centered programs that reduce recidivism, rebuild communities, and result in better outcomes. Currently, Ms. Rogers is a supervising and felony trial attorney, as well as lead immigration resource counsel for the Bigham, Christensen, and Minsloff, or BCM, law firm, which serves as the county's contract public defender. She is a graduate of Stanford Law School with distinction and serves on the Santa Cruz County Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Commission, Santa Cruz County Trial Lawyers Association Board of Directors, Santa Cruz County Defense Bar Board of Directors, and National Association for Public Defense Wellness Summit Working Group. Ms. Rogers impressed the board with her vision to build a public agency that provides impassioned, client-centered, holistic defense promotes equi equity, diversity, and inclusion, and works closely with county, court, and community partners to reach the best outcomes. We'd like to welcome Ms. Rogers as the county's newest department head beginning October 1st, and look forward to working with her as an indigent defense services transition from the BCM law firm to the county in nine months on July 1st. Ms. Rogers, congratulations, and welcome to the Santa Cruz County. Thank you, supervisors, for putting your trust in me to lead the Santa Cruz County Public Defender through this time of tremendous growth, change, and opportunity. Thank you also to our community, county, and our justice partners, to our county administrative officer, Carlos Palacios, to the county transition team, to Sheriff Jim Hart, District Attorney Jeff Roselle, and to everyone who is supportive of this new agency and is wishing our success moving forward. And a special thank you to Larry Bigham, Jerry Christensen, and John Minsloff, who've served our community for 45 years as the public defender, building a team of dedicated, talented, compassionate defenders who will help move this new agency forward. Over 17 years ago, one of my first clients was a goat herd found wandering in the mountains near the border of the United States and Mexico. He was charged with illegal reentry after deportation, a federal crime with severe consequences. And when I met him in the visiting room of the federal detention center, he was slumped over crying. He wasn't interested in the charges against him. He wasn't interested in potential defenses. He didn't care how much time he was facing. All he wanted to know was que paso con mis chivos. What happened to my goats? He described the goats by name in loving detail, and he asked me to find them, to make sure that they were safe. Sitting across from a goat herd in my new suit with a shiny briefcase full of books, I realized that little I'd learned in law school had prepared me for this work. As public defenders, we're not so much in the business of law, as in the business of people. People with sad, complicated, incredible stories. People with hopes and dreams and fears. People who sometimes feel like they've lost everything, that they've hit rock bottom, 
that there's no way forward. Over the years, I've defended hundreds of clients facing charges ranging from shoplifting to murder. But that lesson I learned from a goat herd stays with me. Our clients aren't cases, they're people. To do this work well, we have to hear their stories, we have to amplify their voices, and we have to honor their humanity. Here in Santa Cruz, that often means honoring the humanity of a client who's struggling with mental illness, substance abuse, poverty, homelessness, or hopelessness. Aggressive courtroom advocacy is the cornerstone of a strong public defender's office. But we've learned that we can't litigate our way out of the issues that drive our most vulnerable clients into a cycle of recidivism. The only way to break that cycle is to address root causes. And the only way to do that is to work together to find real solutions to our community's most pressing problems. I'm grateful to serve here in Santa Cruz County, where we're already thinking outside the box to solve these problems. In our schools and neighborhood courts, we embrace restorative justice as an alternative to prosecution and incarceration. Our collaborative courts, including Veterans Court, PACT, and Behavioral Health Court, use compassion and accountability to empower clients to turn their lives around. And we've invested in diversion and record clearance programs to support second chances. But we know we can do more. And our public defender's office will combine aggressive courtroom advocacy with a holistic defense model that offers culturally responsive interdisciplinary support. We'll zealously defend our clients with courageous, compassionate, client-centered defense. And we'll work together with all of you to reduce incarceration, reduce recidivism, and offer real solutions to the root causes of system involvement. Thank you, I'm honored. Thank you. This is a big deal for Santa Cruz County, and it's going to be great to have this in our judicial system, to have it under the county oversight. So we welcome you with open arms and uh, can't wait to really get on the job in July. That's gonna be great. Thank you very much. Okay, now we will go into the scheduled 1.30 item, it now being almost two o'clock, but uh, this item is to consider options and resolution to allow CZU August Lightning Complex fire survivors to rebuild without evaluating and mitigating potential geological hazards direct ordinance amendments and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the acting planning director. We have a resolution from the CZU rebuild directive 9.921 attachment and a declaration of covenant for geological hazards 9.921 attachment B. Uh, we will have a, a staff presentation at this time, uh, giving us um, the presentation will be Pyle Levine of our planning department and then you can introduce those who follow you. Thank you very much. Ready for the first slide. Good afternoon, members of the board and members of the public in the room and also online. We're here today at the board's request to respond to concerns regarding rebuilding in the CZU fire burn area. We were asked to present options for allowing rebuilding without evaluation and mitigation of potential geologic hazards in order to address the hardship and the ongoing displacement that's being experienced by people who have lost their homes. We are here today to present those options for your consideration, to discuss the trade-offs inherent in these options, and to receive your direction on proceeding with a plan of action. To begin with, the staff want to acknowledge that the recovery process is indeed a struggle for victims. In addition to the loss of a home, families had to deal with last winter's weather threats right on the heels of the fire. And thankfully, there were no significant debris flow events last winter. Following that, there's the working through the debris removal and the building permit preclearance process. Now we're about to prepare for winter weather events again. All of this has been time consuming. It reignites the memories of loss and all of us as public servants and community members, we must and we do keep in our minds and empathize with the difficulties. That really underpins all of our staff work and we just want the community to know that. 
So last September, the board acted quickly to create the fire re recovery permit center um, in order to assist in the streamlining of permits for fire rebuild victims and survivors. While this has resulted in the streamlined process and typical two week building permit turnaround and approval, for many, the road recovery and rebuilding still remains difficult. I have personally spoken with dozens of fire families and heard firsthand how the challenges they are facing are many and, and numerous and challenging. Currently, our county code, Chapter 1610, does not have provisions for rebuilding after a natural disaster. And that's what our conversation today will discuss. In order to address the significant hardship and emotional and financial stress of rebuilding after a traumatic event and the increased housing insecurity associated with the delay and expense of producing the specific reports, on August 10th, your board directed staff to develop options for allowing rebuild without evaluation and mitigation of potential geologic hazards. Next slide. This is David Reed, by the way, as you can see on the screen, uh, director of ROR3. Thank you. The Santa Cruz Mountains are a complicated geologic environment. Many locations are subject to various hazards, including landslides, debris flow, flooding, and hazards related to earthquakes. The purpose of the Geologic Hazard Ordinance, Chapter 1610, is to minimize injury, loss of life, and damage to public and private property in this dynamic kind of an environment. The strategy in the code to accomplish that purpose is based on, firstly, technical investigation of individual building sites in order to fully understand what the hazards are, avoidance of the identified hazards wherever that's possible, where that's not possible, mitigation to lessen the risks is required. Also, disclosure, so that future owners have an awareness of the situation. We point to the geologic work that's been done so that anybody can um, see the, the technical investigation. And we ensure that the property owner and future property owners are aware that they need to maintain mitig mitigation measures over time to keep their effectiveness over time. This emphasis on avoidance comes out of the experience of our community where we have in the not so distant past had repeated years of storm induced landslide and debris flow. We experienced the disruption of disaster after disaster up to and including loss of life in many locations throughout the Santa Cruz mountains. As we discuss the difficulties with implementing the current code as applied to the fire rebuilding, it's worthwhile to recall the genesis for the code and the why it was set up the way that it is. As we go through the discussion, we'll be emphasizing that this is a situation of balancing multiple worthy objectives. There is no single right way to answer these questions. There's only careful consideration and weighing of the factors. After a disaster that creates widespread displacement, up to and including housing and security, the protection of health and safety becomes more complicated than thinking just about avoidance. The displacement itself can be a major impact to public health and safety. It has been very difficult for fire victims to find stable, affordable places to be. One of the trade-offs is balancing the avoidance of risk through the geologic report and mitigation process with allowing residents to assume risk in order to rebuild more quickly. Whichever way the alternatives are balanced, it's important to acknowledge that public safety is always the goal and the intent, regardless of the approach. An element of assuming risk is balancing the type of development, in this case, mostly single family residences, and the appropriate amount of caution. It's a well-established principle in land use planning that public buildings and critical buildings must meet a higher standard than a residence. In this case, chapter 1610 does make that distinction for seismic hazards, for example, but it does not make that distinction for geologic investigations and mitigation. Those requirements as the code is written now are for all residences, all habitable situations equally. Another balancing is between the clear and present need of the impacted property owners to rebuild on the one hand, and the principles of long-term resiliency planning on the other. Future disasters are expected to occur and they're expected to be more likely than they have been in the past. 
So it's desirable to rebuild, well, to build resilience into the rebuilding and the recovery. We're turning over a significant part of the housing stock at this point. And at the end of the day, we want the community in a better position and safer for future occurrences. So all of this, there are many things to consider. As we go through the presentation, we're planning on describing the options and the challenges in a high level manner, but a discussion about geologic hazards can become uh, fairly technical fairly quickly. So um, uh, I'd like the board to know that various staff are here to address technical as well as land use planning issues. Next slide. So as noted, chapter 1610 is organized around the principles of investigation, avoidance, and mitigation. There are several regulatory mechanisms that are available to your board to accomplish a policy change to allow rebuilding without that evaluation and mitigation. The options differ in terms of how soon they can go into effect and whether they are narrowly focused on just CZU rebuilding or whether they express a broader emergency planning perspective. The three main options are one, the board can simply direct county staff not to consider the provisions of 1610 that call for those site specific reports, review of the reports and the mitigation for CZU rebuilding. Two, the board can amend 1610 itself to remove CZU rebuilding from the category of development that uh, dictates what the code applies to. Or three, the board can approve broader policy amendments to the code and to the general plan that reflect resiliency policy generally and would apply to a range of natural disasters that might occur in the future. Next slide. At this point, I would like to introduce, uh, well, you know, Carolyn Burke, she's the planning department senior civil engineer. She'll take you through the options. Good afternoon. Uh, the first option we'll present today is for the board to direct county staff not to apply the provisions of County Code Chapter 1610 in their review of permit applications for CZU rebuilds. If this option is chosen, the board can provide such direction via adoption of either a resolution or an uncodified urgency ordinance. With either path, the direction would become effective immediately to meet the time constraints faced by fire survivors. The main difference between a resolution and an ordinance is that a resolution is typically used to address issues of a temporary nature, while an ordinance is a more formal, permanent enactment of law. Passage of a resolution by the board requires a simple majority, while passage of an ordinance requires a four-fifths vote for approval by the board. A resolution has been included in the board agenda packet that provides details regarding how the board's direction would be applied. In addition to eligibility requirements, which will be covered in the next slide, the resolution includes a requirement for those choosing to opt out of further geologic investigation to sign and record a covenant on title that acknowledges the potential risks of developing an area subject to hazards and indemnifies the county. A copy of the recommended covenant is included in the board agenda packet. The practice of recording such a document on, on title in areas subject to hazards is not new. What is new in this situation is that owners would be accepting an uncharacterized risk related to geologic hazards. In the case of those rebuilding pursuant to board direction, the covenant as written states in the broadest way the potential hazards that may exist on parcels and acknowledges that no geologic report was prepared pursuant to the board direction considered today. This informs current and future property owners that hazards may exist, and it is incumbent upon them to get a geologic evaluation done if they would like to better understand their individual risks. Further, future property owners are also made aware that while the structure received a building permit, certain provisions of county code were not applied to our review. The recommended covenant also includes a clause whereby the property owners acknowledge heightened near-term geologic risks via an agreement to evacuate if an order is issued to do so. In summary, the decision to issue building permits without geologic review is what creates the need for a covenant. A resolution is included in your agenda packet and can be acted upon today if the board so chooses. If an urgency ordinance is the preferred direction, Staff can return in two weeks with an ordinance for adoption by the board. 
whether a resolution or ordinance is chosen by the board, staff recommends supporting the board direction with a codified non-urgency ordinance and general plan and local coastal program amendments as necessary. To this end, the attached resolution includes a sunset clause that makes the direction effective for three years, at which time it may be extended by the board. It is anticipated that the follow-up non-urgency ordinance will be in place well before the three-year expiration date. Next slide, please. Eligibility requirements to not consider evaluation and mitigation of geologic hazards focus on allowing property owners facing immediate hardships related to time and funds to replace their lost structures in kind and assume essentially the same risk level as they had before the fire. Board direction would apply to property owners on title at the time of the CZU fire, applying for in-kind replacement of the structures destroyed by fire. Because geologic risks are tied to topography, the criteria for in-kind structures includes replacement in substantially the same location and of similar size, up to 10% more than the previous structure. The board direction would be executed in conformance with the same legality provisions applied to other CZU fire rebuild policies, which requires that eligible structures be permitted or legal non-conforming. Next slide. If you want to. Sure. Um, this is just a graphic that shows how um, we determine whether a structure that does not have permits is indeed legal non conforming. Um, if a structure was built before permits were required, and that date is 1956, um, there are no questions. The structure is treated as legally non conforming. After the fire, in response to the difficulties, your board extended that 1956 date to include everything that was constructed through 1985. So those structures, if built without permit, will also be considered legally non-conforming. If a structure was built in 1986 or later and does not have a permit, it doesn't have any status associated with it. And at that point, it needs to meet all the um, current regulations and standards of the zoning code. I the second option before the board today is to amend current county code chapter 1610 to remove CZU fire rebuilds from the definition of development subject to the provisions of the chapter. The current definition of development includes construction of residential structures and does not provide an exemptions for structures rebuilt after wildfire. Removing CZU fire rebuilds clearly recognizes that rebuilding homes destroyed by wildfire is fundamentally different from new construction and can be crafted to include provisions regarding eligibility and assumption of risks similar to option one. The difference between options one and two is that this option requires a formal amendment to our current code before it can take effect. The process for which takes time and cannot meet the immediate needs of those rebuilding. As a local coastal program implementing ordinance, an amendment to chapter 1610 requires approval by the Coastal Commission and possible amendments to the general plan and local coastal program, which can take up to six months. Next slide will be uh, Dave Reed. Um, Thank you. Um, in this option, option three, the board could direct OR3 and the planning department to explore broader policy amendments to our Santa Cruz County Code and general plan reflecting resiliency and adaptation policy strategies applicable to a range of natural disasters that may occur in the future. While this option would begin a larger regulatory conversation on the implications of climate change and the potential for recurring natural disasters, allowing us to discuss and explore ways to build preparedness and processes to be in place for rebuilding in the wake of future disasters, it will require the development of a significant plan and work program requiring staff and time resources that would not be accomplished quickly. It may be considered by the board to include this option as additional direction in conjunction with the options that provide immediate relief. Next slide. The majority of the rebuild proposals flagged for further geologic evaluation are in debris flow hazard areas. These areas are prone to debris flows due to geography, topography, and climate and their risk of impacted is elevated for two to five years after fire when it returns to background risk level that existed prior to the fire. 
Before the CZU fire was even fully contained, a rapid assessment of the burn zone was performed by the Watershed Emergency Response Team, or WERT, to identify immediate life safety risks to those still occupying structures within the burn area and inform evacuation planning. The WERT report broadly defined debris flow hazard areas using conservative assumptions and field evidence and clearly stated that further study was needed to refine the hazard areas. Upon receipt of the report, County Geologic staff immediately took to the field walking the individual basins identified in the work report to chart the course the debris flow may take. This refinement reduced the number of properties subject to evacuation, but it did not incorporate the computer modeling necessary to estimate the inundation area boundaries and provide site-specific data necessary to design mitigation measures. Recognizing the need for CZU rebuilders to mitigate the debris flow hazard in their home designs, the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County generously commissioned a flood study by Atkins Engineering to provide the quantitative analysis missing from both the WORD report and county mapping. The products of the report are refined debris flow inundation areas and technical design parameters that can be used by rebuilders to avoid or mitigate the impacts of debris flow. The Atkins report is not yet final, but the county has reviewed draft data and confirmed the report achieved its intended goals of refining and reducing the number of burned and unburned structures in identified de debris flow hazard areas and providing depth and velocity data within debris flow inundation areas that can be used by engineers and other design professionals. The final results of the study will be presented in further detail at the September 28th board meeting. Next slide, please. On board direction, the permitting process for eligible projects would begin with an application for a geologic hazard clearance as is current practice to determine whether further geologic evalu evaluation is required. In most cases, the presence of imminent hazards and the need for a geologic report can be determined through the clearance process, though in some cases a geologic hazards assessment is necessary to determine whether a full geologic report is required. Those projects that need a full geologic report to comply with the requirements of County Code Chapter 1610 may proceed to apply for their building permit application, provided they record the recommended covenant on title prior to permit issuance. Those who do not wish to record the covenant may opt to meet the requirements of Chapter 1610 by submitting a geologic report for peer review and incorporating the recommended mitigations into their project design. Next slide, please. It should be noted that the options presented today only relieve property owners from requirements of County Code Chapter 1610 as it relates to the permit process. There may be circumstances where private technical professionals such as geotechnical, structural, or civil engineers determine that geologic information is necessary for them to complete their professional work and to adhere to the provisions in the California Building Code that address slope stability minimum setbacks from slopes and foundation design separate from Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 1610. In areas subject to debris flow inundation, it is anticipated that data from the Atkins engineering study may assist with meeting the needs of technical consultants in this respect, but this data will not apply to sites subject to other types of geologic hazards. Further, pursuant to County Code Chapter 7.38, in limited locations, the proper design and installation of a septic system requires geologic in information that must be reviewed by the geologic staff in the planning department. Chapter 7.38 is currently in the final stages of review and acceptance by the state as part of the Local Area Management Plan, or LAMP, for on-site sewage disposal systems. Revising the chapter now would risk significantly delaying approval of the LAMP and because approval will streamline the review of all fire rebuild septic permits by allowing them to be reviewed locally rather, rather than by the state, chapter 7.38 is not proposed to be revised. But next slide. In conclusion, we have presented three options for the board's consideration to allow those rebuilding after the CZU fire to do so without evaluation and mitigation of geologic hazards as required under county code chapter 1610. A resolution has been provided for adoption today that suggests eligibility requirements and conditions for opting out of further geologic evaluation that may be modified at the discretion of the board. 
Should option one be chosen by the board, it is recommended that the board direct staff to pursue codification and amendments to the general plan and local coastal program to that end. Staff is available to answer any questions the board may have regarding the material we have presented today. Thank you for your presentation. I'm, I'm gonna get some comments from the board. I'd like to open that. Um, uh, I've made extensive comments to the board on August 10th about this item, so I'm gonna be a little brief today. Uh, we now have twice unanimously approved bringing uh, options back for addressing the negative impacts of our geological hazards code uh, and what it's having for our fire survivors who wanna essentially rebuild what they had before the fire. I really do appreciate the community members who have contacted me in this and the patience that they have uh, demonstrated as we try to work out a solution. And I thank you for sharing your stories to the board again today, as you will do now, I know. I wanna support the resolution pathway that provides immediate relief to those wanting to rebuild now, while staff work out details of an amended ordinance, general plan amendment, and other steps during the coming months. We can't wait any longer. Even if survivors choose not to rebuild until later, as we know many of them may do, it will be reassuring to know that they will not have to spend the time and money evaluating geological hazards. And this is what we're talking about today. Uh, with that, I would like to open it for any maybe opening comments from any other board members, uh, Supervisor Coonerty in the third district, whose district was impacted like mine in the fifth district. Do you have any uh, comments that you would like to make? Yeah, I, I look forward to both uh, community input as well as the board discussion. But very briefly, just to frame this a little bit for uh, for folks who aren't or haven't been involved in day to day, um, we obviously have a huge number of families that were impacted by the fire. And the goal has always been to get them back home as soon as possible. Uh, we've, uh, as we've gone through, we've tried to reduce the barriers um, that we have control over. So we reduced permitting uh, costs and time, uh, looked at uh, options for places like Last Chance, which uh, were almost entirely unpermitted, um, and then worked with uh, some of the areas that we don't have control over, which is uh, some of the CAL FIRE rules around access and septic tank rules um, that are significant impediments to people getting back to their homes. And obviously, uh, as people have also struggled with insurance companies, uh, the high cost of building materials, lack of labor, uh, and a variety of other challenges. And so um, this is one uh, step in moving things forward. I wanna you know, sort of put into context that I recognize uh, that this is uh, not necessarily uh, where the staff would have chosen to land had, uh, had, they, had, had they been given to themselves. And I also recognize that we've heard from the community that this isn't uh, this is this isn't where they want us to go, um, uh, and they have some concerns around the covenant. Um, and so uh, uh, we are trying to balance these interests. We're also trying to balance this uh, the interests for future um, for future homeowners as well as the county itself uh, as an organization and the liability that we assume. So. Um, I, I too, like Supervisor McPherson, support a uh, resolution going forward so that we can get some immediate relief and a pathway pe for people to go forward. I think the, the broader conversation that um, Director Reed talked about, about this being our new normal and developing uh, codes and systems and operations that reflect uh, an increasing number of natural disasters uh, and challenges, especially along our coast and our mountains, um, is really important. But uh, but there's there's time is a, of is of of the essence. Uh, people's insurance money uh, for housing is running out. There's an anxiousness to return home, and so we're trying to to thread that needle uh, today. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, Supervisor Friend, um, do you have any comments? Opening. I just very briefly, I mean, first, I, I, I'm going to really appreciate the work of Mr. Reed and that of planning staff being very responsive to this issue. It's a very complicated issue. Just as a reminder, the board is the one who, who adopted, not this board, but the board is the one that adopted the construct by which planning was interpreting the codes on it anyway. So it's a, it makes sense that the board would continue. And this is an iterative process, as we discussed extensively on our last 
item as well. I also uh, want to recognize that th these are very extenuating circumstances. People that are living in these conditions, we need to do everything we can, especially in advance of winter, to ensure that, that we can protect people uh, looking forward to rebuild or, and provide some sort of um, interim situation for those that were living in the burn situation. And, and you know, while this may have impacted Supervisor McPherson and Coonerty's district, the majority of fires in the last 15 years have actually been within my district, and there's, and there's nothing saying that, that it's not that, that our situation isn't next, fires and floods for that matter. So I'm supportive of what's uh, come forward today. I'm also particularly supportive of the additional review of the item of the actual ordinance so that we can get something over time to look at this moving forward, recognizing that the whole reason we, why we created OR3 is the recognition that things, the fundamentals are changing on the ground and we're gonna need to have codes that recognize what that is moving forward. So I think that we have an immediate component through the resolution, but we also need that long-term look. And we also have to have that honest conversation that it, these are due to extenuating circumstances. There, there will not be a situation where the board is just uh, waiving codes during due to any specific uh, issue moving forward. But what happened in, the, in uh, throughout the rural areas in the third and fifth district is nothing short of absolutely catastrophic. And that's what the board is trying to respond to today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Coney. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just a few questions. Um, you know, I understand that we're talking about a covenant that uh, the the owner would put uh, on their deed, deed recorded, so that they were saying that they recognize the risks associated with rebuilding without uh, the geologic hazard report, uh, and that anyone who owns the property in the future will be uh, duly noticed of that as well. Is there any potential risk, though, to folks who live nearby? Uh, of a structure being built without the geologic hazard report. Right? I mean, are we are we endangering folks? Um, you know, who maybe their home didn't burn down, or uh, yeah, they, they live in the area because someone built rebuilds without this uh, the geologic hazard report. I, I would say there is not. We're focused on the the particular property, and um, we would not allow a situation where the way the replacement was built was different, it's in kind really. So that's what covers that. Um, we wouldn't allow something to be built that would deflect mud or create some other difficulty on an adjacent parcel. Great, thank you. Then um, you did mention, or I think Supervisor Coonerty mentioned um, the pilot program on Last Chance Road. Um, and what's being proposed today would exempt, or, or I should say would not include structures uh, who built after 1986 without a permit. Do we have a sense of how many structures that would be? We don't have a number. And that's because of course, they've never come into, in, in, into our system and we don't have any record of them. Um, so I, the answer to that is no, we, d we don't know the number. Okay, well, yeah, just kind of curious how many people might be left out of, out in the cold, uh, you know, with today's actions. Um, then how would the, the um, pilot program on Lost Chance Road, we're allowing people who didn't have a permit, who, whose, whose structures burned down uh, to rebuild as long as they're owner occupants, right? To, to kind of summarize that, how would that program interact with? Yeah, maybe to clarify resolution? something about that program, that pilot program is about implementing a, um, a version of the building code that doesn't have the same standard as the regular building code. And it recognizes different ways to build and has fewer required inspections. And just the bar is lower in, in general. And that's because of how rural those um, those properties are. But um, you, you still need a building permit. Right. Well, I'm saying, so are they already exempt from 1610 and the geologic hazard report? No, that addresses only construction related building code issues. So they are not exempt from, it, it, other than uh, this applying to that area as well as everywhere else in the burn area, um, that it, that doesn't apply to geology, that pilot program doesn't apply to fire access or to septic, it's only for construction related questions. Right. Okay, so it's possible that um, someone, let's just say living in the last chance area under this pilot program uh, with an unpermitted structure built after 1986, um, would still would basically still have to do a geologic hazard report. It's more like the two um, the two programs layer. So this would apply to everybody in the burn area, including 
Last Chance. And then in addition, Last Chance has some opportunity to do things differently relative to the code under the, the um, uh, low density building ordinance program that we're talking about. So they, they, um, they, they layer, they're both in effect there, but mm -hmm. this one is in effect the same way there as anywhere. Okay, but and the, the last chance pilot program doesn't sort of doesn't afford any additional. Uh, it doesn't address geology. Uh, geology, yeah. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Captain. Do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for the report. And uh, I, uh, you actually answered in the report almost every question I had. Uh, I just want to extend my. Uh, uh, heartfelt uh, feelings for the people that went through the, you know, uh, a doubly ter terrible year for, you know, for most people we're dealing with COVID-19 and other issues and you had to deal with losing your home and uh, that's uh, really rough. So we're, we're trying to make it better, uh, streamline everything. Uh, at the same time, I, I did notice that there's safety measures in there that we don't, that we're not looking the other way and uh, ignoring the fact that when they rebuild, uh, that we're not actually setting them up for a second disaster uh, down the line, meaning like, uh, let's say, go ahead and rebuild and then we have a big flood year, uh, uh, you know, a heavy rain and, uh, and, and their house, uh, part of it washes away or something. I, uh, can you just clarify, uh, the safety measures that we have in place. Uh, I, I heard most of them, but, uh, you know, make it clear to the public. What we would be doing would be um, approving, rebuilding into essentially the same circumstances that that structure was in prior to the fire. So it's for an in-kind structure in the same footprint or approximately the same footprint. So any risks that exist from flooding, for example, um, um, <clears throat> Would, would affect them the same way going forward as it would have in the past. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And yeah. and, and some of the uh, safety factors that remain in effect include the California Building Code, which, which does um, have um, requirements that address foundations and slope stability, et cetera. Right. So that still exists. And I, I'm not sure if my math is correct, but uh, 911 homes is... Uh, pretty much like uh, one and a half percent of the entire housing stock in the county. Does that sound about right? Yeah, you know, I didn't do that calculation countywide. Um, you think it's, about it, it's, uh, over, it's a significant over number of homes. Of the whole uh, county, which is unbelievable. That's not structures, that's homes, people's lives. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? That's it. Yeah, um, after having many conversations with um, residents in my district, and I know Supervisor Cooney in particular in his third district, um, I have some questions and concerns from survivors about um, the proposed covenant recorded on properties that do not do a de geological hazards uh, report. And this, my questions are going to be addressed to the county council to get some legal. So far, the county council and other staff, can you please discuss more about what these covenants mean and their impact on the future of these properties, number one? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I've got I, another, I have some other Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one first. I think, I, think, I think Ms. Burke and Supervisor Coonerty and some others have, have spoken to that issue, and I'll try to attack it in a little different way, which is that the, the staff and, and the board, I feel, are, are, are trying to develop policy here that helps fire victims and at the same time doesn't hurt anybody else. And the concern is that people are gonna be in these homes later someday. There are buyers, even buyers in our own community who are gonna purchase these homes someday. And they need to know whether or not county codes were complied with in the building of these homes so that they have a choice of whether they wanna go through investigation and determine whether there are any dangers associated with the property. So that's a very important aspect of the covenant because without the covenant being on title, nobody knows, no future purchasers know whether or not those county codes were complied with. The second thing that's important 
is, you know, we want to protect the entire community, which is why we need the indemnification provision, because should something happen that's unfortunate um, and that's disaster related, that's a result of not complying with county code, we have to be ensured that that financial risk isn't going to uh, eventually come back on the entire community. Uh, this is a choice that fire victims are making to not comply with certain county code provisions. And I realize it is a difficult choice and nobody wants them to be in this um, situation. As many others have expressed, we have so much empathy for what people are going through right now. So we're trying to, again, thread that needle of providing immediate assistance and help to fire victims while at the same time not harming anyone else. Very well, thank you. Um, and um, this, and what this uh, you've answered this probably, but what immunity does uh, the county already have with permitted buildings, and how does this compare? I mean, is, so you've well, the county has the the, the county itself has something called uh, discretionary immunity that's associated with permits, with issuing permits, but that's really a, a separate issue that arguably protects the county from liability as opposed to with the covenant, what we're talking about is protecting other people in the future right. who are good faith bona fide purchasers of these properties. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Um, I'm gonna open this up now to the public. Uh, do, how many people wanna speak? Um, okay, well, uh, just please, uh, maybe two or three or four of you get in the line uh, and then uh, we're gonna limit comments to two minutes, uh, to uh, which we normally do. So thank you for your, your atten attention and uh, for your uh, comments that are about to come. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Lucia. I lost my home in the Fallen Leaf neighborhood 390 days ago today. 390 days and not one of them has gone by without this sick feeling in my stomach that we may not be able to go home. The other day, my daughter was watching a video of herself playing in our home and she said excitedly, mama, that's my first home. Try explaining to a four-year-old why we haven't started building our new home. She doesn't understand why it's taking so long and frankly, neither do I. It doesn't have to be this way. At first, it felt like the county was making logical decisions by spending six million to hire four leaves. But it seems the planning department keeps halting forward progress. And now that so much time has passed and I'm continually navigating misinformation, now it feels personal. Because the point is, is that if my house hadn't burned down, we wouldn't be here. The planning department would not be putting us through such turmoil over non-fire related pre-existing geological features. We wouldn't be asked to put a covenant on our deed, lowering our property value. Plus, we're up against a very strict timeline and the insurance companies don't care if they make us homeless. Ironically, just this morning, I got an email from Nationwide stating that we have till April to build our home. That's eight months from now. And now that this has taken so long and we still don't have permits, we will be forced to wait to build until the spring because of the winter moratorium. Because like so many others, we are underinsured and cannot afford yet another extra expense for the winter permits. I applaud the board for asking the planning department for a resolution to get fire victims home. Why I'm in, a, in support of a resolution, the one put forth here today needs to be reworked. Honorable supervisors, I would hope that you would want a system in place for when, not if a fire happens in your district. It's time you held the planning department accountable and forced them to put forth recommendations that are actually in support of fire victims. I ask that you come back in two weeks with more reasonable proposals, show good faith and give fire victims some relief, some peace and allow us to go home. Thank you. My name is Larry Green and <laughs> I own property in Boulder Creek. I had a house there for 38 years. My home was built in 1969 and weathered five 80 plus inch rainfall years, one 20 inch is of rain in 24 hours in the 1989 earthquake. The house was built with a permit in 1969, but it was a piece of junk. The foundation was a joke and none of the walls were plumb. I spent 38 years upgrading, remodeling and modernizing that house. My family and I never felt unsafe on that property. Now I'd like to ask each one of you to use your imagination for just a moment. Assume each of you live in Santa Cruz County and that you went home after this meeting and were told you had to evacuate your home immediately. You rush around, throw whatever is important to you that will fit in your car and you leave. 
48 hours later, you get a call at 10.30 p.m. saying that your house is burned to the ground. I want you to take a minute and try to let that sink in. I know it's difficult because you haven't been through it. You have lost everything you owned, everything that you spent all your life building, all your memories, all your dreams in an instant. I cannot describe the devastation and psychological toll this will take on you and your family. I, I, I have more, but I, I wanted I want to talk. That, that means you have another minute left. When the yellow... it said thirty seconds. Okay. okay, I want to talk about the covenant. The the problem I have with the covenant is first, it's an assumption that there's risk on my property, despite the fact that there was a house there for over fifty years. Okay, so if there's no risk, I don't have to. It's already there. The risk has been been proven, and you. I think you should change the code. To his point, for us, that would get around the, the liability issue. And if you issue a permit, you change the code so that we can build in kind on a piece of property we've been on for our whole lives that never had a problem despite all these natural disasters. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Antonia Bradford and I lost my home in the CZU fire. In the last 13 months, I've been working nonstop to try and get my family back home and was on track to break ground early this last spring until geology. Then everything came to a screeching halt. I haven't come across anyone outside the planning department, including professionals in the field who think fire victims should have to do non-fire geology surveys on their land. This isn't treating fire victims fairly since the county hasn't retagged a single home that survived in the burn scar. So while I support this resolution, there are a few things that, few changes that need to be made. The covenant that is to be recorded on our deeds will lower our property values. I understand that most properties up in the mountains come with some kind of disclosure as far as geology, but this covenant has every single worst case scenario possible. We have no idea how this will affect lending options for resale or refinancing or insurance. It truly feels like fire victims are being penalized for our homes burning down. Additionally, the arbitrary and discretionary power of the planning department's pile of that is embedded all over this item needs to be lowered. Those of us in this situation have not seen advocacy or compassion besides the speech at the beginning of this meeting in this entire time. I'm fairly certain that within the code as it stands, there are aspects of flexibility that could have been afforded fire victims, but the choice was made not to. How can we trust that our best interests are going to be met with this as the culture? This is especially important because our county is going to be spending millions of dollars with our contract with Four Leaf. Within the language of that contract, it explicitly says that the consultant, rather than the county, has the right to control the manner and means of accomplishing the result contracted for. There are many other points within the contract that point to Four Leaf, who has actual experience with wildfires, is to do the work. Yet every single step of the way, the planning department and geology are interfering, delaying, and causing harm to the fire community. Why waste our taxpayers' dollars on this if they aren't going to listen to the people with experience? You're risking bankruptcy and homelessness in this process. I will end with this so the board can see how this is affecting people. After the fire, I started a support page and I recently shared my latest article with one of our local papers in the group regarding the last board meeting. A fire brother commented and this is what he wrote and I'm quoting, sorry, I won't evacuate next time. I'll fight to save my home. I had no idea we'd be a full year into this and basically no one has started rebuilding. I'd rather go down in flames. Good afternoon. My, my name is Andrea Tischler, and uh, we lost our home on Swanton Road uh, to the fire. Actually, we lost two places, our original home, the big house, and a art studio, which uh, also burned, which was only 750 square feet. The 750 square feet uh, foot uh, art studio is where we would like to build an ADU Unfortunately, we built that uh, in the early 90s without permits, and uh, you know, we tried to get a permit from the building department, but, well, we know about the building department. Um, and I built this art studio for my, for my partner, and, uh, and now uh, that house burned. We'd like to build um, on that in-kind structure like that. The art studio was built conforming in that all the building codes were followed, but not with a permit. Uh, now, that was built in 1992. So I want to address, and I think the supervisor over here talked about like, what about the buildings that were built after 1986? 
Why is that a, not an arbitrary year? What's magical about 1986? Um, why not change that to make it 2020? Um, I mean, or, or, or why is it 1986? Because it, with that requirement as part of the option one, um, I won't be able to build without a without doing a geologic report. That's extremely expensive to do a geologic report. I've already inquired about that. So I'd, I'd like to know what's magical about 1986 and if we could possibly amend that to make it something other than that so that I can build my little ADU on the in, an in-kind structure there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mandy Larris, and I want to thank you for hearing me today. My husband and our children and I lost our home located in the Forest Springs community in Boulder Creek. This is my family's second time dealing with the loss of a home due to fire and our second time trying to obtain a building permit from the Santa Cruz County. In the CZU wildfire, we lost the home we had rebuilt after a house fire we had had 15 years ago. And back then, after much effort on our part, you ended up treating us like a new build rather than a rebuild. You questioned whether or not our build was even possible. It was one of the most stressful times in our life. And because it took over a year to finally obtain the building permit, our insurance ran out. We had to move six times in a total of three years. Living on the living room floor in relatives' homes with our two small children and pets, to eventually living in a camper in our driveway, which also was not easy to get permission to do. I thought for sure this time we're well insured and the county would be helping us more this time because this time we're not alone and this is not our fault. We paid all the fees and we built a home that Santa Cruz County required. This time it was a wildfire, but instead of helping us get through this process quickly, like promised, once again, our home and our livelihood is on the line. And once again, I'm scared our insurance will run out and before this is project is completed, once again, I'm worried about where we'll live and how we'll afford our mortgage and rent at the same time. Once again, it's been over a year and I don't have a building permit. All this stress while mourning the loss, trying to work and go to school. I really thought things would be different this time. Treating fire victims like new builds needs to change now and it's long overdue. Adding to our deeds when our neighbors who didn't burn don't have to will lower the values of our homes and it's not fair. Please help my family and my neighbors rebuild and keep the livelihoods we've worked so hard for. Thank you. Hello, my name is Vince Cortina Sr. And I would like you guys to raise your hand if you know who I am. Anybody? No, because I've sat across the table from you and the rest of you guys just don't get out enough because I'm a Boulder Creek firefighter and I'm proud to be a Boulder Creek firefighter. I spent 12 days fighting that fire to find out my home was no longer. I'd do it again. I was a part of a small part of something way bigger than me. You guys now have my attention and that's hard to do because I'm a pretty laid back guy. I don't complain about much. I just do what I gotta do. My son, Vince Jr. joined the department right after the fire, like literally right after. He was in backgrounds, came to help us put out spot fires. So in essence, I help save your homes. You owe me nothing. I want nothing. But what I demand is a right to build my lawful home in my footprint. And you guys are offering, oh, we're gonna help you fix your car, but we're gonna put a salvage title on it. It doesn't work. Are you gonna buy a salvage title car? I mean, you literally stated that there's a clause in an amendment already built in that relieves you of liability. But yet for the past 13 months, all you guys have cared about is your liability not our homes, not our citizens, okay? And 
I'm pretty much not judgmental. I don't like to judge people. It's just not my thing. It's not my shade. Rhea, which I believe that's her name, planning committee, which I believe you're in charge of. What have you guys done? Why are we here? Why are we disgruntled? Why are we not being heard? I've met with David. He's a nice guy, cool guy. JW, cool guy, I went on a hike with him. I proved that I live on a rock. I don't live on a landslide, I live on a rock. You would have to give a very big effort and go beyond. The deepest you're gonna get on my hill is four feet, okay? And for you guys to sit there and say, oh, you can build like kind and we're not gonna charge you for your permits. We're gonna fast track you, we're gonna stream you. And then you just pulled it, you just straight pulled it. That's what hurts. And I'm aware my time is out. I'm a very smart individual. My resume is pretty impressive. And what I'm gonna do with that resume is I'm gonna study each and every single one of you and I'm gonna figure out who I'm gonna replace. Thank you. Is that okay if I have it down a little bit? Okay, thank you. My name is Mary Simon and I lost my home 33 years in the CZU fire, sorry. <laughs> My dream is to rebuild my home. So I actually appreciate all the county's efforts to support the fire recovery in the Santa Cruz mountains. It took four months for my property to be officially cleared by environmental health. And I was so excited when I applied for my pre-clearances at RPC. I'm very nervous too. And then everything came to abrupt halt in April when I was denied geological clearance uh, because of debris flow. So I've been in limbo since then, unable to make any decision despite doing all the reports necessary. And the delay has been heartbreaking. However, I think I'm gonna surprise you by saying, I would like to request that you delay your decision on agenda item 12 until we have more information and community input. Since the county is combining both pre-existing and post-fire geohazards, I believe if we had the Atkinson report, we would have a better understanding of the potential hazards. Maybe, and this is what I pray, it's not as dire as we all think. Also in the sample covenant, the county recommends that property owners not sign the waiver. Um, that should give us all pause. I would be willing to work together with county representatives and the community to re-examine all options and possibly come up with option four. Again, thank you for your efforts towards fire recovery. And, I, and all I ask is you take the time to make sure your decisions are fair to the county and to the property owners. Thank you. Hello, my name is Adam Pierce. Um, I can't pretend to know to more. Uh, I can't pretend to know more than the average Joe about building a house, especially when it comes to codes, permits, all the stuff that needs. I know I could help. I could frame pretty good. I could do things like this. Um, but what I do know is that over a year ago, this community was devastated. Um, devastated was through panic and chaos amongst the scariest pandemic we've ever seen. What I do know is that my son, his mother, so ex was my ex-wife, great co-parent and an amazing teacher um, in the community, his stepfather, who is a hardworking, honest man, and his little sister, the brightest, cutest little four-year-old you've ever seen. Um, I do know that they deserve to be in their home and comfortable. There's no question about that. Not only does this gravely affect a teacher who's gonna shape the community, the future of this country, but she's dedicated her life to helping teaching teachers. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of nervous. Okay. She's dedicated her life to helping I'm the teachers. Thank you. I know she's dedicated her life to helping the children of tomorrow, but as if that isn't worse enough, it affects our children of the community. Our community, the children don't have their home. They don't have the solidity. It wasn't their fault that the fires happened to them. It happened to these families. So if they're not just signatures, they're not just dollar signs, they're not just numbers on a page. This is the children of our community who have been displaced. Imagine your grandchildren, children, 
who one day woke up and they didn't have their blankies, their stuffies, all their favorite pictures and toys, the comfortability of a home was taken from them. And now due to signatures and question marks, they're still out on the streets. We have to do better for our kids. We have to do better for the community. We have to. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica Brady. My husband and I lost our home in the Forest Springs neighborhood in the CZU fire last year. And I'm here today to plead with the county to help us and the other families who lost their homes. We are 13 months post fire and still do not have a definitive answer from the county if we will be allowed to rebuild and it is mentally exhausting to live in a constant state of limbo, being at the mercy of a county that doesn't seem to care about the families impacted by their lack of action. We were on track to break ground this fall until the county announced the start of the GHA, which was started almost a full year after the fire and is now holding many of us up and moving forward. Even once it is complete, the proposed options are less than favorable to the homeowners. The declaration we are being asked to sign will impact the value of our properties and our insurability, which is already a challenge in the mountains. And it feels like we are being penalized because of a fire none of us had control over. We're glad more families did not lose their homes in the fire. However, the homes still standing are not being held to the same expectations that we are. Their homes are at no less risk than ours, yet only certain rebuilt homes are being required to record the risk on our titles. In fact, there are two fellow Forest Springs neighbors just stones, just a stone's throw away from us that have made it through pre-screening without signing the declaration. So again, why are some homes being treated differently than others? The county and the board needs to do better. We were promised an expedited process we were promised we would not be treated as new builds. We were promised fees would be waived and or lowered. And we were promised the county would do everything possible to help us rebuild. But so far, none of these promises have been kept. The county even posted a fluff piece on Facebook, patting themselves on the back, obviously not anticipating the 156 comments, calling it out for what it was, a slap in the face to those who lost their homes. For us, we're anticipating it taking a year to build. Since we're already 13 months post fire, with no idea of when we might be able to break ground. Our insurance funds are quickly running out and we are concerned that we will be pushed out of our rental long before our home is ever completed due to county delays. We ask that the board revise the options and come back within two weeks with a more reasonable, transparent proposal. Please do what is right and help the fire community rebuild. We love our mountain community and we want to get back to it. Hello, my name is John Silva. Uh, thank you all so much thus far in identifying the problems that we're dealing with with geology. Uh, why couldn't the planning department just simply do a release of liability form and a variance to proceed as long as hazards that were pre-existing and not directly affecting the building envelope? Um, as the county representative stated in August meeting, a small percentage of people are being affected by the geologic restrictions. If this is in fact the case, then it seems only logical and fair to make an exception in a timely manner and simplifying things with a variance that is case by case. Uh, why put a deviated effect on our titles when there wasn't one before? When homes are purchased, uh, when homes are purchased and sold in this county, a geologic hazard clearance is not ever an issue. Why are not we are not developing, we are simply trying to r, r what we had before the fire. By the way, I have hired a geologist and he performed a GHA and soils report on my property and the geology department refused it. Um, they are requiring a geologic assessment to be to the full degree of the law as it was an entirely new development. I'm not sure that the planning department, I'm sure that the planning department wants the power to do what they decide and what they want to do. However, as civil servants of us, the people, this county, I wish that they could be compassionate for long enough to understand we need this. And by now we deserve this, our homes and lives back. They ultimately have the ability to make it easier for us and they, they don't. It would not surprise me at this point. Please be our voice to the planning department as they cannot hear us the people, the victims, we do not matter. We don't, we don't have enough power as individuals. They need to be governed by you. Please exercise your authority. Don't let them make you look like as insensitive as they are.
My name is Tracy Walker and I'm a CZU fire victim. My home was in the Riverside Grove community of Boulder Creek and it was in, in, it was in a low risk to reflow area. Apparently we're not even included in this basin study that I keep hearing about. A large portion of our neighborhood used, that I used to live in survived the fire, most of which are in a high risk to reflow area, but they're all still allowed to live in their homes. Where does the concern for life come in? To me, that just sounds like an excuse to make it sound like you're doing something without actually working on a solution for us. Anything we build will be safer than the 81 year old cabin we had, which would still be deemed safe if it didn't burn down. There is still a house maybe 50 feet from where my house used to stand. Is there no threat for them because their house didn't burn but everything around it did? After we submitted our pre-clearances, we were told we also needed to submit a GHA. We hired a geologist who came to our property. He took boring samples that he tested in a lab and wrote a report that we submitted to the county in May. <laughs> In his report, he gave us his professional opinion on how to safely build our home, and we obviously thought we would be good enough to be able to pass our geologic hazard preclearance, but apparently we were wrong because our, the county denied our report. <laughs> In his report, it states, it is our opinion that from our geotechnical viewpoint, this site is suitable for proposed construction, provided the recommendations presented in this report are followed during design and construction. The report also states, based on our analysis, we conclude that the potential for slope instability impacting the proposed house is low. There is no evidence the slope has moved for a very long time, including during the Loma Prieta, Loma Prieta earthquake and the 1906 earthquake. I'm no geologist, but the man who wrote a report is, and that sounds like our land is safe to build on. So where's the problem? Why were we denied? Why is the county geology department now telling us that we have to bring back our geologist and take more boring samples from a 100 foot hole this time that's not even gonna be on our property. This is ridiculous. Something needs to change. Our lot is not unsafe. We have the proof. Please fix this. My name is Melinda Silva. Um, I signed on with the geologist with the walkers and the 100 foot hole is actually going on the footprint of my home. Well, it will be. They also are requesting mapping of an ancient landslide that has not moved in thousands of years. There's people above me that are more on the landslide than I am and they are not requiring a GHA report because their homes were newer than mine. My house went through Loma Prieta. It went through the 82 floods these other homes did not. And it is not fair that we have been denied and we have to do this whole and the people right next to us do not. I don't see the reasoning. I don't see why my geologist was shut down and just told no and has to come back and we have to do more testing. It does not seem fair. I don't understand what the logic is and why they get to make these decisions and mess with our lives. We've been out for 13 months now with no sight of being able to get any answers. I wanna know why. I wanna know why I can't simply get a permit to put my foundation in. I want to pass preclearance. I want to move on with my life. Please help us do this. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm one of the unusual, I'm Chuck Boffman. I uh, lived in a Riverside Grove and I live near the person who just spoke. So um, I'm one of the lucky ones. I am through geology. I initially was declined and I was encouraged to sign on with the same, with the same geologist that the speaker just spoke about. And I'm glad that geologist did not want to take me on. It, it was too far away for him to travel because I waited long enough and my circumstances changed. And a couple of months later, things were reevaluated. And according to when my house was built, I am now cleared. And these people, for the vast majority, are not anywhere near as lucky in that sense as I was. So the county seems seems to be trying to go in a direction that is good, but it is worrying about its liability, its loss, its financial risk in this. And the financial risk to all the families and people that are here today is enormous. They're running up in many cases against insurance limits and they their ability to even stay in the county may be threatened. 
So, so try to justify to yourselves, you know, why you are requiring something from somebody who, um, who is probably going to rebuild a house that is better than the one that was before them. So they are improving the safety in their neighborhoods, but they're being held to a choice that requires them to sign off on liability when I think the county should be taking some of this liability itself. Hello, my name is Chris Lucia. We lost our home in the Fallen Leaf neighborhood on August 20th, 2020. I've worked in the solar industry for about the last two years with the largest residential solar company in the nation. And without a doubt, Santa Cruz County is the hardest to work with when it comes to permitting. In San Jose, an online permit takes about a week, or excuse me, about a minute to process online for our solar project. In, <clears throat> excuse me, in Santa Cruz, before daily to submit the permits and it took about two weeks this whole process to, to unfold right for the permit to come back just i feel like it, it really speaks to how antiquated this whole system is with with, with this with the county um my wife's probably killing me right now because i'm going off script a little bit right now but hey it is what it is um i feel like you know i grew up here i, I was I moved here when I was eight years old. Um, I'm one of the very few people in my, in my class that actually got to buy a home in this area. Um, I'm, I'm trying to raise here. And I feel like we're right there. We're at the goal line. All we have to do is get the okay to move forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't understand why we're being held up. I have a friend that's already putting foundation in just right down the road. I play softball with him. And I told him, if the mud slides down, I'm going to surfboard and writing it down to your house. And I'm saying that as a, as a joke, because it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen to my property. We're going to rebuild. We're going to rebuild with or without the okay. I'll, I'll put a trailer up there. I don't care. It's going to happen. And we're going to do it with or without you guys. So please help us. It's time. It's time to move forward. Thank you. Gentlemen of the board, thank you for hearing our comments today. My name is Phaedra Schrock. I lost my home in the CZU fires. My parcel is located in the Riverside Grove neighborhood of Boulder Creek. The proposed options presented are a step in the right direction. However, the current draft is unacceptable for the fire community for reasons that you've all been listening to today that we've submitted at length in our comments section on the agenda through emails. You know the reasons we're standing here. You know why this is unacceptable. This is still being treated as a new build, not a rebuild. The process of rebuilding feels like the county is working against us and serving their own interest rather than working with us. There needs to be exceptions and exemptions made here. I would support passing a resolution as it is a good faith effort in moving along the CZU rebuild process quickly. However, the proposed resolution needs to be revised. If I may offer a suggestion that could benefit all of us, try working with the fire community to come to an agreement. No one knows what it's like to go through this process better than all of us who are living it. Perhaps a draft can be revised and submitted for comment by the fire community within two weeks. I would also be in support of working on a more permanent solution as we likely won't be the last members of our community to experience life after natural disasters. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julie Wiest and I'm a fire victim. I lived in the Fallen Leaf neighborhood. I've lived in the Valley for about 17 years and I've been involved in CERT. I'm a CERT trainer in Boulder Creek. I used to teach Map Your Neighborhood to help improve the safety of our community. I've been on the board of the Valley Women's Club to help improve our environment and, com and community. And I'm currently working in a um, community driven development team that is working to also uh, improve the quality of the lives and the recovery of fire victims. Um, so I'm, I'm on lots uh, in lots of community Facebook groups. I've been involved in 
um, lots of different meetings. And I've been here before to talk to the board about the atrocities of PG&E. This was a few years ago. And I remember listening to somebody talk to the board and planning department about the challenges they were having trying to rebuild and the money they had spent and the time and angst that they'd spent. And I thought that poor person, that, you know, that poor man standing here kind of begging for help. Nobody helped him. You know, the planning department of this County is got one of the worst reputations in the state of California. And at this point, after you've heard all of these people and you've seen all the comments, it's time to bring a mediator in to resolve some of the issues that are going on with the planning department and the relationship that they've had. Because it's from what I've heard, it's been 30 years that they've mismanaged their responsibility to this community and they're not managed effectively to help resolve the issues here. So I would suggest that we take two weeks involve the community in helping solve this. I used to teach structured problem solving. It's time to bring a geologist and mediator in that can, that is not reporting to the planning department and not beholden to the planning department and works for the county and the people to help get a resolution that's effective and timely. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Karen Wilson Dixon. Um, I lost my home um, up on Swanton Road. My parents lost their home on Swanton Road and my daughter lost her home on Swanton Road. And we lost our commercial kitchen on Swanton Road. Um, so uh, home and, uh, um, and business kind of gone in one swoop. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I, I, I look at these three options you guys have presented to us and I feel like we need all three of them. Um, not to just choose one. I think that all of them need revision. One of them, I will sign a waiver that you guys are not responsible for my rebuild, but anybody who would buy my property, which wouldn't happen anyway, because um, it's a fourth generation property. And although I would love to not have the, have the value be removed from it um, in case I needed to take a loan. So please don't make us put it on our title. I don't understand why that would be necessary anyone who would be purchasing our property would have to go through a geological investigation themselves anyway. That's typical. There's no need to put something on our, our titles in that case. Um, the next one is go ahead and give us a waiver for that first option and then go on to option two and change 610 so that the fire victims are immune six months from now, whenever you can get that off of our, that revision made. But both of those things need to happen. One first now, one as you, as you get it done. And third, all of us rebuilding are gonna be models for that future option three. Um, how do we rebuild in the future so that there is more fire safety, more geological safety, et cetera? What is the model for the future? We are your guinea pigs. So. I think all three should be looked at and all three of them revised. And thank you for letting me speak. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak to us? Do we have anybody on the phone? Yes, I do have speakers on Zoom. Thank you. Allison Breeze, your microphone is available. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Allison Breeze, and I come to you as a homeowner from within the burn scar who was very fortunate to not lose their home. As a community member, I have been closely following the obstacles experienced by the fire community as they struggle to rebuild and return home. I appreciate that options are finally being considered to disable some of the geology roadblocks. Option one, removing the requirements for fire rebuilds would provide the fastest approach for families to return home. However, I have profound concerns and oppose the requirement for a covenant to be recorded to the property title as part of this process. This action would have significant consequences 
on the property value and is inherently inequitable as a result. Surviving homes in the burn storm burn zone under exactly the same pre-existing geologic conditions and under identical risk are not being required to either record the same document on their titles or to pursue expensive studies. While I do wholeheartedly support safety and disclosure principles, this particular action will create two distinctly different and unequal classes of properties in our county, all for the sake of pre-existing non-fire related or temporary risks. Is the Board of Supervisors willing to force fire rebuilds to become second class properties in perpetuity as the steep price for returning home to create a precedent for inequality in Santa Cruz County after future natural disasters? We are a community and what hurts some of us hurts all of us. As a homeowner who did not lose their home, I urge you to support option one with the covenant requirement removed. If it is not removed, then the only equitable course of action would be to enforce these requirements on all properties in the areas and not solely on fire builds. All of us are watching closely for how you will decide. Thank you. Kristen Flynn. Okay. Hello, Hello my name's Kirsten Flynn, and I lost a beloved family cabin in the CZU fires. First of all, I want to acknowledge the loss that this community has faced. We have lost our homes. We have lost our feeling of safety. We have lost our neighbors and our neighborhoods. We want those things back. Secondly, I want to thank all of the people that have been so helpful since the fire. My neighbors on Clear Creek in Brookdale, Angie Gruis and the RCD, the County of Santa Cruz Planning Department, especially, especially Jessica DeGrassi, the new R3 Department, especially David Reed and the Santa Cruz Community Foundation. All of these people have taken the pain of what happened to their neighbors and turned it into positive action. When dealing with complex situations, I find it is super useful to constantly check back in what is the goal. So what is the goal here? We want to make it possible to allow people who lived in the mountains and were affected the fire to be able to build a place to live. However, that goal runs parallel to a second goal shared by all of those I thanked above, the goal to make our neighbors safe, to keep the land safe, to keep our houses safe. That is the overarching reason for codes, for laws in general, to pass rules that we all agree are to the benefit of society. It benefits society to build safe housing. Geologic time is long and dangerous situations often come in cycles much longer than 100 years. These two goals have been in conflict because of the increased risk of debris flow. Your goal is to try to find a solution that meets as much of both goals as possible to find a middle way. The science is clear on the risk and we have to find some way to convey that danger associated with all the land in the valley to land speculators, investors, developers who might see any loosening of safety codes as carte blanche to build crappy home in our mountains. I'm out of time, so I stopped. <laughs> There are no other speakers on Zoom, Chair. Okay. Um, again, there's nobody in the public that wants to address this uh, as of yet. Yeah, I'll bring uh, the issue back to the board. Um, I don't know if there's some uh, questions there that you might be able to briefly answer. Uh, about the, the 1986 in particular, a few questions that were. Yeah, um, I, I can do that. Um, um, Andrea Tischler talked about um, the magic of 1986. What's magic about that? Um, it's it's not magic, but it does represent something. It's not arbitrary. That was um, about the year when the computer systems at the county become reliable to the point that we can say, if we have no record of your build, of a building permit, then there wasn't a building permit. Before 1986, there's some possibility that in the old record keeping systems and some of these permits we'd be talking about would be 1960s, um, that we could not 100% say you didn't have a permit. So the benefit of the doubt goes to the property owner and that's why the board went with the 1986. Okay, I don't know if there was any other 
Any question? The big issue was about the covenant. I think we, the county council had addressed that somewhat. Um, any questions from the board? I just, um, I just wait for a motion to, we have, we have three options that are before us. Um, entertain a motion to move ahead if we can, but I um, want to see, but um, any supervisor might want to re recommend. I'll, I'll move to approve. The, 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 what, the resolution as proposed? Yeah. Mr. Chair, I'll, well, before we, there's a second to that. I'm supportive of the resolution, but I'm, I think that, that the board also needs to direct staff to come back with modifications of the ordinance long-term, which is, is number three. Um, so I think it's like a combo of, of one and three. Um, so I don't know if uh, the maker of the motion, um, so this allows for the expediting of the rebuilds now, and it also allows for a better look moving forward on resiliency for uh, the ordinance moving forward. So to the maker of the motion, I'd be willing to second it if that's what the intent of the motion was. Is that, uh, Supervisor Caput, is that? Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you have sure. any set, because uh, I can't make a motion, so. Uh, yeah. No, I, uh, sorry, I, I'm happy to, to move the recommended action, uh, which is the adoption of the resolution as attachment A, as well as provide additional direction to the OR3 staff to, to I, I, they're already doing this, but to continue to work on adjusting our ordinances um, on, in terms of uh, uh, to build for more resiliency uh, going forward. So Mr. That, Chair, Mr. Chair, um, assuming the first the motion also. Yeah, I know. Wait a minute. No, yeah, I think it would be a recommended uh, addition to your uh, your motion. I think that's the way to handle that. Uh, Mr. Chair, we can just say that the first motion died for a lack of a second, and then Supervisor Coonerty introduced a, a follow up motion that I will second. Where we can do that way, that's fine. Okay. Okay. So. Um, this is to uh, accept the recommended action about the resolution and to uh, have additional direction to look into the, the third ordinance about uh, revising or updating the ordinance related to um, um, the, the um, fire, well, fire or uh, emergency situations that happen in the county. Is that basically what you would, um, that's your motion, Supervisor Clarity? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. <laughs> And, and I guess let me just say that um, in in a two weeks we'll have the Atkins report um, and better understand the the nature of this area uh, and you know this is this is this is a process so we're trying to get people uh, some people will fall into the category uh, where this resolution works well um, and so we want to get that on the books uh, as soon as possible. Right, I, I agree. I, I think it's important we act now to move ahead, and we're going to get have more information, in depth information. We get the Atkins report in two weeks, but we might as well. I think it's better that we move now and look at that, and then move from that day forward. So, with the motion on the floor, uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig, aye. Friend, aye. Coonerty, aye. Caput, aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously with additional direction. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for your input. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. But you left the covenant in. Yeah. So you left the covenant. That's correct. And there's no discussion about it going forward. Uh, it could be It could be in the future. Oh, <laughs> Can I just make it? Out of the box, it um, we got we to gotta, gotta figure out a way to give us some, some way yeah. to build on a property yeah, that was saved for our whole I'll, life. We're going to move to... Uh, nine chair can i make a quick comment on the covenant um you know there's already a require I mean, the value of your homes is going to be based on the demand for them someone buying who wants to buy them i mean ultimately the value is set by the market and 
that you already are required to have a natural hazards disclosure report, which will probably say that your home exists in a high risk wildfire area. Now you all know because you live in these beautiful places that that alone is not going to determine whether or not someone wants to, to buy or live in one of these beautiful locations. So any buyer of a home is going to by nature weigh the risks of this, of which this is simply one notification of a potential risk uh, against the rewards of the beauty of, of of living in these beautiful places that you live now. So I don't think that, you know, I if, if you feel strongly that this is gonna have an impact on the value of your homes, I think you should come back with some evidence from real estate professionals um, or, you know, I, well, expert knowledge yeah. is gonna help and facts will help drive the discussion. Aren't going to lend on houses with this on the I've been talking uh, to lenders. I'm going to turn it to you. It, it would be great. Insurance this, this on, yeah. on our that, those kind of professional opinions from lenders or insurance agents would probably also be very helpful as we continue to improve this. How do we convey them to you? Yeah. I didn't hear any real uh, insurance professionals. Are real. We're going to go talk to them. We'll go talk to bankers. We'll talk to insurance people. We'll talk to real estate people. How do we convey what they're what they're telling us to you? I would have them write a letter themselves. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. Why are you guys? Why are you telling us this stuff before passing the public? Like this. You guys should know this before you okay. pass the bill. Exactly. Yeah. You don't understand the rest. You guys need to do your homework. Uh, 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 excuse me. Excuse me. We, we are we are going to be con continuing with discussion on this issue in two weeks, and we will have further testimony then. Um, we've made the action on what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to move on to uh, the, the uh, scheduled agenda on item number nine. You're moving on, but we're not. We're stuck. We're something neutral. Awesome. Something neutral. Thanks for having Okay, we go to um, so cooks in the kitchen. item number nine. You consider an ordinance amending the Santa Cruz County Code section 2.124.040 to better define the membership criteria for the Santa Cruz County In-Home Support Services Advisory Commission at large membership. Consider amendment to the Santa Cruz County In-Home Support Services Advisory Commission bylaws and reflect the code amendments and schedule an ordinance for second reading and final adoption on September 28, 2021, as out outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Human Services. I have an ordinance amendment amending the chapter 2.124, uh, Santa Cruz County Code uh, strikeout on that uh, chapter, uh, ISHS Advisory Commission bylaws, a uh, clean copy and a strike strike up copy. Uh, Mr. Morse, our human services director. Um, hi, good afternoon, Supervisor and Chair McPherson and board members and county staff and public listening. I feel like I need to take a deep breath and pause, mindful I'm about to present something for the first time in my tenure here that's actually maybe simple and straightforward, particularly given the morning <laughs> and the right. last agenda item. Um, appreciate the exhaustion and the energy that's playing out that I'm walking into. <laughs> Um, so yes, I'm the director of the County Human Services Department. And one of the programs that we administer is the In-Home Supportive Services Program, which is more often referred to by SNAP acronym IHSS. State law mandates in California that every county IHSS program has an advisory board, uh, which is predominantly of consumers of our service. And in here in Santa Cruz County, that's through a formal commission that exists under bylaws and Santa Cruz County code that your board um, previously has approved. Um, what brings this to your board today is that the commission itself has been, and this is not unique to this commission, but the commission itself over the last many years has been struggling filling the seats. And they've been consulting um, across the state, looking at the way other commissions organize themselves and with our own county council's office, to see if there's something that could be done with your board's approval to make it easier and more streamlined to keep those seats full. Um, the commission itself has not had all seats filled since 2014. So what's in front of you in the written materials, which I'm not gonna detail, I'm just trying to frame this for you so you understand what the vote is in front of you today, is some modest, what I believe are modest and reasonable amendments to both the bylaws and the Santa Cruz County Code that would effectuate the change they're looking for, which is to try to help fill those seats a little bit easier. I do want to take just a quick minute, particularly in light of all the emotions of the topics that you've all been looking at today to, to explain to you the human element of what in-home support services is and why I'm so supportive as the human services director of doing all we can to help bring the voice of consumers of this program to a commission to help give us feedback. Um, 
in-home supportive services is a Medi-Cal program. So by definition, all the customers that we serve in the program are on Medi-Cal, which means they're low income. And they are also either aged, blind, or disabled. And those are Medi-Cal aid codes. And we serve about 3,000 Santa Cruz County residents in this program. And if they were not getting this service, it is arguable that they would then not be able to live in their home. Um, and we also have about 2,500 providers of in-home care to come into the home of these age blind and disabled Medi-Cal recipients. And this advisory commission by state law meets with our staff regularly to look at, evaluate, and give us feedback on whether or not we're delivering the best service possible. So it's a very important um, effort, a very important commission. Um, the board action in front of you today is actually broken down into three parts. Um, the reason why this requires a board action and it is required to be on um, regular calendar is because this is a change to the code, which requires an ordinance, which that means there needs to be two readings by your board to make a change to the Santa Cruz County Code. And the first one past practice in this community has been um, a regular session and a presentation by the department. So of the three items in front of you for a vote, the first one is to accept and concept the proposed changes to the code, which essentially make it simpler to fill seats more quickly and to more um, focus who it is that's being um, targeted for recruitment. And that's people who have a stake in, participate in, or experience in the program. Second, it's related, but a separate action is as to make the related changes to the actual bylaws themselves. Um, and then the third, if these concepts are agreeable to you to schedule a required second reading on consent at the next board hearing on the 28th. And if that is all approved, then we're allowed to make those changes to the code. And then the commission can proceed with trying to fill the seats that they've been struggling to fill. So I'm here for any questions. I hope indeed this was a less heavy item than what you've all been dealing with today. Right. But I, I am here Thank for you. any questions Thank you might any have. Any questions from the board? Um, no, no, Mr. Chair, assuming that there's no public Speakers on this item, I'll move the recommended actions. Let me see. Let me see. Any public speakers? I see somebody. No. There are no the speakers on Zoom. No, no speakers on the phone. Second. Second uh, friend moves the motion, uh, has the motion uh, second by uh, Koenig. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Community? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. <sighs> item number 10 is to consider. Thanks, Randy. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Uh, uh, consider a proposed ordinance adding chapter number 8.53 prohibiting discriminatory reports to law enforcement to the Santa Cruz County Code Title 8, public peace, morals, and welfare to address bias and discriminatory, discriminatory crime reporting as outlined in the memorandum of the Sheriff Coroner. Uh, an ordinance adding uh, Santa Cruz County Code Chapter uh, 8.53. I don't think Sheriff, I, hello. Please. Yeah, good afternoon, Chair. Yeah. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Chris Clark. I'm a Chief Deputy of the Sheriff's Office and our Operations Chief. And on behalf of Sheriff Jim Hart, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to, um, to speak with you today with regards to um, soliciting your recommendation for adoption of Section 8.53 or discriminatory reports uh, to law enforcement. And so over the next few minutes, I'm going to kind of explain some aspects to this ordinance that I feel are, are, are really important. One, what's going on nationally and locally with regards to discriminatory reports or bias-based reports to law enforcement and that intersection between you know, the victim of that and law enforcement. So I'll be talking a little bit about what's happening locally and nationally. Secondly, um, what, do, what is the, the crux of this ordinance? What does this ordinance do? And then lastly, to speak about the importance of this um, and, and, and trying to uh, it, explain the, the gravity of what we're trying to do and, and why. So. As you, as you may be aware, there are current statutes on the books that talk about uh, knowingly making a false police report where someone calls 911 and then makes a series of, uh, just creates a series of facts. And so that's against the law, as you know. There are, uh, there are statutes with regards to hate crimes where someone discriminates and, and they commits a crime against somebody because of their protected class and you're aware of that. But there's nothing in the space right now that really bridges that gap. And so that's being worked on at the state level. But what this ordinance does in essence is it does bridge that gap. And it, and it focuses on the caller themselves and really looking at is the reason why the caller is calling is because of a bias against someone and the person is just engaged in lawful activity without anything else going on, right? And then that obviously creates that intersection with us and those in our community. So, 
uh, with that, what we've seen locally and nationally is, is really what you've seen on what, what you've seen on TV. Um, you, you know, there's been people at the park. There's been people walking dogs. There's been someone painting a mural, expressing their beliefs in front of their own home. And then a 911 call gets generated where someone says they're acting aggressive or be, and, and, and specifically because of a bias makes this call. And so, and then, in, and then that sets in motion, obviously a police officer or a deputy then coming out to talk to that person. And that, and that creates real harm. It creates harm to the person being contacted by law enforcement. It creates harm and it, it erodes from our community policing mission. Um, to have some, to have one of us uh, have to speak with somebody for for really no apparent reason, other than the person's acting aggressively and it's coming from a, a position of bias. What we're not suggesting is reporting uh, suspicious behavior where there's other actions by the person, right? Where the really what what this involves is 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 it is it is a bias, but the person may not be known to a neighborhood, but they're not doing anything else. They're not checking door handles. They're not looking in windows. They're not doing these other sorts of behavior which might tend to lend to somebody who might be engaging or looking to engage in criminal activity. But really it's biasing, you know, it's, it's a bias against, uh, from the person who, who makes the call against a, a protected class, this person engaging in lawful behavior. So locally what we've seen with this, and it's, it's, it's fairly disturbing. I saw this when I was on, on patrol. You had people selling newspapers and magazines in a neighborhood and they just weren't known, but they were there. Like some of us may have done back when we were kids or what have you. Um, you know, soliciting different people for subscriptions. They're not doing anything suspicious. They're just not known to the neighborhood. But what this does is it looks at it, it obviously bridging that gap and it provides redress for the person being victimized in that situation, that person engaged in lawful activity, and then provides our deputies with, with a guide for looking at, you know, how, how do we look at what happened here and see whether or not it, it violated this ordinance. And what I mean by that is, is that our deputies and the public can look to this, this ordinance and see, hey, wait a second, I was, I was engaged in lawful activity, but you know, I was maybe felt, in, I felt intimidated, humiliated, uh, made to move from a certain area or financially or personally impacted. And if our deputies look at that and they're able to determine that based on that caller, that the call was made from a position of bias and that person was left to feel or experience what I just suggested, then this statute could apply. And what that does is it provides a civil process where the person can then seek punitive damages and then, and then monetary damages upwards of an over $1,000 plus attorney fees. It gives that person a mechanism to seek, to seek justice in that situation that doesn't currently exist. And so, um, and so with that, we're not the only ones that have, that, have, that have done this. So this isn't necessarily nothing new, but it's definitely a space that needs to be addressed and one that we're looking to address in, the, in, your, in your consideration for adoption of this ordinance. And so importantly, uh, really what this does is it furthers, this ordinance furthers our commitment to public safety. It acknowledges this issue and that this issue exists and then empowers victims most importantly. And then because of those reasons, we, uh, we really ask your consideration, your adoption of this ordinance to affirm our commitment to fairer and impartial policing for everyone in our community. Thank, Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Mr. Chair, let me just first compliment Chief Clark and, and uh, Sheriff Hart on this. This is something that uh, they took very early from community input. There was a, a very strong willingness within the agency to do some research and to put this forward. And while, as uh, Chief Deputy Clark acknowledged, that we may not be the first, we're actually one of the first in the country that has implemented or is proposing to implement this. This is an, an absolutely essential proposal, and I appreciate the Sheriff's Office leadership on it. I'm very supportive of it. Very good. Any other comments from the board? Yeah, I'll just echo that. I appreciate the fact that uh, the Sheriff's Office really took the initiative on this and has, has brought it before us. I'm very supportive of the actions today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions from uh, the public? Any comments on the phone? There are no speakers. Entertain a motion. Yeah, I just want to uh, I'd share my colleagues' uh, you know, praise of the sheriff uh, and uh, and Deputy Clark here for uh, bringing this forward, being proactive and thinking about um, how do we reduce these incidents of hate and bias in our community. Um, and I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Second. Move by Cooney, second by friend. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. 
Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, we go to item number 11, it's the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, Zone 6. Uh, this is a continued public hearing to accept the certification of the vote results of the Rio Del Mar Drainage Flats Assessment District and direct Zone 6 staff to retain the ballots for two years as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. We have the Rio Del Mar Flats Assessment Statement of the Vote, and I think Kent Edler is going to present this the Public Works Department. That's correct. Good morning, Chair and Directors. I'm Kent Edler, Assistant Director of Public Works and also Assistant District Engineer for Zone 6. So the item before you today is regarding the Rio Del Mar Flats Benefit Assessment District. On August 24th, 2021, the board, uh, the Zone 6 Board conducted the public hearing and heard public and heard objections and protests and directed the Elections Department to tabulate the submitted ballots and continued the public hearing to today to allow for tabulation and certification of the ballot results. The Elections Department tabulated the ballots and certified the results. 321 ballots are, were received. Of the, of the valid ballots received, 38.8% voted in favor of forming the Real Del Mar Benefit Assessment District and 61.2% voted in opposition to the formation. So the formation of the assessment district did not pass. Since the assessment district did not pass the Rio Del Mar drainage improvement project that would have alleviated flooding in the Rio Del Mar Flats area will not be constructed. Staff will contact the grant agencies to let them know that there is not a funding source for the um, ongoing operations and maintenance. So the $4.2 million in grant funds for construction will not be accepted and the project will not be built. To accept certification of the vote results for the Rio Del Mar Flats Benefit Assessment District and direct Zone 6 staff to retain the ballots for two years following the certification. And I'm available for questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions, Supervisor Friend, your district? Do you have any comments? Yeah, I don't have any questions, but I, let me just issue some appreciation to Public Works, uh, Ms. Fatui, uh, Mr. Edler, uh, Director Machado, and others who've been working on this, and, and even those that preceded you for quite some time, and really were able to thread a remarkable needle of actually getting the resource agencies of the state and federal government to find a project that they would support. There's a very limited uh, ability in there because of uh, federally protected species and, and water recharge requirements and et cetera, environmental concerns, et cetera. Um, they were able to do it. They were able to get funding for it. and. Um, uh, obviously, while we respect the the will of the majority that, that voted this way, it, it is unfortunate. It's disappointing because there there really is no other option, and it just means that we're going to have a continued issue with flooding down there moving forward. Obviously, Public Works will continue to do what they do with the standard cleanouts, but it's been shown not just leading up to today, but moving forward from today with climate change that that, that work was inadequate. This was a proposal to help address that. But uh, the, the residents, the homeowners, excuse me, down there have, to, have elected to um, have chosen that uh, to, 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 I guess, have chosen to continue to have the flooding in exchange for not paying the fee. And that's um, that is absolutely within their right. But there really is no plan B to the situation. And so I think moving forward, it's, it's just going to be unfortunate. I recognize that not just myself, but any future board sitting in this position are going to be uh, addressing a continued and uh, increasing problem in that area. Thank you. Okay, I don't think there's any motion required. Um, do we need I, to accept the ballot? I think there is to certify. So I'll move the recommended actions. Okay. Pardon me, Chair. I do have a speaker. Just, uh, pardon me? I have a speaker. Oh, excuse yes, me. Go ahead. Okay. Dale Flowers, your microphone is available. They've lowered their hand. Do we have a motion, Mr. Supervisor Friend, made of yes. motion? I'll, I'll move the recommended actions. Second. I'll, I'll second. Um, I'll just say it maybe a little more directly than uh, Supervisor Friend can because it's his constituents. But like in a world where we're talking about resilience and uh, increased floods and weather, um, to to pass up these resources is uh, penny wise, pound foolish. Um, and it's gonna it's gonna impact people uh, for decades to come. It's too bad. Yep, thank you. And I guess I need to um, close, uh, formally close the public hearing. I don't know if I did that, but too. But okay. Um, 
Please call the roll. Sorry, the for clarity, was that that was motion was supervisor friend. The second was that Koenig or Coonerty? Coonerty. Coonerty. Okay. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Appet? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Now we did uh, finish the public comments or, or delay the public comments. I don't know if anybody is still waiting to have public comments. Okay. Um, from my tally, the majority have spoken, and there's one last speaker to this item. There's one more. There's speaker. one speaker. Okay. Dale Flowers, your microphone is oh, available. What do you mean? Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. It, you know, I'm sorry, I was lost there. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, the idea that there's no Plan B is really kind of unacceptable. The uh, the when you look at the report. There was a notion that you look at the pipes, can the pipes be enlarged, can the pipes be clean? And then, uh, so the, the notion that there's no plan B is, is kind of hard to accept. I think we need to look at that closer. But here's, here's a plan B with a small b. The day that this happened, there was I sent a photograph in there of a lady standing out in the street who was there for about an hour asking cars to slow down so the wave action wouldn't fly into their to their their houses and it just seems to me that at least at least we can anticipate that there's going to be a problem and the county get out there and put the signs up early close the road and clean those clean those gutters and and the drain before right before those those uh, predictable episodes happen and when I looked at the study, what was what was kind of perplexing was when they assess all the water that goes in there, there, there was no, uh, how much of the water comes from the ocean, the runoff from the ocean. And it seems to me that uh, uh, that ought to be taken into consideration when uh, when we're dealing with this and then who, who can be responsible for that. But that the idea that we can do, I think we can do a better job of maintenance. Frankly, in my neighborhood down at the bottom, the person who lives at the bottom of the hill, every time there's a rain, is down there cleaning that uh, that drain. Now, and it works. It takes longer to get the water out of there, but it's a resident cleaning the top of the drain. Who God only knows what's on in the, in the pipes. So I really kind of hold off on the idea of a plan B. I really would like to hear a better uh, discussion of Thank how you. we can deal with the maintenance here. Thank you very much. And by the way, I thank you, supervisors, for your service. I can't believe how much you have to deal with in these two days. You've done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that completes our agenda today for September 14th, 2021. Our next meeting, the County Board of Supervisors, will be September 28th at 9 a.m. in the board chamber and, and virtual as well. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>